It's day two of the World Championships of Flesh and Blood. Flake alongside my number one fan, Brian Gottlieb. Flake's number one. See, that's the enthusiasm that I like to see from you. But not only from you, from the players that are out there. The field has been cut in less than half. There's about 220 players left in this tournament, Brian, and it's draft time. Yeah, it's, it's moving day, Flake. I mean, this is when world champions are made. They're going to be under immense pressure from the very beginning of this tournament, where we're, of course, going to be bringing you those very top players who have sort of started to pave a very clear path to that world championship top eight. We're the Yuki Lee Benders of the world, the seven O's of our first day, uh, along with some very, very talented players at 6-1 getting ready to strike as well. But before we get into all that, let's just set the stage a little bit for how we're going to do things today. And of course, we want to start with our lovely cast and crew that you'll be seeing throughout the day. Flake and I don't count, but everyone else on there, absolute gems. Uh, look, I, I said this yesterday. Roman Nicola looks like a, a king from Lord of the Rings. The guy is so regal. He, when Gondor called for aid, he was the, the first answer. in line. Yeah, Absolutely. And happiest that. to see him was Pankaj Bajwani. Yeah, just a, a beacon of joy here in the booth and a beacon of knowledge, too. And what a job from our casters yesterday. You could just tell the passion, the knowledge on display throughout the day. So, of course, huge props to our players. But gotta love those casters as well, bringing you the best information they can put out. There. Absolutely, Erica, Newson, Brendan—they're uh, going to be bringing you the coverage uh, throughout the day as well as it is, like we mentioned, day two. But uh, let's uh, let's set you up for what you got going on again. Again, day one in the books, and we're going to go ahead and just do that snake style draft. We're going to do—we ended the day yesterday with three rounds of draft. Roll it back to day two, the same mindset as yesterday. Overnight, let's go in with that same kind of razor focus for three more rounds of draft yeah and i think the players were razor focused we're going to talk more about exactly how the draft rounds transpired but just a huge amount of knowledge on display and moving to the next level of bright lights draft i think you really saw if you watched Luki, yuki lee bender's game yesterday masterful dash play throughout those three games went three and zero on that hero showed what was capable even into the face of something like uh, Masai Yannick's very, very good Teklavos in deck still was able to find that evasive damage to push through. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that repeated here on day two. Uh, boom grenades are exceptionally powerful and such great fireworks as we saw Yuki Lee Bender go at 3-0 yesterday off the back of some of that wonderful, for wonderful, masterful play on Dash IO. We've got four more rounds of Classic Constructed, which frankly is only going to tighten the noose around a lot of the lifespan of some of these players who are hanging by a thread some of them are their hopes and dreams still alive however brian i swear that the tension only mounts round by round as we go through the day oh it does and when we get down to those round 13 14 matches uh get ready for a sweat flake and uh, it only gets tighter and tighter like you said of course qualifying path here equally as tight you had to do really well at your national championships a pti redemption which you can earn through one of our uh, battle hardens those type of events and then there's those long time standing folks the 90 day xp the lifetime xp folks as well as constructed and limited elo the true masters of their crafts uh definitely and it's not just about getting to the tournament itself it's getting to day two yeah you're qualified for day two now yes. these players have already gone through another gauntlet yeah, well, you had to have at least four wins to qualify for day two. Now, keep in mind, there's a whole lot of other competition going on. There's a sealed calling happening today, so there's always something to do. But this is the bread and butter. This is the big show. So day two, getting to day two, you needed at least four wins. Yep, and, and I want to set the stage as well for what the players are playing for today because these are just massive, massive stakes. And I only really need to focus on one here, Flake, because... Look, it's great to come second through 64th at Worlds. You should be proud of your achievement. Incredible, incredible stuff. But we're here to crown a freaking world champion. I know there could only be one, and they're going to walk away with $100,000 in their pocket, as well as that gold foil legendary, a PTI, and that incredibly, incredibly rare champion's prize card. And that incredibly, incredibly large check yep. that you get. That... For the record, it has always been my dream. After growing up watching The Price is Right, you know when they do that whole oh, check absolutely. game? Absolutely. I have always wanted to hold one. I got to hold it last year and help present it to last year's world champion. Another one is standing over there by the stage just waiting to be awarded 100000 U.S. dollars to the winner. It is it's a lot of money. It's a lot. Life-changing money. And it, it's on, uh, on up for grabs this weekend here in Barcelona. But let's talk about who's in position to grab that check, Flake. Besides you, I know you're going to get to pass it out. And I'm a little jealous, I'll be honest. I also watched the prices, right? Maybe I'll just sneak over there and 
you know, saunter off with it. But it's these folks who will actually have the chance to lay claim to it. And there are four 7-0 players sitting at the top. Of course, we did follow Yuki Lee Bender's tremendous run through draft. But three other players, including a pair of players from Hong Kong, Alex Lowe and Shing Seng, play together quite often. They're in the feature match, uh, the feature pod right now for draft, and are going to be playing against each other in round one. So an incredible performance from Hong Kong and these two players in particular. I got to give love to Yuki Lee Bender representing my home country of Canada. She was the first ever national champion in Canada, as well as just consistently setting the bar for Lexi Livewire since the beginning. Yep. Before everybody was just tired of that hero, she was the one championing that uh, that hero. But now here she stands at 7-0 on top of the leaderboard again, representing the Maple Leaf, and I am so proud to have her there. But even going down the list, an incredible amount of players through and through and such a beautiful mosaic of countries represented. Yeah, I think that's one of the best things about this top 24 is you look at those flags and you see folks from all over the world, including our last 7-0 player, Philip Van Donsler, also a former national champion, former Netherlands national champion back in 2021, senior Yuki Lee Bender won Canadian national. So a pair of national champions on display there. Really, really impressive stuff. Also an actual two-time defending national champion down there in that sixth spot. It's Max Dykeman going to be our featured player in our first match of draft. Unfortunately, a little bit of uh, pairing mischief there in those first rounds. Dykeman going to be taking on fellow countryman Carlos Carrero in that first draft. So the two Hong Kong players paired against each other in pod one, as well as the two Spanish players paired against each other. I got to represent the home country here. The host nation of Spain is going to have uh, quite a showing to kick off to day two here. And uh, let's take a look at what that meta is looking like as well. Why not? Uh, let's just get right to it and get to the... The players, uh, I mean, th we can go through the list of everybody, but here is what that meta overall looked like. This is what the CC looked like yesterday. This is what everybody was leaning on going into those first four rounds of the tournament yesterday. Yeah, this was the starting point. It is not the finishing point, though. Things have changed, and I do want to shift this over to our day two meta and show you where things stand now. Because some heroes performed, some did not. You see all of the ranks have been trimmed a little bit. 40 Icelanders still leading the field. So no big shakeups when it comes to those big three. Absolutely holding pace. And the conversion rates look pretty good for those heroes. You know, a lot was made overnight about Bravo producing no 4 0s. That's true. But still a nice conversion rate at 51%. And you saw some of the best players in the world, folks like Michael Kong, on that Bravo and doing quite well. Michael Fung sitting at 6-1 right now, very much in striking distance. Well, you got to think about it as well, is that when you're when you're bringing in the hero, the logic sometimes behind Bravo is that they're just they're just looking to build a deck and, and pick a hero that is suited for those top four heroes that made it to day two. They don't mind taking the losses because it might be against those random Dorinthias, those random other heroes that might be out there. Now it's day two. They don't care about the losses yesterday. They want to clean house today. Here's the conversion rate, however. Now, again, uh, we want to make sure that you guys know it. it looks fascinating. People might be thinking that Bolton is the truth. Don't get me wrong. The Bolton players came hot and heavy in this tournament as 75%. Uh, six of the eight Bolton players made it to day two. Uh, this is what we're looking at from a conversion perspective. And, I mean, it's nice to see Bolton with that smug face yeah. on, top of the, on top of the heap. Look, there's always an asterisk around all these conversion rates. This includes three rounds of draft. So it's almost as equally weighted towards draft where these heroes were obviously not present. But 75% of the Boltons making it through, it talks to the level of skill these Bolton players have in flesh and blood in general. If you yes. commit to Bolton as your hero and you are willing to take him to the world champion, championships i believe you are a very good player i want to make one very astute observation here my friend is this the first major tournament where there are no rune blades in day two it's got to be it's got to be it has to be this yeah. is probably the first since, time since the rune blade cast premiered absolutely. correct yeah so again the vincets the viscerize none went through this is what we're looking at but what about draft because that's what we're starting the day off with so take a look at what the draft situation looked like from yesterday these were the heroes that were played in the draft portion of yesterday and you know the that that logic of just draft Tekla Voss and just draft Tekla Voss and obviously the majority are Tekla Voss in, but the spread here seems a lot more even than many might suspect I think it absolutely is like and look you know I can give you some behind the scenes knowledge of this Tekla Voss is supposed to be the most represented hero in these drafts he is the safest pick you can absolutely default to Tekla Voss 
It is not always the correct pick, though. And these type of numbers represent a player base that has very much figured out how to shift into the right lane and not just default to Tech Lavossen. All those rumors you heard of the eight Tech Lavossen pods, of the Just Force Tech Lavossen, I think it was authoritatively proved as a myth over the course of our first draft yesterday. And I really want to hone in on what I saw across the top four tables that I watched very closely as we were finishing out our draft rounds yesterday. So we knew that's where the four, or excuse me, the seven O players were going to be coming from. And I wanted to know what their roads looked like. Among those seven O players, two Dash drafters, one Max drafter, one Tech Boston drafter. So those players at the top, they were willing to take the risk to get into those Max and Dash lanes and just go ahead and commit to that play style and found success. And if we go ahead and look at our 3-0 conversion rates, I think you will see this echo as well. Again, Tech Boston leading the way, 26 players with a 3-0 performance on Tech Boston. But with the numbers reduced, those max numbers of 15 conversions and 12 dash conversions look quite good. And then we can go to the percentage finishes. And this is the percentages of these heroes that actually converted into a 3-0. And man, I, I understand that I'm biased. I bring a lot of, uh, you know, my own lens to the table. This looks like a really balanced draft metagame to me, Flake. I mean, the best in the world are playing it, and this is what the numbers uh, are, are essentially translating to. Not to mention, uh, besides the 14%, Teklovasen looking strikingly like me um, yeah. in in high school, frankly, yeah. uh, without yeah. the without the hair product. Actually, your high school yearbook was what we used uh, to model Teklovasen. Really? Yes. Was it? Yes. Okay, perfect. I just want to make sure that you got all the Star Wars quotes that I put in my yearbook as Every well. Every single one, and it was like 40 pages. I'm Yes. Trying to find pictures. Just Star Wars. I, I will definitely wasn't on any sports teams. That's for sure. So there you have it, friends. Uh, but what about the overall, you know, the the overall rates? Because everybody's talking about uh, draft, etc. But these are the top dogs. These are the flawless performances from day one. Seven and zero oh going into this day. There are your perfect players yeah, from day one the absolute killers and i did misspeak a bit it was two maxes and a dash as well as one tech love austin amongst these 4-0 players but you do see that diversity of heroes amongst these top four and then you get to constructed heroes and man this is a really interesting spot because i i love the positioning of katsu and Phi generally generally into this tournament i think you're gonna if you're a skilled katsu player if you're a skilled five player you can take down those dromites you can take down those bravos do not love their matchup into Icelander. And as this tournament has evolved, we're seeing these Icelanders start to distance themselves from the field. These were our performers yesterday. Uh, I believe these are our four, four O's, O's yeah. in Constructed. And you see a good representation of heroes, including two Leviathans in the mix there. Of course, Ethan Van Sant, famous Leviathan champion. But it was uh, Michael Mikulowski as well, also performing 4-0 on Leviah. Yeah, I mean, th there's a Dorinthia in the mix. We see a Reinar lurking about who went 4-0. We Good. saw that Bolton move to 4-0 against Reinar as well in impressive fashion. So just a really, really beautiful spread of representation across this CC metagame. Uh, Alex Lowe representing the OG. Uh, Katsu, my first favorite competitive hero Mine that too. I ever learned Mine was too. Katsu. Yeah. And I, and it's nice to see that through this bracket, sure, we're going to see a lot of Icelanders, uh, Icelanders. Inherently a strong hero pushing towards that living legend status might cross that bridge this weekend we might see but ultimately azalea levia the, uh, the bolton dash dorinthia uh, katsu dromai obviously fought it is such a widespread here it is a great great time to play flesh and blood it is and uh it's also a great time to draft flesh and blood and our players are just about ready down in our feature match area but let's set the stage with exactly where they're seated as i mentioned it is going to be a bit of a team kill situation going on in our feature match area our main feature it's going to be max dykeman taking on carlos carrero max the two-time reigning spanish national champion how can we not feature these spanish players in their homeland of barcelona you love to see it it's great to see as well obviously yuki lee bender of canada facing off against philip van dosselaar but uh, uh, I just want to mention something fascinating. We saw in the last match of the day yesterday was Yuki Lee Bender versus Masie Janik from Poland. Masie was coming to this tournament equally as excited for Worlds as he was for Living Legend on Battle Hardened. He He's was, got a problem on his hands now. Well, this is the issue. And he, I'm not even kidding, talking to Masie yesterday, he is so hyped for Living Legend. He said, would it be the ultimate troll to just drop out of a top eight to play living legend because he loves it that much his starvo list is just buzzing in his pocket it's ticking like a time bomb if, but if i'll tell you this if there's someone i give 
uh, the opportunity to be the ultimate troll. And maybe Masia. I think he has it in him to make that kind of play. But ultimately, when you get down to that level of the World Championships... No, you're I'm not giving sure up that opportunity. No, no, no. It's and, not happening. But, but you're right. Masia, uh, you know, a, a Pro Tour Top 8 competitor, as well as a uh, uh, Battle Hardened winner, both with Starvo. Like, just a huge, huge Starvo fan. And he's not alone. There's a lot of folks who are yes. itching to play Starvo this weekend. But for Masier, it's going to be a focus on Dromai, on this draft format, and trying to get his ticket punched to that second premier top eight. Definitely. So here we go. That Again, this is the table, as it'll be, as they're drafting. I believe that the draft has essentially been completed by now. The coverage will be coming hot and heavy as soon as it's ready to go here. Uh, ultimately, I mean... This is the top pod. Yeah. These are the uh, top threats. But it's interesting. I want to look at what these players drafted last go around because there is some level of preference, I think, available here. And there you see a very good distribution of heroes. We saw you, Healy Benders, 3 0 draft. I know Massier loves Tekla Boston. Massier is very much in that camp that if you're not drafting Tekla Boston, he thinks you're making a mistake. And I wonder if he's going to stick to his guns in this top eight draft, especially when you look at this distribution. I mean, honestly. I kind of want to be Masia in this draft. If these players are this flexible, they're so willing to go down these route. If you end up in a pod with only two Tekla Vossens, you're in a very good spot. And this is not, this is not what players have drafted in the second draft. This is what they drafted in the first draft. So we're just displaying this to show some predilection, some way that these players may be leaning. But ultimately, we have to see what they did in the second draft. Did they stray from the course or were they committed to these heroes right so the players are just getting settled right now they're getting a a, a nice talking to by our uh, head judge the 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 authority is that what we call him what do you guys call him what do you call josh scott judge judge yeah. just call him judge your honor yeah your honor that's yeah, a good I'm one very used to that parlance so anytime i speak to josh just I fall <laughs> that's right true there. i forgot about that yeah, yeah let's give you some ptsd from mm -hmm. days of old ultimately they're getting uh basically sort of getting hyped up here as uh, josh scott the head judge the 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 authority himself is setting up with the players you can hear them in the background getting hyped 200 and change i think are left from yesterday you had to win four games or better to move on Brian, day two is about to kick off. Yeah, it is, and I am absolutely a Twitter. I, I'm sure everyone else out there feels the a Twitter building. Yeah, a Twitter. It's I think it's called a, an X now. An X. Sorry. Yeah, I'm not doing that. Play. No, I, I can't do it. I, I'm I just, just don't have it in me. I'm sorry. I'm just gonna call it what it is, man. Uh, you're you're a better person than Thank I am. Thank you. But that, uh, yeah, clip that. The hype is absolutely massive at this point and I, I walked around those feature tables I, I saw the nerves man i saw the shaky hands that they were sitting on the tables and i think a lot of success on day two is predicated on just playing one match of flesh and blood at a time you need to distance yourself from the stakes you need to say this is the game i love this is my passion this is what i travel around the world for i am happy to be here i'm going to focus in on this game do my best and battle and i think the person who can find that mind state is the one that can reach the top. I've always been fascinated when you see some of the mental gymnastics that players do. They kind of set themselves up for stress that they don't need to create on their own. They have it already. Where you talk to them and they're like, "Well, I, you know, I, if I win this and lose this and win this, has your objective changed? Do you still not want, just want to win the just game that win. you're playing? Just win. Why look too far ahead? Just win the game that's right in front of you. Focus on that hand, that strategy, that gameplay, and and." Go from there. Don't worry about what's there. Just win the game that's ahead of you. So part of that is just managing that stress. But these are pros. These are the best of the best that are left. They have been in these positions. They've won pro quests, RTNs. They've top aided Battle Hardens callings. They've been there. They've done that. But it does not get bigger than this. And you are just one step closer. You've survived day one. Making day three, however, that is the ultimate challenge and it's now. a whole different ball game the stakes only get higher from this point every single round every single moment and we will bring you all of those stakes across these seven rounds today we're going to take a brief break get our players settled down in the future match area brendan and erica will be back with coverage of this first draft pod in just a few moments do not go anywhere we'll be right back from the world championships here in barcelona
Hello, everybody, and greetings from the armor. My name is Victor, as always, joined by Blue. Hello, hello. We are Bulgarian based flesh and blood content creators, and we do videos regarding everything flesh and blood. You can find us on YouTube at the armor. Joining in today to wish everybody in the world the best of times and the best of luck with their draws. And since I'm very jealous I'm not joining the event, I'll pass it over to the 50% of our cast that is. Hello everyone and good luck towards from me as well. And uh, I'm very excited that I will be able to participate in the main event and I hope that I'm going to be able to take home the trophy uh, for the video. Uh, but if it isn't for me, uh, I think that Pablo Pintor from Spain and maybe... Pablo y Sergio de los Anflaguas Amores saludándoos desde el Palacio de Aranjuez y esperemos que os estéis pasando increíble en Barcelona. Sí, tanto en Barcelona como lo que estoy viendo desde casa. Con los recientes cambios al metajuego nos enfrentamos a un meta más diverso que el de los dos eventos grandes que hemos jugado hasta ahora. ¿Qué héroe o baraja te sorprendería que se me Mira, héroe o baraja se me hace un poco más complicado porque es un metajuego muy abierto. Yo quiero que gane alguien de, de nuestra comunidad de España, que nos vamos con la montón, nos hemos juntado con esta piña como, por ejemplo, un país que antes de muy... La verdad es que nos ha costado coordinarnos, pero por una vez la comunidad española se ha juntado toda y lo hemos hecho. Confío en que, en que hagamos un buen papel y oye, tenemos el, el... Pues yo, la verdad, la gente sabe que me da mucha pena que el trabajo no parezca de las palabras más potentes para este torneo. Y bueno, esto como todo el mundo ha dicho, que no es una buena elección. Así que me gustaría mucho la justicia política de que el trabajo lo haga más bien. Si no puedo ser yo, que la verdad es que dudo que juegue Bravo en esto. So hello, my name's Az from Go Again Gaming, one third of the Living Legends podcast and the founder and co-host of the Azalea Cult. That's right, we just interviewed the Calling Taipei champion on the channel recently. But um, I hope you're having a fantastic time at Flesh and Blood Worlds, whether you're there or whether you're watching or wherever you might be out there looking at this in the big wide world. Thank you for joining us today here on Tabletop 24 and Flesh and Blood LSS itself. Um, it's going to be a great weekend. I'm actually there this weekend, so if you're there, say hello. I'm pretty recognisable. I'm the only, probably, probably the only mullet and moustache combo in Flesh and Blood. Uh, but if anybody wants to challenge me to that title, let's play a game of UPF. You can use a CC deck, and I'll use a Blitz deck. Anyway, I'm Az from the UK. Go and check out my channel. The uh, QR code will uh, will zap you straight there if you scan it on your phone. We do loads of different content on there. Um, I'm very unfiltered. It's a R-rated channel as well, so I say lots of different...
Hi, I'm Felix Chung. And I'm Shay Ashby. We are both casually competitive players and judges. The two of us are the co-hosts for the IP2 podcast. The focus of our show is looking behind the scenes and telling stories of the community builders, store owners, judges, and others that work hard every day to make Flesh and Blood the great game that it is. Think about how many hours have been spent preparing for these three days of competition. Hundreds of players practicing for the title of world champion but also by those working behind the scenes to make these events happen, including the tournament organizers, the judge team, the coverage team bringing Epic Games to us at home, plus the artists and vendors and cosplayers and so many more in attendance making the event an epic celebration of the game we all love. Shay, who's your pick for the winner of this weekend's event? You know, I'm just hoping that the Canadians that head over to Barcelona perform well. What about you, Felix? I'm going to go with my heart and choose the man who taught me through his contributions to the International Discord's Bravo channel for many years, Kale McCreeth, to take it home on Bravo Showstopper. From both of us at the IP2 podcast, here's to a great tournament and safe travels for everyone there. Goodbye. How's it going, guys? Congratulations for making it to Flesh and Blood World Championship. This is Atitra, and I'm sending you this message from Bangkok, Thailand, to wish you, every single one of you, all the best at the event. Well, what a perfect time to gather up and spend it on the things that you love, am I right? I mean, it's the festive season, the weather must be nice over there, you all come from all over the world just to be in the same place together, having a good time, I mean, this sounds like nothing else, but truly the most wonderful time of the year. Remember, I am sharing you from here in our humble little studio, eSports Thai Leagues, as we will be keeping updated on the event minute by minute. As a gaming event design and live streaming service organizer, we love to introduce people to new games and build community for beginners who have just set their foot into the world of their favorite games. Well, flesh and blood is obviously the muse of the moment. It is important to us to push and promote the game out there so people can be easily accessed to and they can enjoy the game as much as we do. We also manage Sedai a hub where amateurs come to learn the basics, discover their favorite heroes, and sharpen their skills before spreading their wings into the world. Well, I'm sure you start to see more of them in the upcoming events, so make sure to be on the lookout, okay? Or, if you are attending the Battle Hard in Bangkok this December, you'll be seeing them, and I'll be seeing you there. Anyway, I hope everyone is having a good time at the world this week, and um, I can't wait to hear all about it. And talking about who's going to be the winner, I mean, well, you all are creme de la creme of flesh and blood, so you all are already the winner to me, only just by being presented at the world. So, however, if I had to pick one, I obviously have to shout out to the Vespa from Thailand, of course, because he is actually standing right next to me and about to throw me shades if I say something else. So why don't you come over here and say hi to people? Hello, everyone. And I am rooting for you. Thank so you. come back with the trophy or never come back at all. Hopefully. Not hopefully, definitely. <laughs> He's okay. definitely going to win. He's going to beat you all, guys. So beware. OK, good luck. Bye. Bye. Hey everyone, I'm Clue, and I run the Clue YouTube channel, where I usually like to talk about game design and the future prospects of Flesh and Blood, as well as chucking the occasional goofy deck and try and combo off. But hey, this works. So regardless of whether or not you're a competitive player or you're just here for the fun, right? You gotta admire and just enjoy how much the competitive scene is really taking off. It's just fantastic to see. It's wonderful being able to watch people do what they love, right, with the proper backing of Legend Story Studios. So, I gotta toss it in with Brody to win, right? Better than the young ones. The community really makes this game and see people be able to actually have an opportunity to benefit from the absolute strategic craft that is flesh and blood is just wonderful to see. So, to you Brody, right? You have the providence to be crowned champion. You just have to snatch it, burn them all, be remorseless, invoke your courage and command and conquer everyone. Good luck. Whew. How many was that? What? Invoke counts? It's in every illusionist deck.
Welcome back to the Flesh and Blood World Championships here in Barcelona. I'm Brendan Patrick, joined by Erica Forschlov. And we just got done spectating our number one pod consisting of our seven O's and a few X1s as well. And I can tell you, it was quite the spectacle for me. I was sitting over the shoulder of Shing Tsang. You were sitting over the shoulder of Max, who will be spectating here in round eight of the tournament. Talk to me about how that draft went. So it's a very interesting draft. He did some very interesting uh, picks to begin with. I think he tried to stay open, and then uh, by the middle of pack one, he got a real a lot of really good items. He got a lot of red mini force fields, and uh, we saw him then pivot into dash and uh, went on from there. But uh, his dash deck is uh, looking very interesting. At the end of it all, he only has one red boom grenade, and he has a lot of defensive uh, items. Like I already mentioned, the red mini force fields are there, and uh, some dissolving shields to go with it. So we're looking at a very defensive. Uh, style of uh, dash that we haven't really seen yet. Yeah, very interesting. My question would be, did he come into the draft prepared to draft a defensive dash specifically, or was he maybe f swapping between heroes and ended up in dash sort of as a last resort? And we're going to see that play out in this match. This this pod did have three Tech Lovossons, which is quite low, um, which really speaks to the parallel of Shing Tsang's deck specifically. Uh, I mean, I saw some of the craziest four, fourth and fifth picks I've ever seen in my life. Our first match here is actually is pretty interesting because it is Carlos Carlos Carrero versus Max Max Diekman. So a bit of a team kill potentially going on here. Um, how do you feel like the Max versus Dash IO matchup goes in general? So I think typically both the Max and the Dash are trying to go the aggro game against each other, and it's basically a terms of who draws the best lines and who draws the best damage, and they're able to put that out. Uh, conversely, on the defensive side of things, uh, Dash don't typically have that many defensive capabilities because she wants to be super, super offensive, but as we already know, we have a lot of mini force fields to get through on the Dash side of things, so it's going to be a very interesting game and see how that pans out. All right, well, down to the match here. Max Diegman sitting at 6-1 as well as Carlos Carrero, both um, from Spain as well. So we have Dash IO versus Max Nitro. So we already see Dash have a very, very good uh, equipment layout. We have two Teclo Pesis that has uh, one block on them, and we have the two Korg Works. So the chest Korg Works is really nice for getting that extra uh, pitch whenever you need it. So you need one pitch into it, and then you get basically two pitch back. Uh, and then we have the legs where you pitch one into it, and you get go again on one of your attacks. Starting off with a rev up here, boosted with Gilligan. Do you expect Carlos here to just make a hyper driver token off the end of this? Yeah, I would expect so. And then it's always the question if you want to crank that one to come in with the Banksy. And it's always a tough choice if you want to get extra value on your next upcoming turn, oh, wow. depending on how your hand looks. Max Deepman only being able to block for four here, right? Yeah, that's a bit rough. Uh, rev up coming in for six uh, boosted is uh, not really what want to be at. But this is the issue that you have as uh, Dash going second, that uh, you don't really have that much defensive capabilities when you have all of these items that doesn't block for anything. Yeah, so do you do you just push damage? Do you look to activate, uh, you know, create that hyper driver, then potentially actually swing the bank scene instead of setting it up for next turn? I think you've got good information to potentially take that line. Yeah, I think uh, Carlos is doing the right thing. Yeah, he is uh, trying to maximize uh, the damage output here and try to get some uh, damage in here on the first turn and just capitalizing on Dash having some items in hand that she can't block with. Wow, and uh, Max Diekman not saving that, not being able to block that Banksy, so we're getting a point of damage here, or sorry, a counter back onto the Hyperdriver. Very interesting considering I think we put a three block in front of that Expedite. Yes. We, we are punished because the Banksy comes through and is able to put an additional counter on the Hyperdriver, so it's like he never cranked. Yeah, that might have been a little bit of a mistake. I think uh, Max uh, counted on him not... Uh, cranking the hyperdriver and just leaving it at two so coming with another strong turn uh but uh, we see the punishment here with the banksy getting that counter back onto the hyperdriver so great value here for carlos yeah starting at 13 life is pretty rough we saw yuki lee bender draft dash io yesterday and had access to three of those blade break equipments which was very very effective against mac nitro effectively being able to not put an entire car card in front of banksy one time throughout the game just gains a ton of value because if banksy hits Putting that counter back onto an item is just so big. Yeah, and we see the firewall and the solving shield in his hand, so he's going to be able to at least get uh, one item out this turn. And it's uh, really nice to capitalize on those items to get your sh counters on the symbiosis shot to be able to come in for two damage for each item that you get out. Uh, but we're going to see some boost action here so we can try to fetch some items off the top as well. Yep, so a yellow dumpster dive here coming in for three. And we boost away the mini force field, so he opted not to play that one out, which mm. is a very interesting choice. And actually does uh, satisfy the text of Dumpster Dive here, so it does get the plus one. That's true. So he might have hoped to maybe f find a better item uh, off, uh, off the next one, maybe. 
We'll see how Carlos decides to block here. It does look like Carlos has the firewall in hand as well. Mm -hmm. And there's another dumpster dive. So you opted to take the four damage. Okay. So Carlos down to 16. Four go again on this red dumpster dive now. Yeah, I think Carlos is uh, pretty comfortable uh, with his hand. That uh, firewall he has uh, might be something he wants to get out now because uh, critically you cannot uh, use your block items from Arsenal. So uh, but that was a bit of a tricky start when we announced or when we got this uh, new phenomenon that is the block uh, capabilities of these cards. You can't block with them from Arsenal like you can with your defense reactions. Uh, it's not a played card per se. It is a block card that you have to block from hand. Yeah, and Max left with that card in hand as a result, not being able to Arsenal and take take advantage of a five-card hand. Going into Carlos's turn here, four-card hand, Hyperdriver available. Yeah, it's going to be a big turn, probably. The Hyperdriver is going to help him get all the extra resources, so he's able to use uh, all that offensive capability that it has available to him in his hand. And we see that recharge come out here, going to give plus four. And a counter on the hyperdriver, which is uh, which is actually huge. Huge. <laughs> it's crazy how much he's he's sort of rolling the advantage off of getting that Banksy hit. Definitely. And uh, now sitting with this uh, hyperdriver on the three, so he's going to be able to capitalize on that a lot the upcoming turns. You see how Max decides to block. Definitely feels like Carlos at this point in the match is the beatdown. I'm trying to count how much floating he should have. I think it should be at two, right? So uh, if he wants to commit Banksy this turn, and uh, he, then he needs to get a hyperdriver out in order to crank that, in order to activate Banksy. It's a lot of uh, complex uh, lines in order to get that Banksy out. It, you either have to play an item from hand and crank that, or you need to get that hyperdriver out with your max ability. But in order to do that, you have to boost this turn. So it's a bit of a complex uh, liability to utilize Banksy a lot. And max ops, you know, does see the Hydrogen Collider off the top via the Firewall ability. Oh, Cogwarts base chess activated. Ah, yeah, so then he get, get, get up to three, so he can uh, keep his card in hand and uh, still come in with the Banksy here for for the remaining float. Yeah, I find sometimes while playing Max that the the math of trying to map out your turn can actually be quite complicated. It seems yeah. as the more aggressive hero, but it can be, it can be quite a lot of thinking. Definitely. Uh, the hyperdriver, uh, like counting on how many times you're going to boost one turn and then when you plan to play your hyperdriver out, because hyperdrivers are once per turn, so you could technically have one hyperdriver on board that uh, gets boosted and that gives you the resource counter from the first boost attack, and then you can play another hyperdriver out, boost again, and then that hyperdriver then reacts to that boost attack. So it's a lot of uh, complex lines that uh, Max can have. The yellow dissolving shield here for Max Diekman. And back over to Carlos, five card hand, two hyperdrivers, surely going to be a massive turn. Yeah, and as I expect, uh, Dash is on a very defensive oh, wow. uh, list. This is, sorry, this is yeah. pretty funny in the context of the draft because there is also a maximum velocity that went around um, in this draft. Uh, it's funny to see there was a twin drive. Twin drive, one of the key cards that actually turns on maximum velocity in, in class constructed. Yeah, we talked about that maximum velocity, how hard it is to pull off in this format because you need to boost three times a turn. And that is not super easy with uh, even a five card hand. You need those two blues because maximum velocity costs three to play out. And most of the boost attacks in this uh, format cost one or more. So uh, either you capitalize on those uh, zero attacks for three, which is not super great, that is super easy to block. Um, or you have this amazing uh, card that is called Twin Drive where you can boost two times and then you can more easily get that max velocity out. And we're uh, going to see... Uh, does not have the maximum velocity in hand. I thought but, he had. Yeah, <laughs> but does have a lot of red boost cards, it looks like. But that would be amazing if he, could, if, we, if he was able to pull that off in a sealed format. That would be amazing. It's like Max Geekman is off. He's opting to take the damage here. Three more cards in hand for Carlos. Three resources available. Yeah, I would expect him to save the Dissolving Shield to not give him uh, extra counters on the Hyperdriver to let the Banksy hit. So... Mm -hmm. um, I think that's wise. But Carlos still having so many cards in hand, there's a lot of damage that is going to come through here. So um, Max might be in a little bit of a pickle because the problem he is facing is that he needs to block this turn. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
the cards that he needs to block with is the card that he would love to use offensively. So um... yeah, I see at least one item, or I think two items in the hand of Max Deepman. So I th this could actually not impossible that Max Deepman actually dies this turn. Um, I see a Hydrant Collider and I believe another mini force field. I think mini force field. Right. Yeah, I don't. Um, I don't see the last card in hand. It could be a three block possibly. But if he has two items in hand and uh, Carlos is uh, opting to uh, be even more aggressive, then uh, it could cause some really big issues, yeah. We still have the two uh, block items uh, left on the equipment side of things, so that might be saving him this turn. And we have the Dissolving Shield to go with it, so we at least have four block on table. Yeah, like you said, I believe he's probably saving that shield uh, with the piece of equipment to cover up the banks. He's 0 to 50 coming out here. Boost it, boost away a red crankshaft. 3, go again. Oh. Yeah, so now we're starting to opt in for using the Dissolving Shield, saving one counter at least for that critical bank save. Absolutely. So planning to use that Dissolving Shield with the two Blade Break equipment in order to block the Banksy. Would you see Max Nitro activated here? Another hyperdriver. Yeah, so he's probably going to crank that one and come in for Banksy and then save his last card in Arsenal for another big turn if this is not... Has to pitch it. Right, right, right. Oh, we're opting to use the arms. So plus one on your next attack, I believe. So this Banksy is coming in perfect. for four. This is perfect. Yeah, very well played. Notice that Max was <laughs> clearly opting to save the, the shield and the equipment to cover up the Banksy, but gives it plus one and puts Max in a really tough position here. Yeah, I really love the Korgworks uh, base equipment overall. They have so many fun interactions that you can add on top of your... Uh, the ex existing card that you have in your hand, right? So uh, you can make some really interesting uh, lines with those. That was a very heads up play from Carlos Carrero. Definitely. We go back over to Max Diekman's turn with three cards in hand. We know two items as well. Cogworks available, but oh, we start with just a symbiosis shot here. This is very interesting. This tells me that he probably has an item on top to be able to crank that and get his action point back because I would not expect him to uh, leave this turn with uh, three cards left in hand. Now, Carlos with a healthy life total as well to pretty much gives himself a lot of room. And there's the boom grenade. Off the top. Love to see it. Yeah, a critical card for many Dash IO players as a way to force damage. And it, at the very least, force blocks from Carlos Square here and deny him from playing that four card hand and potentially ending the game on the next turn. Yeah, Is there any so. Any chance that Carlos just takes this? I mean, he possibly could. Uh, so Max Dickman has one card left in hand. We know that's an item, but uh, Carlos doesn't know if that is an attack or not. So it could potentially be uh, lethal range here. The Metix is going to come in for four, plus the Boom Grenade for eight. So if there's another one attack coming, then that might cause trouble. We have the Symbiosis shot as well. Yeah. So forcing some blocks here from uh, Carlos is super critical for, uh, for Max to be able to survive the next turn and not uh, face lethal. But uh, you never know when you play dash if you're going to draw into those uh, critical uh, non-blockable hands. We start right here with a red fender bender boosted and coming in for four hyperdrivers activate. And we see two items in Max Dickman's hand. We also see the two block gigawatts. We only have one three block and one two block available and one block on board. So uh, I think he m should be able to survive. But he's still at one, so I mean, he needs to block so this he fully. Has a two block and a three block and two yes. Items. So that's not that's not enough. Yeah, that's dead, right? Yes, yeah, that's there we dead. Go. And there's the fist oh! bump. And then is it unable to block Banksy, right? Oh, can't block the. Yeah, plus X as well. Exactly, exactly. Exactly. So super uh, cool play here by Carlos taking out the. Uh, defensive uh, dash deck that uh, Max uh, pulled out here. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, my, my core question regarding that draft and Max, what, you know, the dash IO deck that Max ended up on is, was he planning to draft a defensive dash or was he maybe waffling between a tech Levasen and a dash and then kind of ended up in dash because he didn't get the evos he was looking for and maybe just didn't get the max deck he was looking for. 
because I know we, we came back after the draft and Brian Gottlieb specifically talked about this archetype, talked about how much of a fan he was. Yep. Not an archetype I had seen before, Yep. Um, but we saw it sort of fold there to this aggressive max, uh, max deck in the form of Carlos. So yeah, um, I think this defensive uh, dash uh, could be really, really cool. Uh, but as, as you know, uh, you need to get those items out in order to get the defensive capabilities of them. And if you get stuck with them in hand, it can get really awkward, as we've seen now. Um, so really great play by Carlos. And the way he piloted uh, Max was really beautifully, like noticing uh, what Max was trying to do with his uh, cards and uh, his um, equipment on board and try to block effectively. And uh, punishing that with the Corvex arms and getting that extra one on the Banksy was uh, super good. Yeah, so obviously you got to watch Max's draft. You were able to read over my notes regarding Xing Sang's draft. How do you feel about Xing Sang's chances to progress to maybe a 3-0 in this pot after seeing that draft specifically? Because I know for me, I've seen a lot of Tecla Vossen drafts, and this is one of the most powerful ones I've ever seen. Yeah, I was looking at that uh, deck list, and it's an absolute powerhouse. He has so many good Evos and so many great uh, Evo thrusters and Evo uh, upgrade equipments, well, not equipments, the Evo upgrade cards that you can go with and that I can pack in a huge punch. Uh, so it's super, super critical for the Tecla Vossen to get those items out as early as possible. And that's all about uh, having a little bit of luck on your side. You want to see those cards early enough uh, to maximize the value early and early. Yeah, I want to talk to you about the macro breakdown of the pod, right? We had two maxes, three dash, and three Tekla Vossen. Yeah. Um, usually we see more Tekla Vossen in a pod. I just want to ask you regarding the dash specifically. Yeah. Do you think that a pod and bright lights can support three dash in a healthy way? Or is one person going to end up with, you know, a good deck and the others are going to be struggling? I think Dash is one of those uh, critical uh, decks that needs a lot of moving items in order to work as effectively as possible. Then, of course, you can build these other archetypes like we see now with the defensive Dash, where you just go all in on the defensive items because there are so many good defensive items. Mm -hmm. I mean, the mini force fields can block for four if you get them off the top and you don't crack them. The dissolving shield can also block for three, and you can just point act the damage and just uh, be able to uh, block those critical hit points uh, on and on uh, for every point that you off of it so uh, i really believe that you can uh, get some good value on the defensive side of things uh, but uh, so far i think the offensive dash is the one that we've seen being the more successful one uh, the boom grenades off the top are just super super good and it can be act be super super ter terminating to uh, find those off the top and uh, coming with that sneak uh, three four damage uh, off the top in uh, critical moments so you're drafting put yourself in the situation you're drafting in this pod um, it's day two of the world championships you're 7-0, you stand up, you look around the pod, and you realize that the, you're one of three dashes. Do you feel comfortable, or are you starting to sweat a little bit? I would start to sweat. I would not uh, be super happy to be three dash in one pod. I think two is the optimal... Um optimal amount, mm -hmm. so to say. Ideally, you're the one. <laughs> Ideally, I'm the one, yes. Uh, but I think, like, overall, I think reading signals in this format is super, super difficult because also some of the packs, they can have very good items in mm -hmm. them, like double red uh, good, good good items. Like, you have can have the boom grenades and you can have the red mini force field and the red dissolving shields. Uh, so it can be really hard to both pick and both sending signals uh, to the next one in line. So it's a really complex um, drafting system that we have going on here, especially when we have all three Mechanologist heroes. Uh, it's, um, it's a very hard uh, draft to uh, both send signals and also read signals. What sort of camp are you in, in terms of ideology when it comes to the draft? Do you try to stay open and find your lane, or do you tend to force a, a specific hero? And do you think that one strategy is better than the other? So I've been trying both. I've been trying to force uh, just because uh, sometimes I really want to try dash, and then I see a red boom grenade, mm. and then my pack won't pick one, and I'm like, slam done uh, and but uh, most oftenly i think especially in this format as you are three mechanologists i think you are heavily rewarded if you stay open and that's what i think i saw with uh, max dickman and uh, his uh, lines and his uh, first four picks they were very very open he opted in for those uh, red boost cards off the top and it was not until mid pack one that he opted in for those uh, effective um, red mini force fields and the red dissolving shields that we saw him pick in the middle of the draft that he locked in dash basically so um, uh, as I, again, he ended up in a pod with uh, three dashes in them, and I think I don't want to say he got punished by any means because I think he read the signals right. He got some really, really good items back, and he even opted to take uh, another uh, card above a red boom grenade to pass that onwards. But he then get, got rewarded with a red boom grenade later. So I mean, I don't think he did any mistakes by any means, but uh, I think it was a really hard draft. 
Yeah, it's really interesting because I know yesterday we got to watch Yuki Lee Bender uh, progress to a 7-0, so went 3-0 in the draft, and her first pick was a overload script, which is a really powerful card in most heroes. But yeah. if you're pack one, pick one in overload script, I think you might have a little bit of a preference towards Dash IO. Um, and then we know another player in this pod, Masaya Janik, also absolutely forces Tekla Vossen. Thinks if you're not doing that, you're pretty much drafting the incorrect way. Mm -hmm. But this is a pod, this is a pod, I mean, we saw the breakdown of what the players in this pod drafted yesterday. This is a pod that doesn't have, uh, doesn't really prefer Tekla Vossen as much as maybe the general opinion of I don't know, most of the players, I guess. And we saw that play out with only three Tekla Vossen in, in this draft. That being said, I think that Shing Sang's deck is uh, significantly better than some of the other Tekla Vossens, but that's how it is. He sat in the right seat. He was sitting next to um, at least one dash. There was The player to his left was a dash. Yep. Um, yeah, so interesting to see. I think you can, with this format, you can take multiple angles towards sort of your, your approach, right, from the ideological standpoint. Forcing, is it, is it incorrect or is it wrong? I'm not sure. I mean, players see results with, with both strategies. Yeah, I think if you want to force, then you really need to make sure that you're sending the signals. And as I mentioned, sending signals in this format can be really, really tough. So sometimes you just have to be lucky and get that pack that basically has that one really good item and the rest are kind of meh. And then you can use that at your advantage and take that good red items and then send the signal that, uh, okay, there are no good items anymore. You should probably not be dash and then be comfortable knowing that you send that uh, strong signal. Also, the play style between the heroes can be quite different, and I find that players will have a little bit of a, a little bit more trouble swapping from one hero to another. Maybe players that prefer Tech of Austin are very used to this attrition-based mm. card economy match, right? Yep. And then swapping over to something like a Dash IO or a Max Nitro can be a vastly different game experience. Definitely. And we see people come into these drafts with maybe not the idea of forcing, but definitely having major preferences. Definitely. I mean, uh, I personally like to play aggro most of the time. I've been dipping into more control lead excess of late to just understand uh, that archetype type a little bit better uh, but I absolutely think that uh, coming into this format you are probably more favored if you have the capability in order to play all of the three heroes mm -hmm. comfortably uh, but that is of course going to take a lot more of your time and you got to need that practice rounds I know I've talked to some of the players and they have been talking about playing about uh, 30 50 drafts leading into this tournament which is huge one draft can take up to three four hours so mm -hmm. it's a lot of time commitment that they are pushing into this uh, format but at the end of the day it's a huge tournament it's a lot of money on the line uh, so of course they are putting uh, the work in it's almost an objective truth in flesh and blood that being able to draft and play every hero is the better way to go about it. Um, even in formats, maybe like Bright Lights or like Uprising, where one hero rises to the top a little bit as sort of the higher power level hero, at least in terms of the floor, mm -hmm. still having you know the other couple heroes in the format in your toolbox is definitely the better strategy overall. Yeah, definitely. And uh, it's going to be fun to see how this uh, Max Dex and Carlos uh, piloting capabilities is going to round out this uh, draft of the day. Well, we're going to cut to a short break, and I think Flake is going to come in and talk to Carlos about that max draft. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Bienvenido a estar, uh, estamos aquí con Carlos Carrero. Carlos, ¿cómo se siente estar aquí en España? Uh, a jugar Flesh and Blood, World Championships. You're from Spain. Yeah. ¿Cómo se sientes? Muy bien, muy bien de estar en España. Playing home, jugando en casa. 
Yeah, well, you get some home field advantage, man. Yeah. But not only that, dude, you are playing against a fellow countryman, yeah. against Max Diekman, who is a back-to-back -back national champion on stream leading off day two. That's got to be slightly nervous. Like, this is your guy. This is your bannerman. Yeah. He was really excited to see yesterday that in the top eight qualifiers, so the first spot for the first half of the day, there were two Spaniards. Uh, but I was, didn't know I was playing Max. And, and, and because actually the name of the Spaniard is Max, uh, like the champion. Yeah. And, and I did play with him previously in the Nationals. So he won the tournament and I made uh, top four. Uh, but, but yeah, it, it was exciting to, to play with a, with a friend and, 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 and being able to, to be also in a stream because uh, that's sometimes... Uh, when you, I typically follow the, the, the event with you commenting and everything sure. well, thank you. As, a, as an spectator, but being there playing myself, it's, 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 it was pretty great. It's got to be a different feeling as well, not to mention it's the fact that you're now 7-1, you're on the top of the bracket, you're, you're doing well, but is there extra stress or extra pressure because you're in you're here in Barcelona in Spain? Do you did you feel like, you know, does does there any extra weight obviously of winning on your home soil? Do you feel the extra pressure when you're going into these games and as you're winning, as you're going from game to game, you're like this is getting more real, this is getting more real. Does the stress pile up or do you just yeah. kind of push that aside? I think a stress pile up as as you feel that you are in the top tables. But but I feel that your 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 worst enemy is yourself, no? Yeah. Doing mistakes, playing. So so there are many things you cannot control. What's your matcha? What's your opponent? And everything. Sure. But these things you can control. It's how you control yourself, your emotions, your stress levels. Some some of it is good, and use it to give your your best. That's all you can do. Yeah. You got to do your best. And yesterday, obviously. You had one hell of a round. You had great, great showing. You went six and one yesterday. Yeah. Your drafting yesterday. Your draft was a very successful draft yesterday. How did your draft strategy go from yesterday moving into today? You had a night's rest. You can think about it. Did your draft strategy change? Did you learn anything from yesterday moving into today? Or was it all systems go? Let's just do it again. Yeah, yesterday was more open uh, when I was tracing the, the table of draft. Uh, but yesterday I had more information because there were some streams yesterday of the top table, so playing, seeing Yuki playing Dash, Masu Janik playing Peklobosen, and they were in the table. So I had already information on what other opponents have played yesterday. So having information on two or three Peklobosen yesterday and one Dash, I had some bias toward Max. So I would say I would try to find if Max is open in the first picks, and if that's so, I would force it without being too much, too, too much time open, because I had many data points from just not many but some so. dude it works out and yeah. uh like i said earlier mi español no está muy bien pero i am trying yeah. and it's great to speak to you my friend now you got an opportunity to speak to the entire flesh and blood world you're representing spain we're here in barcelona is there anybody you want to give a shout out to anybody you want to say thank you to or just yeah thank you to my wife and kids gracias familia porque sin su apoyo i, I have two children and you know, playing play some blood and being a dad is it's tough. So. <laughs> I will, everybody that I have, I'm not even kidding you, everybody who I have offered an opportunity to thank on yeah. stream, the first person that they thank, it is now three for three, the first person that they thank is their wife. Yeah. Every single time. Uh, is the, the keeper, you know, is the person that, that <laughs> makes you play or not play. You know, the, I can attend this event, so. Yeah. The, Many times it's not my decision. Hey, <laughs> Flesh and Blood's the smartest people in the world. <laughs> so thanking uh, the right people. Uh, uh, amigo, gracias. Thank you. Muy gracias. And, uh, oh, I see you later here because that would mean I I'm keep winning. So. I like that idea. Hey, if you're in the top eight, buddy, we're going to speak a lot. So yeah. don't go too far, ladies and gentlemen. Again, round number nine is going to be around the corner here for the Flesh and Blood World Championships live in Barcelona.
Buenos días. Buenas tardes. Buenas noches. Somos de las Islas Canarias en el Océano Atlántico. En nuestro canal hablamos principalmente de Flesh and Blood. Productos, reviews, novedades, unboxing, pack opening, un poco de todo. También hablamos de otros TCG y de otros juegos. Nos puedes encontrar sobre todo en YouTube, pero también estamos en Facebook, Instagram, Discord y otras redes sociales. Mi apuesta para el mundial, por supuesto, es Españita, si no... Mi apuesta no va a ser una apuesta, sino va a ser pedir un deseo, y es que sea alguien europeo, ya que estamos en Europa, ya que estamos en España, que se lo lleve alguien de aquí cerca. ¿Quién va a ganar el mundial? Es una pregunta complicada, pero yo creo que va a ganar España, y voy a arriesgarme, y voy a decir que va a ganar Pablo Pintor, y si tiene que ganar un héroe, tiene que ser bravo. <risa> Nos vemos en el próximo vídeo. Adios. Nos vemos en el mundial. Hey from Canada to everybody at the World Championships in Barcelona. I'm Alex from Cozy TCG on YouTube, cracking packs and making gameplay basics videos for games like Flesh and Blood and Disney Lorcana. I want to wish everybody at the World Championships a fabulous tournament <laughs> and some great matchups. Rooting for Dash to make top eight. I want to extend a huge thank you to everyone who's been actively supporting and promoting Flesh and Blood through various channels like Twitch, YouTube, X, and more. Your efforts truly help shape this incredible community. I'm looking forward to seeing how the new mechanologists will impact the game and shape the meta. It's going to be an exciting journey. For those playing mechanologists, my favorite, I can't wait to see how you push the boundaries and make your mark in the game. Go Mac! Stay cozy, have fun, and go again. Hi, I'm Remus from the Cardboard Souls YouTube channel. I hope you're enjoying the coverage of the World Championships here in Europe. If you're anything like me, you'll be rooting for a Ranger, not you, Lexi. Anyway, perhaps you'll check out my channel. We've always got up-to-date armory gameplay from the latest meta, and occasionally I'm joined by Chris Chalk in our Chalk and Talk segment to discuss the competitive scene. Our Fab for Less segment features deck techs, card guides, and everything else you need to play Flesh and Blood on a budget. The Junk Bank is where we can get experimental with our deck builds, and sometimes even the formats that we play. Our Fab and Chill series focuses on all aspects of the casual game. Of course there's gameplay, but we've also got cube building, altar painting, we even did whiskey pairings for each of the regions in Wraith. So if you think you might like what you see, check us out on Cardboard Swords. We'll see you there. Hello everyone at Worlds in Barcelona. This is the Banish Zone. I'm Bryn. Hi, I'm Chris. And I hope you're having a beautiful time or you're watching the beautiful stream of Worlds in Barcelona and you're along with us, not there. <laughs> yeah, unfortunate. <laughs> unfortunate. Uh, we hope, or I hope, let's see, who do I think is going to win? I think Icelander is going to win. That seems like a reasonable guess. Yeah, I was going to say Fi if I had to pick someone. I feel you're like gonna Fi is going to be pretty strong. You think you can get around Icelander? It's a uh, good matchup? Depends. That's not good, but uh, <laughs> if there's no Lexi to worry about. Yeah, that's know. what I think. No Lexi. We now, you, you're in the future. No Every, Lexi exists. Yeah, Icelander yeah. probably hasn't LL'd. Mm -hmm. so. It doesn't seem like she's going to. Yeah. So everyone's unshackled from Lexi. So, so we'll if you're see. there, have a beautiful game. If you're not like us, uh, RIP to you. I hope you're watching <laughs> this beautiful stream. Uh, keep playing games in the flesh and blood, and good luck, have fun. Good luck, have fun. Bye. Hello heroes, my name is Adam Cartel and I'm a content creator from the Philippines. I think some of you already heard about me through that Kasai Commoner Deck Tech video that I shot earlier this year. And frankly, I think that was the only video that I've done which had a lot of traction. 
But originally, I really made this channel so that I could talk at length about my main hero, which is Assassin. But then one thing led to another, and then I talk about certain other topics, and then I had to go into a really long hiatus, but now I am back. Enough about my channel, I want to talk about something even more important. How are you guys? How's Worlds? I can't make it to Barcelona, it's just too far for me, and I hope you guys are having fun. I was actually asked which hero or which country would win here in Worlds, and I would rather answer with a hero rather than a country, and I personally think it's gonna be Dromai. Actually, between you and me, I really, 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 really want Arachne to win, because Arachne is my main. I still think Arachne needs a lot more cards in order to progress this far into the competitive scene. Contrast that with Dromai, who has been performing really well during the past year and has uh, gotten a lot of support during the previous sets. And now that Lexi is gone, I think Jomai really, 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 really stands a chance to win Worlds. So that's my answer. Parting words. Please remember that fun is a shared resource. If you want to have fun, make sure that your opponent is going to have fun as well. That's all for this video. My name is Adam Cartel. So long, heroes, and see you on the battlefield. And see you in my subscribers list. Oh, hey. Didn't see you there. It's the Workday Slacker. I'm typically just a pair of hands on YouTube, but I am in fact a whole person. I wanted to take this very special moment to say good luck to everybody playing in Worlds. And I think you're all incredible competitors, but if I had to choose someone to take home first place, I'd gotta give it up to my boy, Victor Mercado, who is already on the roll of honor for the Icelander Blitz living legend. So he's got the stuff to go all the way. I can only assume he's playing Icelander because the number of times he's kicked my butt with Icelander, it only seems right. But whatever everyone's playing, I hope you have fun. I wish I could be there. Never been to Barcelona. Let's do somewhere cool next year too, James, please. And really looking forward to making more videos, talking flesh and blood, playing with all of you. And honestly, it's been a great year. Hope to see you all online and uh, don't work too hard.
Welcome back to the Flesh and Blood World Championships here in Barcelona. I'm Brendan Patrick, joined by Erica Forshlov, and we are going to be following our two last two 8 0 players in the entire tournament with Yuki Lee Bender versus Shing Sang. Shing Sang was the player that I was able to spectate and draft, has a very, very good Tekla Vossen deck, one of the best I've ever seen. And Yuki is back on Dash IO. One key statistic from this last pod here is that in this last pod, in the undefeated pod that started here on day two in the morning, only one player drafted a different hero than they did yesterday in uh, yesterday's pod, and that was Shing Sang. Shing Sang drafted Max Nitro yesterday and drafted drafted Tekla Boston today. Everybody else, the same hero they drafted yesterday, that's what they drafted today. Yeah, I can imagine that they uh, are uh, paving off the success that they had yesterday on these heroes, because this is the number one pod, right? So you have a very, very stacked pod, and all of these players went undefeated yesterday. So um, we uh, are probably seeing that effect today, that uh, what worked yesterday will probably work today. Yeah, I wonder if it also comes down to some comfort picks in the format. Um, I know that uh, Tekla Vossen Force is probably the most public sort of ideology when it comes to the format. I think mm. players like Yuki Lee Bender are exploiting that by actually picking Dash IO, maybe forcing Dash IO, because it is usually open in most pods. Definitely, and uh, if you find the right key pieces uh, that you need in the dash in order to be able to beat a good uh, defensive Tekla boss, then, then you can absolutely pull through. I'm a bit worrisome for Yuki now because Shing has, as you mentioned, the most nuts <laughs> Tekla Vossen deck I've ever seen. It has so many good Evo equipments in it. It's plentiful of Evo equipment, so you can swap them out and uh, exchange them for even more uh, defensive capabilities throughout the game. Yeah, we know part of Yuki's game plan to win this match is via boom grenades, and Shing Tseng has a lot of blocking Evos. Um, a lot of those, like Evo, de Evo, Evo Sentry base chest, uh, base arms, and base head, which is, I mean, that's a lot, it's a lot to get through. Definitely. Uh, he doesn't have any firewalls though, so that might be a bit troublesome if uh, Yuki is able to get those overpower cards across the line. Uh, but uh, we need to see those uh, pulling through to um, to be worried about that. And we see a turn zero Evo from Shing Tang here, just looking to get that weapon online as soon as possible. Yeah, he got the really, really good start here with the Evo Data Mine headpiece to start things off. Uh, so, um, him starting on the play there, then uh, Yuki following it up on uh, the aggressive uh, side of things. We have a Razzle Dazzle here from Yuki. No boost, it looks like. Very interesting. So maybe trying to just uh, set up. I think you need to really capitalize on those uh, five card turns and uh, going second, you have this four card hand to start with. So I think uh, Yuki is probably going to try to arsenal a really powerful call to try to make sure that she has the maximum offensive capabilities uh, available to her when she uh, when she goes off. Do you think that Shing Sang is wondering if this is telegraphing an item at all off the top? Sorry? Do you think Shing Sang potentially thinks that Yuki is telegraphing an item on top? I would suspect <laughs> that. Because um, uh, if you have an item on the top and you can crank that, then you can get your um, action point back. So uh, maybe you can come in with a symbiosis shot to follow this uh, up. Since he pits a red, she has to commit one of her cards in order to do so. Since if you boost or not, if you uh, activate the item from the top to play it out, then you have to pay one extra than uh, its original cost. Mm -hmm. More than anything, it does look like a setup turn, um, setting up for the next five card hand, but sh still something that Shing Tsang needs to think about here. Definitely. Yep, and it looks like it will be that setup turn, so it's going to be an arsenal pass here from Yuki Lee Bender. Very interesting. So uh, maybe Yuki was trying to uh, fake a boom grenade off the top, so. Uh... That uh, could be something that she used to scare him off to maybe double block uh, this card to get some extra cards out of his hand. Uh, but uh, Xing read that uh, really good and uh, opted in to not fully block. I'll tell you, Xing has a lot of Evos, but he also has a lot of Evo payoffs as well. Mm. Um, su such as like Heavy Artillery, Liquid Cooled Mayhem, Mechanical Strength, um, tons of those cards in the deck. And we see one of those Heavy Artilleries pitched right now and a Liquid uh, Cooled Mayhem played. Yeah, all of those EVO upgrade cards, they become even, even better uh, the more EVOs you have uh, out on play. So uh, some of these EVO can be super, super scary. They can come in with overpower and uh, you take, th th like the liquid cool that made him, they cost one, ex one less for each uh, EVO equipment that you have, so you can get that out uh, very easily. And you can punch some uh, really hard cards into this format.
It looks like we're going back over to Yuki here. So Yuki has a full uh, four card hand and a card in Arsenal, so uh, we're probably going to see her for the first time uh, doing a full offensive uh, play here. So we're going to see how he should pans out there. Starting off with an under loop. So no card, uh, no no item off the top there, but uh, that's that's what's so good with these uh, one for four uh, boost cards because uh, that's exactly what uh, Dash wants to do. She wants to play this one for fours, uh, use as little uh, resources as possible to be able to just boost away cards from the top and dig for those uh, crucial items. Looks like a boom grenade as well comes out here with no crank. Uh, Shing did block with the Evo base sentry arms, potentially looking to scrap that on his turn. Yeah, so the uh, the cycle that you can get here is that you play this scrap card that scraps your Evo equipment down into your Banish Zone, and then you can use Teclavasen's ability in order to uh, play those back out into your equipment slots. So that's exactly what we see here. Now he has the Evo Bus Hive out, and that is the only equipment out right now that doesn't have any block on it. Um, but it does have the ability that when you activate it, you get an extra resource, but uh, that is uh, way past at this point. Mm -hmm. so looks like Yuki just considering the block here on the scrap compactor. Yeah, it's just coming in for three, but Yuki is already sitting at 15 versus 19 HP. She doesn't probably want to take too much damage uh, to be able to survive throughout. If she's trying maybe to set up some kind of pitch deck uh, situation, so she has a really good uh, final punch, so to say, when we reach that uh, critical pitch deck. Um, I think that is the uh, optimal uh, play here as the dash to try and uh, telegraph uh, what you're going to draw into and what you're going to get on the top in those later turns. Do you see those sentry base arms come out at instant speed via Tekla of Austin's ability? In your experience, what is the path to victory for the Tekla of Austin deck in general against Dash.io? I think in general, if you have all of those great uh, blocking equipments like this red evil base equipment, it has uh, better one. So you can block with it uh, two and then for a one, and then it gets uh, still be around on the board to help you with your evil upgrades uh, later in the game. So. Um, if you have a lot of those, then you can definitely go into a more defensive uh, style of play where you can just uh, block out everything and hope that your opponent decks out before uh, before you're dead. And here we go. We see a hydraulic press from Yuki Lee Bender gaining that evasion. Yeah, and with that overpower, she is going to be able to force through that uh, boom grenade on hit uh, moving on. So a really strong play here from Yuki. Shing down to 12 now. Tekla Leveler does have go again, does coming in for two um, due to Shing setting up those three Evos. Yeah, and with three Evos, it does have the critical go again. And uh, at the three pieces uh, out on the board, that is when you reach the critical uh, point where you can start utilizing your Tekla Lever as an initiator into some big attack. So it's really, really good to, as a Tekla Vossen, uh, drafting these uh, two for five attacks to when you get to this point, you can capitalize a lot on those uh, two card hands to come in basically for that one, uh, two for five, and then with this Tekla Lever for another two. We see Torque turned here, for Shing Tsang coming in for six. Yeah, Torque Tune being one of the more powerful cards in this format. It has the Galvanize, so it only blocks for two, but if you destroy an item, it can block for four. Uh, it does get the Overpower if uh, an item you control has been destroyed this turn, which uh, is not super likely when you play the Teclovos send deck. More likely when you play uh, Max or Dash, who typically has uh, a more item-driven uh, game plan. Yep, this is also a two card eight out of Shing Seng. So attacking with the leveler first and then into Torque Turn. I mean, this is a constructed level of power in terms of the amount of uh, quantitative attack value Shing Seng is getting out of these two cards. Yeah, definitely. A two card eight is absolutely massive. And imagine if you had a fourth uh, Eve on board, then that uh, Tekla lever was going to come in for three. So that's even nine power for uh, a two card hand. That's uh, massive. So a lot of pressure in a format like Limited, especially when a lot of these cards block for two or even zero. Definitely, and uh, unfortunately for Yuki, she's playing the dash who can have the unfortunate situations where they end up with a lot of uh, zero blocks uh, in hand, and then is then forced to block with their more critical uh, cards that they want to play out. But it's some yellows here, so I don't think she's uh, too sad about those. She's saying being left with that redundant card at hand as well. 
Yeah, so probably gonna see a setup turn here from uh, Yuki to get them item out, get those item out, the items out, and then uh, get some counters on the symbiosis shot uh, to uh, set herself up for uh, some defenses here. Now with the dissolving shield that can block for three on the upcoming turn. How do you feel about Yuki's ability to force damage via boom grenades, considering how much block value Shing Sang will likely have on those Evos in this game? Yeah, I think that is super critical. Oh, we see another red boom grenade off the top. She's going to get uh, another her action point back now. Uh, so that's awesome. But um, to your question, we uh, have to uh, basically capitalize on all the damage we can in order to get uh, of, up and beyond uh, the blocking capability that Teklovasen can uh, can can utilize basically so using those uh, overpowered uh, attacks is super super critical using the overload scripts like we saw Yuki use uh, yesterday to push uh, these boom grenades uh, over is uh, super critical yeah we saw Yuki pack one pick one overload script yesterday and win almost every match with it, it yep. definitely overperformed Evo da data mine activated for Shing saying likely a turn where Shing is going to want to push a lot of damage in order to force cards force cards out of Yuki's hand in lieu of that boom grenade turn, which is coming soon after this. Yeah, so I think Yuki is in a really good position here. She has a really good uh, health, uh, not advantage, but she's on a good health uh, level towards her Teklovasen opponent. So uh, now when she has set up this uh, red boom grenade and having it uh, left over until the next turn, uh, she will probably like to stick with this hand that she has to be able to push this boom grenade through on her turn. So. Uh, she is now able to take uh, this damage that uh, Shin can provide because his objective right now is to try to do as much damage as uh, he possibly can with his hand in order to minimize the offensive capabilities from uh, Yuki's hand on her turn. Yeah, and Shin Seng was able to put that Evo on top and then boost it away, which is just so much value to get in a match like this. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's a very expensive EVO though. The EVO thrusters, I think, uh, cost three uh, to play out. So you need a full blue there to uh, get that one out. Yeah, it's just nice in the sort of in the economy. No, it costs two, right? Ah. Yeah. In the economy of a match, being able to boost something like that, you kind of free roll the boost. Usually it's a minus one card out of your deck. Maybe less relevant to get stash IO. But in the grand scheme of things, boosting EVOs in Tech of Austin is a very, very powerful thing to do. Usually it's quite inconsistent, but if you have that headpiece, you're able to put that card on top. Yeah, so Xing wasn't able to find any offensive cards. He has a very red heavy hand. Yeah, it's cost three, never mind. So Xing wasn't able to push that much damage, but he was able to put up this evil thrust that is now going to be able to block for three in case he needs it. And uh, it looks like we have a big turn coming up. Yuki, Yuki, do you think she's going to go grab the overpower card out of the graveyard via this If she can pitch protocol? for it, then absolutely. It's a good yep. choice. Absolutely. And that's what we see. Hydraulic Press coming down again. Once again, has overpower with that evasion. Boom Grenade. Also on the battlefield, so if Shing takes any damage, we'll be taking an additional four from that boom grenade. And you can see the smile on his face as he starts to realize his fate. <laughs> yeah, having the luck to get this uh, hydraulic press out this early is really working in Yuki's favor. Be able to cycle that back with the uh, backup protocols is uh, super, super powerful. And Shing, Shing is definitely playing a deck where he wants to set up that weapon and sort of progress into the late game, but... When Yuki Lee Bender sitting across the field with a boom grenade ready to go, I think the last thing you want to do is take an entire turn off to set up an Evo. And that was just what Shing drew that turn. Didn't draw any gas and had to just opt to play the, the Evo leg piece out there. Yeah, I'm curious if the life totals uh, were updated there on Shing's side, because I believe it took quite a lot of damage from that uh, boom grenade uh, turn. But yeah, we now have the critical point where we have four thrusters out and the Teclo lever is now going to come in for three, go again. So now it's the turning point where you're going to see a lot of uh, power uh, coming in from this Teclo lever on turn on turn. Yeah, it does look like Ching is at five. So the life tolls were swapped, swapped. there. Ah, oh, I understand. Yes. So a really good start here from uh, Yuki. I think... Uh, Pushing your Teclo was an opponent down to this uh, life total is really, really good. But uh, we cannot forget that uh, she, he still has all his uh, blocking equipment available to him uh, on this those Evo. Ooh, and this in a Terminator, Terminator tank, this is a majestic. This was actually Shang Tsang's pack one, pick one of the draft. Wow. Does have four Evos, so satisfying everything. That's coming in for nine overpower. And it only costs three to play.
Wow. Yeah, it's and when massive. it hits a hero, they discard a card. It's massive. If I saw this in my pack one, pick one, I would force Teclovossen at every cost possible. This card is just fantastic. And if you get to that point where you get all of those uh, evos out and you'll be able to get all of the bonuses that you get by playing this card, it's absolutely massive. What an insane turn. Attacks with Teclo Leveler twice and then plays Terminator Tank. It's the sheer output from Shing Sang here is amazing. Yeah, huge turn here. That Terminator Tank is doing work. I really thought that Yugi Lee Bender was the aggressive deck here, but Xing Sang has really turned a corner on this on this turn. Yeah, Xing Sang is saying I'm the I'm the aggressor now. It's uh, on uh, Yuki's side now to see how much she can block. Uh, but since it has overpower, she can only block with one action card. But she does have the Teclo base legs available to her to cover up some health of total at least. The Terminator tank definitely at first look looks like a constructed card, but seeing it in limited is just absolutely insane. Yeah, I don't think Yuki is super happy to discard a card. Uh, I believe she has to choose which card is discarded, though, so she can absolutely tailor her hand to uh, come back uh, strong again. But yeah. uh, she already blocked with that uh, 0 to 50 yellow, so uh, I don't think she was uh, planning to block any more this turn. So Yuki has to take the entire 9 damage because, likely due to how her hand plays out, she cannot discard effectively two cards one for blocking and the other after that she would just have to simply pass with that so we do see you have to go take all the nine all the way down to three and this match has gotten a lot closer very quick. Definitely. And I think that is the wise choice from Yuki because she has to keep on putting the pressure up at this critical point in time because if she lets Teclovossen at this point in time to just uh, keep a full card hand, she is not going to be able to block things out uh, any longer uh, or, or for a very long ex extended period of time because she does have a lot of items in her deck and if she gets stuck on those in hand when it's critical time for her to block, it's going to be very awkward. Now we're going to see you, Xing saying, I believe, play around that potential boom grenade with this equipment. Oh, he's actually, I, I believe that's what he's thinking about. Possibly. So he doesn't know, we don't know what Yuki has in Arsenal, but if that's another 1 for 4 attack, and then she can come in with a symbiosis shot, then uh, it's going to be a lot of damage this turn. What do you think the main thing Xing Sang is worried about here? Is it another 1 for 4 attack out of Arsenal, or is it simply the Boom Grenade being threatened off the top here? Because, I mean, Boom Grenade... It's potentially lethal if it's red, right? If you take one damage, the boom grenade hits for four. That could be it for Xing Sang. Definitely. I don't think Xing Shang wants to take any uh, chances at this point in time. And it does have that battle worn uh, equipment available to him. So he's not going to lose that by any means. So he's uh, safe to use mm. that now for this uh, breakpoint. We do see there's actually a dumpster dive on the top of the deck for Yuki Lee Bender. We're going to see it boosted away. Now we have dive through data on hit op one. Yeah, so that's going to be let her be able to cycle a card in hand if uh, she attacks. But uh, I think, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the uh, poker game that we're playing right now is that if Xing uh, thinks that Yuki sits with a boom grenade off the top, and if he's uh, comfortable uh, blocking with a three-card hand, for example, and just uh, let one come through and just hope that there isn't a boom grenade off the top that just will just instantly kill him. Yeah. Uh, so it's that uh, that he is uh, forced to be working with here. I don't think... I mean, possibly he could uh, block with his uh, headpiece here and lose that, and just lose the plus one power from his Teclo lever on his turn, but... I think um, he's considering that, actually. Probably. I don't think it's the end of the world if he does that. I mean, it's just one power throughout the rest of the game, and it's not super, super crucial. And important to note that the combat chain has not been broken, so it doesn't have access to those Evo Sentry base arms in order to block this critical breakpoint. And I believe we see Xing Sang really debating on the likelihood of that being an instant speed boom grenade off the top, which could spell his demise here. Definitely, and it's all about uh, gambling at this point in time. If he trusts that uh, there is no boom grenade off the top and just goes for it, but uh, at mm -hmm. the same time, he also needs to have a hand that uh, can utilize uh, the full potential mm -hmm. uh, to come back with an offensive power to threaten Yuki's hand and uh, take the tempo back. Yeah, because the question is, is, like, if you double block this, potentially, or you block with your headpiece, can you still win the game? Exactly. Because you might survive this turn, but will you have the output via that, that what would be a two-card hand in order to actually close this out? Or do you need to take the risk, hope that Yuki Lee doesn't see the third boom grenade, and opt to apply pressure and take cards out of Yuki Lee's hands? This is the most critical sort of point of the entire match, because Xing Sang either needs to apply pressure to Yuki and take cards out of hand, 
or he's going to be facing down this immense pressure and threat of on-hit boom grenade, probably for the rest of the match, because Yuki Lee is just going to strip cards out of his hand. Exactly, and if we get to a point where Yuki can strip uh, several 1 for 4s in a row or bigger attacks, then it's going to be very awkward for him to block with two cards uh, on and on. Yeah, it's yeah. a hard one. Shing is scrapping his head and thinking, Am, is this the right play? Am I too greedy? This is absolutely where, where am I too safe? will be won or lost is in this block. Does she have it on top? She's seen so many boom grenades already. What is the likelihood? We did boost away the one dumpster dive. Does opt to block for three, and it's just going to hope that it's not the boom grenade. Yuki looks at the top. It, it is, is not. not. <laughs> Takes one. Shang Tsang gets away. The suspense the three is real. And you can see the smile from Yuki there. These are the only two players that are left undefeated at this point in time, I believe. Yeah, the player that wins this match progresses to be the only undefeated in the tournament at 9-0. and oh. Amazing. Which is not too far from locking away top 8, I believe. It might be close, closer to 11-0. and oh. Still yeah. one step closer. So Shing is actually opting in to use the Evo Data Mine to, um, to block this Symbiosis shot out. And it was only a backup protocol yellow that was on the top there. Nepin is going to be able to swing with this one more time. Shing yeah, Tsang. that is not good for Shing. It's not good, but it's not nearly as bad as the Boom Grenade. Can still survive. Yeah, Shing was hoping that there was not an item on top so he could come in with another Symbiosis shot. He was hoping to utilize uh, his sand that he has left available to him in order to come back with that offensive power. Because now he runs the risk that uh, Yuki is going to take back all the tempo. And with that yellow uh, backup protocol out in play as well, um, she can uh, tutor her hand to uh, really pack a punch next turn. Has Yuki Lee blocked with any sort of relevant yellows? Because I know the Hydraulic Press has been the key card of this matchup for her so far, obviously in, in pair with the Boom Grenade, but in terms of yellows, I don't remember seeing any significant ones going to the graveyard. Shing Sang going down to two here, while we'll three Evos active, so the Tech Lover is going to come in for two go again. Yeah, I think she blocked with uh, a few yellows in the beginning, like some metics and stuff, but those only coming for three, so those, they're not super threatening. But if you happen to draw into a very blue heavy hand, then you can definitely use that to your uh, advantage to uh, fix that up. And Yuki Lee draws two items here. So only two blocking cards for Yuki Lee Bender in hand. Does have access to the one piece of equipment in the form of the Teclo base legs. But max block out of hand, I mean, not considering the firewall, which we don't know, is there is going to be seven. Yeah, Yuki's in a bit of a pickle here because, as we mentioned earlier, the blocking capabilities on your uh, hands as dash, you cannot block with your items, of course. So what you're left to block with is those uh, crucial uh, attacks that you definitely want to play out in order to keep the offensive power out. And take one damage here, and there is the big Bertha from Ching Sang coming in for five. Likely to de demand both cards from Yuki, both blocking cards out of hand. I wonder if Yuki is able to block this. I saw two items. I saw two items, and I believe I saw two blocking cards. Yeah, it's a Razzle Dazzle and um, like Panel a Crank Shaft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that blocks six, I believe. I don't remember if Panel Beater blocks. Uh, it doesn't matter because Big Bertha is coming in for five. So even if it blocks for two, it does, it, it's going to be a full block. But uh, going back to Yuki's turn, Having a two-card hand, oh, sorry, a two-item card hand is uh, not really what you're looking for in order to keep the offensive notes up. Yeah, not great, but you do have access to the yellow backup protocol on the battlefield as well as you know symbiosis shot three counters on that weapon. Each swing with that weapon is going to represent lethal. Shing Sang does have access to the Evo Sentry base arms as well as those legs, which are going to block. I mean, just so much block left for Shing Sang, so it probably feels healthy in the face of that item. We are going to. Go ahead and grab a Medex. Yeah, so she's going to use uh, that in order to help her block, in order to... I think uh, the utilization here is that uh, instead of blocking with the cards from hand and not being able to mm. uh, force out the yellow um, backup protocol, she opted to utilize the yellow backup protocol now, keeping more, ha more cards in her deck, basically, uh, and using that uh, card instead to block. Yeah, it's just objectively correct in that scenario, I'm assuming, because that backup protocol is going to leave anyway. Definitely. And now Yuki is uh, just being forced to play out the mini force field and not crank it, but... 
that is going to help her uh, stay defensive at least for one more turn and hopefully she's praying that uh, Xing doesn't uh, have enough uh, offensiveness to force her to block again. Yuki Lee, definitely one item in hand in the form of a boom grenade, yellow. And funny enough, also Xing is sitting on a blue boom grenade, I believe. There's boom versus boom this turn. Xing also has an Evo Sentry Base head in hand, so a red. He's not going to be able to use that since he's already lost his Ooh, uh, base looks, equipment head. Uh, I think he might have. Are it three Evos? Two, it might be three Evos in hand for Xing Sang here. There's definitely two. I don't see the far left one. Uh, no, maybe an underloop. Underloop, well, yep, yep, yep. Which is pretty good. So, a techno level for two into an underloop. It's not the worst. The question is what he's going to do with those. Uh, like, is he incentivized to use. Is, he, he, is there a world where he plays the boom grenade here? I'm not sure. He's giving Yuki Lee a lot of room to maneuver on this next turn and potentially close out the game. Probably not the hand he was hoping to draw. I'm not sure if he's. If, if Shing Sang is back at pitch stack, I think Yuki Lee is quite close, if not there already. Yeah, so Yuki definitely is the one who is uh, running out of deck faster than uh, Shing is doing. So um, it's, if it goes to fatigue, then uh, Shing probably has the upper hand there. And I'm assuming we're just going to see that um, under loop come out. Yeah, so Yuki is sitting at two life, and uh, with that force field uh, being able to fully block uh, that under loop, it's an easy solution wow. there. And just like that, we're it's it's Yuki's game to lose, it looks like. I mean, she is in, absolutely in the driver's seat at this point. We do know that Shing Sang did pitch down um, one of those EVO upgrade cards in the heavy artillery yellow. I believe Shing Sang is probably on close to a 40-card deck, so I don't know how close we are. We just see him draw the mechanical strength, another EVO upgrade card payoff. So if he can weather the storm, might be in a good spot. But uh, that's going to be a lot of damage coming out here. Yeah, the lay waste being super effective against Teclovos, and you, can only, you can't defend this with equipment. So even if you have equipment in hand or equipment at your disposal, then you can't use those to block this one. Oh, is that the, is that the last red boom grenade in hand for Yuki? I believe so. It's just going to be a weapon for Shing Sang now firmly on the back foot. Probably now, the only way to win, most likely, is fatigue. I believe that's Shing's game plan at this point. And uh, if he has any cards left and that is his disposal, he's definitely going to come in with this Teclo lever over and over again. Uh, and uh, we've seen uh, Yuki counting the cards in her deck uh, several times at this point, so she's definitely concerned that uh, if she has the offensive power to go. Looks like Yuki Lee Bender might have another backup protocol red in the deck access to two which means you could recur that hydraulic press and get access to overpower once again penetration script in hand as well yeah and we see the penetration script in hand as well yuki is uh, gonna be forced to block all of the techno levers coming forward as he's only sitting on two hp and that quick fire is definitely gonna go oh, we do see a, a block card here for Xing Sang. And there's the boom grenade, it's cranked. With only three and a half minutes left on the clock, the uh, players really need to speed things up in order to be able to finish this game before uh, time runs out. Mm. But uh, Yuki, she's running really, really short on the cards and she has five cards left in deck at this point. I'm really trying to keep track of that red backup protocol to see if the hydraulic press is the win condition. I believe we only saw one. And we do see the a red heavy artillery in hand for Shing Sang. Not going to probably have the resources to cast that. Yeah. I'm a bit curious why Yuki opted in to play the boom grenade here. Because if she has the red backup protocol that you mentioned, then uh, she would definitely want to utilize uh, that. No, never mind. Uh, the hydraulic press is going to come in for six, so uh, that is just lethal. That is just lethal, straight up. And again, the techno lever is uh, small but deadly. Uh, 
forcing one card out of Yuki's hand every single turn, making her offensive power uh, much less scary to work with. And only two cards left in deck now. This is looking really shaky here. So at this point, we should have perfect information of what two cards are left in Yuki's deck. Yeah, she definitely knows what's uh, left at this point. I wouldn't be surprised. But she is contemplating this real hard, thinking what her outs are. Back her protocol, there it, it, it is. The second one of the match. And she's going to instantly use that. Going up to four there. It's going to crank it. Surely grabbing this hydraulic press. For sure. In order to get overpower. And try to close out the game. This is the third time this card is being cast. It's been so impactful every single time Yuki has yeah, cast Shuki it. Is shaking. There's a penetration script. The plus one. Progressing to our first 9 0 player. And there it is. Bump. Yuki wow, to take Yuki it down. pulling it through he on her last over... hand. Oh. Massive victory here for Yuki going undefeated 9 0 in the World Championship. What a match. Such a back and forth. Shing Sang pr presenting so much, so much pressure to Yuki there in the mid game, but Yuki just ultimately taking all of the tempo, putting, putting Shing, Yang, uh, Shing Sang on the back foot. And closing it out in perfect fashion. I know we were looking at the deck list and there was, there was a clear way to win and she pitch stacked it perfectly. And we saw it come to fruition. Definitely. It's super beautiful play by both these players. You really see the high-end uh, level of uh, play that you see coming through here with these uh, professional players doing their absolute best. And it's an absolute joy to follow these players along uh, for, for these joy rides, basically. And that's an amazing back and forth uh, throughout the whole game. And it felt like it was anyone's match at any point in time. Uh, super awesome play by both of them. I genuinely feel like Yuki's put on a clinic of Dash.io this week. And we, we had the pleasure of following her yesterday, but now seeing her play again, she seems to play this deck and understand this deck in a way that most of the community do does not. Because though she makes those matches look easy. I mean, there was a clear win condition, and it felt like Ching saying, "Wow, had such had such a powerful tech Lavasan deck, had that huge Evo like playing those huge Evo upgrade targets, Terminator tank, the Majestic, and then she just absolutely runs circles around it in the end game. Pitch pitch sacks the deck perfectly, plays hydraulic press three times." I mean, it's just absolutely crazy. Definitely. And I think uh, she did the absolute uh, best play there, pitch checking that red, boom, uh, red uh, backup protocol, as you mentioned, and coming back with that uh, hydraulic press. Absolute massive play. And uh, it was basically down to the last two cards in her deck. And that was the last final push that she had to make it through uh, in order to push over the edge there on the Tech Lovason. Yep, amazing game play. Well, Yuki progresses to our first 9-0 player and last undefeated player of the tournament. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with round 10 of the Flesh and Blood World Championships here in Barcelona. Don't go anywhere. I'm Marlena Merlia and this is William, Table and Legs. We run a Flesh and Blood's Ultimate Pit Fight in-person YouTube channel. And on behalf of everyone at the Table Pit, we'd like to wish everyone at Worlds 2023 good luck and have fun. I'm rooting for Mara Ferris from our local testing team to bring home another win for America. And I'm expecting Bravant to make a big impact at this world's UPF meta. Thanks for tuning in. Enjoy the rest of the coverage. Hello there! I hope everyone's enjoying the Flesh and Blood World Championship. I'm El Baramaglio from Fazendo de Regisse. You might not know me, but I'm a YouTuber from Brazil who regularly makes content about Flesh and Blood. I do... well, I'm kind of a noob, okay, and I'm a very casual player. So I mostly do gameplays and I talk about my experience joining the game and, and getting to know the community and the strategy and how this game is different from Magic the Gathering, which is what I used to play. Um, I really, really wish I could be there with you guys. Yeah, that's the, the, the event is shaping up to be incredible. But here I am, sitting back home, eating popcorn, watching the coverage, and rooting for Lucas Izumi. He's my favorite player. Lucas is... I play with him. He, he plays in the same LGS that I do. And every single time we've played together, he, he beat me very, very thoroughly. So I, ha I have to admit it might be a little bit selfish. But I kind of want him to win. Just so I can be like, oh yeah, yeah, he always beats me. But, you know, the guy's the world champion. He could beat anyone. <laughs> it's no, no water off my back, right? Um, 
last I've seen Lucas playing, he was playing with Kano, but that was Blitz, not constructed. And the the guy is is very dangerous doing the math in his head. Um, I'm not sure how well Kano is positioned in in the current meta, but whatever hero he's playing, Lucas Izumi is definitely my pick. Hope you guys enjoyed the tournament. And again, check out Fazendo Nerd DC on YouTube if you want to see what the hell I'm talking about. See ya. Hi, Lynette. Fabled here, Ruin Z. All the way from New Zealand, birthplace of flesh and blood. I'm here to um, wish people luck for their worlds. Um, look out for all the brilliant cosplayers. So I have a cosplay page. Oh, I have a YouTube page focusing on cosplay. Um, so I have a cosplayer of the month, which is, features a cosplayer from the flesh and blood world each month, and also a podcast called Shapeshifters of Wraith, where cosplayers talk about their life in flesh and blood. So. I would love everyone to get on and find that at Fabled Hero and Z on YouTube. But I want to put all my strength in behind every one of those cosplayers. I know it's hard work and you've been working really hard and I can't wait to see all your work. Um, look out for Essa from Germany and Diana from um, the US. They have something very special for people at this event. So look out for those two cosplayers. Ultimately, we're here for the game, and I would love for Azalea, praise V, to be our next world champion deck. But failing that, I would love to see Yuki Lee Bender win this year's Worlds. They are a brilliant all-rounder, and she has done the miles. I think that Limit is going to hold a very big part this year, so let's go. Worlds. This year, 2023, Yuki Lee Bender.
feeling a little worse for wear? Those old Cogworks legs not holding their weight? Do you find yourself asking to be or not to be? Well, why not be? Better. Bolder. Brilliant. Why not be a big deal? Break through your limitations and become all that you could be. With Techlo Industries, bringing you a future with bright lights.
Yeah. Back in the booth for the top. Uh, is it top? Is it like round 10 it, for the yeah, yeah, it is, it is last round of for the world, world championship in Barcelona, mm -hmm. Spain? Hey, thank you, Joey, this morning. I'm good. How are you? Yeah, perfect. I mean, this UK Lee Bender player, she's pretty impressive, right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> uh, that explosive that finish game, the yeah, game. yeah, we triple were hydraulic it on press. the sidelines. It mm -hmm. was very yeah. impressive. Definitely. And now she's up against yet another Teclo mm -hmm. Let's see whether she's able to get there again. I think one very important question that we'll need to see how it plays out is whether this Teclo Vossen has enough block cards. Because we saw how critical the hydraulic press was for Yuki in the previous game. She managed to get two boom grenades off of the hydraulic press and finally finish the game off with hydraulic yeah. press as well. And the only way to get over that, or to be able to block that as Teclo Vossen, is to have block cards. So let's see whether this Teclo Vossen has block cards in the deck so he doesn't explode to boom grenades. Yeah, and she manages to, ke to, to keep them till the very last second, the, the very last hand she had basically to finish up the mm -hmm. game. And she did it in a very, very impressive manner. So he have to be patient and use these block cards at the very last moment also. So maybe pitch them like as early as possible to see them during the last hands. It's going to be very interesting to see how he manages to approach, approach this game. We've seen the deck list, so it doesn't look like he has too many ways to, to lose the game at right, so it's going to be pre a pretty long game, I, I assume. Yeah, very likely. Teclo Vossen does like to make the game go pretty long. Also, as long as he has enough Evos, he's definitely favored if the game yeah. goes long enough. It is on Yuki to try and end the game before the weapon really comes online and before you can get you know, too much value from the weapon from going to go again into a two cost attack. Mm. Um, so we saw Yuki, you know, boost pretty aggressively in the previous game. Yeah. And, and I can totally expect that she's going to do the same thing in this game as well. But she had, we saw that she had several backup protocols, so she has oh, nice yeah. way to, to get this very important, like, aggressive, aggressive red. And I think she has a yellow one also, uh, yeah. and these, these very impressive uh, and aggressive cards. So there's always a way to, yeah, to, to reboot, to, to get these strong attacks later down the, down the line in the game. Yeah, those red backup protocols, very, very critical. It's how she managed to play the same hydraulic press three times over the course yeah. of the previous game. Uh, the first time just natural, next two times just backup protocols and bringing it back. She has one hydraulic press on the list, but that is really the strength of backup protocol, um, especially in a deck like Dash, because she's also getting two more points of value on the pistol mm -hmm. every time she plays it. It's not just uh, the item that you buy back from hydraulic press, it's plus two. Uh, on the pistol, yeah. you play the backup protocol off the top, it's an action point as well. So. It tends to get very expensive, yeah, but yeah. she manages to play it masterfully. And Alex Low, so he was, I think he lost versus the other Vietnamese player that we saw just before um, uh, against Yukili Bender. Um, so that's his only loss of the tournament so far. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the game was played close. It was a take over and mirror. I was watching it from the, from the sidelines and it was a very, very close and intense game. Yeah, we started the day with four 7-0s, and now we just yeah. left with one undefeated, and that is Yuki Lee Bender mm -hmm. carrying the torch with a single undefeated. Uh, getting the game here, it looks like Alex Lowe is starting yeah. off. Yep. With the Evo charging rods, playing it off the Teclovus ability, so but drawing a card, and now, I yep. guess at that point in the game, you just, yeah. Yeah, and critically. Try to, to push some damage, maybe she has, uh, like, too, too, ma too many items in hand and we some damage will leak. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And also critically, you take cards out of the opponent's mm -hmm. deck, right? Which is definitely something that Teclovasa wants to do. Um, it may not be the primary game plan to fatigue, especially against a good dash deck like Yuki's. Uh, but it's always something you want to work towards just in case it might accidentally happen that mm -hmm. you fatigue your opponent out. So going first, getting the evil off, very, very critical, turns on the weapon. The weapon's now, you know, he's allowed to use it. And taking two cards away from Yuki's deck. Very, very mm -hmm. strong start for Alex Lowe here. We saw that he didn't really worry about having an arsenal. How relevant is that in that matchup and in this, in this format? So that's an act actually a very heads-up play because sometimes what can happen in, uh, in Bright Lights Draft is that you get to the end of a deck and you have no cards remaining and you just need that one final card to block to you know, not lose. And so if you arsenal a card at the start of the game, but then you're forced to block out for the rest of the game, mm -hmm. you're really sad that you can't block the arsenal card because you already put it in. Yeah. So that's a very heads up play from Alex saying, you know, just in case, it's unlikely to happen, but if it gets to the end game mm -hmm. stage where I just need to block with every single card in my deck, I don't want a card in my arsenal because obviously I can't block with a card that's an arsenal. Makes sense. So that's a lay waste. 
So really, oh, I also want to point out Alex Lowe's equipment suite. So he has none of the oh. drafted equipment mm -hmm. uh, equipment pieces, and that's actually really good for Teclo Vossen, <laughs> which is very, very ironic when you think about previous draft formats. Only equipment's very highly picked. Mm -hmm. When this draft format, when you, especially playing like Teclo Vossen, if you have an extra like Teclo base piece, that's one fewer three block that's in your main deck, and that's very, very important um, in this sort of draft format. So you know, you see. If you see a Teclo Vossen with four proto bases, it you're probably saying, means that his deck is very good. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> He's got 42 three blocks potentially. Yeah. Of course, you can only run 40 in your main deck, but mm -hmm. you, you get what I'm saying. So Alex Lowe took the five from the lay waste, and then Yuki follows up with the red backup protocol. Oh, this can be quite, as, quite scary. We've seen what Yuki can do with the yeah. red backup protocols. Uh, and a very she, nice thing. Yep, go on. She cranked it, so she's probably, she, she wants to use it now. Likely she wants to use it now. It could also be a pistol shot, and then she, you know, <laughs> uses the backup protocol uh -huh. on the next turn, uh, on the opponent's turn. So oh, yeah. one very nice thing about backup protocol is that it is an instant, so you can just crack it on your opponent's turn if you want to, and if you have one floating because you pitch a blue, you can play an item off the top. Okay. It looks like she's and not if you don't have that. a very yeah. good blocking hand, you can get a block, which is what he, she did at the, in the previous round, by the way. Exactly. Yeah. So it looks like she's just opting to crack the backup protocol right now and put a red uh, attack in her arsenal. I think it was a lay waste that she grabbed. Yeah. So, banish, uh, discarding a card from, behind, from underneath the EVO charging rods for that action point. Uh, for the quicken token. Oh, the quicken token, my bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Alex is looking to be quite aggressive. He took all the damage from Yuki. Yeah. On, yeah, which is... I mean, when we looked at the deck list, honestly, it looked like an, a pretty an aggressive like Teclovosen deck. It doesn't look like it was the, <laughs> the kind of deck that likes to sit around and wait for the, for the game to go as long as possible. So he's attacking for, with this infused titanium. Yeah, if, if Alex Lowe has constructed a double, like a, a two card seven into another two card seven, yeah. another two card six, this is a very, it's very a strong play to strong make. Term, yeah. Exactly. He, so he took a bit of an aggressive line uh, to you know, make this play, but you know, eventually, if, it may seem like if you're trying to fatigue your opponent, you just want to block them out, but that's not actually true. You, you kind of need to fatigue by damage to some yeah. extent. You need to force cards force out them of your opponent. Force to use cards out of their hands exactly. during your turn. And cards like Infused Titanium, which only block two, they're really much better served oh. if you can just attack for seven. Yeah, that's exactly what Alex Lowe is the doing. Junkyard Dog, yeah, seven into seven, so that 14 damage <laughs> on oh. this turn. Yeah, I really just want to commend Alex Lowe's play there. He actually didn't have an item in her graveyard to scrap to the Junkyard Dog to give it plus one. Popping, using the Evo Charging Rods, uh, to is get what the proto base in them. Yes, is exactly what put the proto base in the graveyard so mm -hmm. that the Junkyard Dog can scrap it and get the plus one. He's not getting the other value of scrap that Teclo can potentially get where you banish an Evo and you can play it from there, but he's getting a plus one on the dog here. This is a four card 14, which is absolutely nuts value when it comes to Bright Lights mm. Limited. Uh, I think Yuki Ali agrees with you. It's a very nice play and she's like, yes, <laughs> yes. Well, now I need to find a way to block this efficiently and it doesn't look like her hand does it. Exactly. So one of the pitfalls of Dash, so something Yuki needs to be cogn cognizant of is that you know, she might eventually get fatigued. So she's under pressure to set up big turns. We saw her do that in the previous round with the boom mm -hmm. grenades into the backup protocols and things like that. So if Alex Lowe manages to leak a bunch of damage now, Later on, when Yuki does a setup turn, she can get punished because if Alex says, here's another seven, mm -hmm. you have to give me cards. You can't just keep your whole hand to, you know, make use of your setup. Uh, he's set himself up for some, uh, a really, really good late game over here. She took it all, so she's down to seven now, attacking with the layways she got from the backup protocol on the previous round, uh, the previous turn. Boosted, so now she has to present as, um, as much damage as possible, basically, so that's what... Alex Lowe tried to do on the previous turn, turn into nothing. Yeah, but here's kind of where Alex Lowe can sort of pivot into I might fatigue you out yeah. and uh, to sort of force Yuki to do some setup turns and then punish her because she's already just at seven. Mm -hmm. um, so let, let's see what Yuki's able to do. I think I see a dissolving shield in her hand. So that's one of the things that can insulate her a little uh, if Alex tries to punish her for setting up because, you know, that's you know, just an item she can set up yeah, to just prevent some damage. Let her set up a bit more, um, and she has like a blocking card on the field, uh, uh, mm -hmm. effectively, along with a two block on her armor. This looks like like it's what she's doing. She didn't crank the dissolving shield. Yep. Yeah. Looks so like she's up to arsenal. arsenal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Getting a a token on that on that symbiosis shot. Yep. 
And Alex and look at that. It looks hand. like everybody's backing Dash for this round. Everybody is on Yuki's side. <laughs> She's the fan favorite, yeah. you know? I Yuki mean, how amazing would it be if she went to 10 0? If you went to 10 0, you just basically need to win another game to be locked into top 8. So we're playing 14 rounds. Yes. Yeah. If, you're, if you're 11 0, you are uh, almost guaranteed to. I, I'm pretty sure it's guaranteed, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not a judge. I don't really know mm -hmm. where the numbers yeah. are, but I'm pretty sure it's guaranteed because if you're 11 0, it's only three more rounds for yeah. you to lose. I'm pretty sure X3s, some X3s yeah. get in. Especially if, so. that's, uh, if, the, if you've won the first 10 rounds. So yeah, yeah the first step is just be winning this one, Yuki. So Alex Lowe starting the turn with a red 060 boosting here, which is. Pretty rare because, you know, uh, card economy wise, mm -hmm. uh, boosting these uh, zero for threes isn't very good because mm -hmm. you lost two cards in deck and Yuki just need to spend, need to spend one card in deck to block it out. So you're down one card card economy wise, but Alex Lowe has recognized that in this matchup, card economy isn't that relevant. He needs to put the pressure on, he needs to not get blown out by Yuki's boom grenades and he needs to punish her for having these, um, these uh, non-block cards in her deck. So he's saying, it's okay, I can aggressively boost, I can lose a little on the, on the card economy wise. My late, uh, as long as it's keep you off big hands and keep you off setup turns, um, I'll get there. Okay, so the second backup protocol for Yuki, she cranked it, so she's, she's going to use it this turn. Yeah, and oh. I believe this is the second backup protocol. I mean, uh, as, um, this is her last backup protocol. Yeah. Um, I think in the previous round, we only saw two. Mm -hmm. Maybe there was another one uh, lying around, but we saw her use two to get back hydraulic press of the previous game. This time, she doesn't quite have hydraulic presses in the graveyard yet. Uh, she's gonna lay waste again. Again, lay waste. Yeah, I think she's played the lay waste every single turn this game. <laughs> yeah, uh, which is you know quite significantly less powerful than yeah. the hydraulic press, and it just goes to show the sort of pressure that Alex Lowe is putting on her. He's saying, no, no, no. I know you have backup protocols in your list. Yeah. Uh, I know you have a hydraulic press. You have scary end games. <laughs> um, I don't want to let you get there. So she's forced to use these uh, backup protocols on you know just lay waste, which is something Alex Lowe is pretty happy to block, I imagine. Yeah, especially because he doesn't even have equipment to block with. So he's like, yeah, well, I'm not blocking anyway with my... Uh, mm -hmm. I don't have e equipment. I don't have any EVOs online. So I'm just blocking with the... Yeah, just, just the EVO charging <laughs> prospect. Yeah. Which, you know, they block two and eventually he can just at use a block point, two on a yeah. pistol or something at the end, you know. Taking for two with the symbiosis shot. Uh, look, gotta love those tokens they have prepared, the boosted tokens, mm -hmm. the crank and the overpowers. I'm a big fan yeah, of those tokens. Yeah, they, they look very cool. Yeah. And the thing is, at this point in the game, I mean, Alex hasn't seen a single boom grenade, so you have to think about it, right? Yes, definitely. You have to, to know that the, the, at least one of them is coming soon, so how do you approach this? I, we see that he was very, I mean, he, he didn't look worried about it, he didn't even overblock that... Yes. Play waste, so. so so you can't consistently respect it, right? Because you'll just start bleeding value if you're always yeah. overblocking. But what things. I mean and is that he hasn't respected it ever in this game. <laughs> yes. He leaked damage. I mean, you can leak damage every single turn yes. because he didn't block if, all the all the attacks. Yeah, he's he's been getting pretty fortunate on that front, but he does have the live total uh, to you know not mm -hmm. die to a boom grenade as well. And I do want to shout oh, out uh, his dogs. play the previous turn. Very very heads up play by him blocking with the evil zip line. Now evil zip line blocks for zero. Yeah. So. He He's, blocked anyway. He, yeah, he <laughs> blocked anyway just to put in the graveyard so to that boost. he can scrap it. Uh, yeah, and, to and boost now, the junkyard dog. Exactly. And now wow. with the Evo zipline the banish zone and Teclo being able to play it, he can actually just... Oh no, he can't play it now because he doesn't have a base legs equipped. Mm -hmm. So that's actually just gone. He just used it to get a plus one on a junkyard dog. Yep. Uh, but yeah, very heads up play by him. You're just getting it out of his hand, blocking. So, but that is one of those sort of pitfalls of Teclo sometimes when you have too many Evos in the same slot. And especially if some of them block zero, if you find your two block one first, now the zero block one is actually is kind of a dead card. That was a card that from his hand that translated to just plus one value uh, on that hand in the form of his junkyard dog. So actually pretty inefficient turn from Alex Lothar. Still managed to take one card and two pieces of equipment from Yuki. So she's basically without any other block than her hand from now on which is very relevant. We saw yesterday that she had three pieces of equipment to, to block with, so that's the blade break ones. But yeah, it's now she has to, if she has a very bad blocking hand, she can be stuck. So this is yep. what happened basically, because she had two boom grenades yep. in the hand. She played one, pitched one, attacking with the razzle dazzle. Yeah, How cool is the art on that card, by the way? It is Look very, at this very guy. cool. I want to <laughs> play that guy. <laughs> uh, and when is it getting released? 
<laughs> that hero that McCoy yeah, hero. Yeah, I want to <laughs> see that hero now. So Yuki did boost this, representing potentially a pistol shot or something from her hand. Very, very likely something from her hand. But yeah, Yuki definitely not feeling too good now. Bo seeing two boom grenades in the same hand, you know, that's yeah. not what you where you want to be. You you want to be seeing them on top of your deck and, <laughs> and, and drawing a boom card. To play it, yeah, yeah, a bit more unexpectedly. So this, at least at minimum, takes two cards uh, from Alex Law, or one card and the Evo Charging Rods. He's unlikely to give up the Evo Charging Rods at this point, because that will turn off his weapon. So unless he's got one of those four block block cards, uh, looks like this will be two cards that he'll have to give up uh, because of the threat of the boom grenade. Oh, but oh. He's, yeah, he's proving you wrong. It looks like he wants to block with it. <laughs> Maybe it's not valuing his... Yeah, his weapon looks like it. <laughs> uh, definitely quite the cost of yeah, happening. Yeah, because it turns <laughs> it off now. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, with Yuki at five, if he has a couple of those big attacks, as we see that he already has, mm -hmm. he does have the arsenal. So if he's able to go to his turn with a four-card hand and, say, play two big boost cards, like, say, a red big Bertha uh, into just another uh, two-card seven, uh, he could force Yuki into a blocking position where he doesn't even need the weapon anymore. Or, you know, he'll say, I'll find the evil later on. The weapon can, can come back mm -hmm. on later. For now, I just need to put pressure on you. Mm -hmm. And who knows? You know, sometimes you might just win the game off the back of Dash not drawing uh, enough block cards. So if he goes six into six, as we saw him, you know, we Sometimes saw him seven, seven. Yeah, she's yeah. only down to five. So, she, exactly. yeah, she, it's a very dangerous and precarious situation for Yuki Lee Bender. Mm. So at that point, when you've seen two boom grenades, one on the f on the on the on the field, one in the in the pitch zone, are you comfortable like not blocking everything? Do you feel like that that's there's no way that there's one on top of the deck now? Yeah. So I think in terms of getting blown up by a boom grenade, that's probably a pretty low probability. Mm -hmm. But we do have to worry about overpower as well. Yeah. That's the other risk of going too low, uh, especially in a deck that you know that you probably know at this point has the red hydraulic press. So this pistol shot will put him down to five. He still wouldn't be in the overpower range, but once he gets to three, unless he has that block card, you know, that is not just boom grenades, like overpower cards are also threatening his life there. So he's taking a bit of a gamble with this line. Let's see what that pays off for him. I'm very excited to see one, one of these more aggressive tech lovers and decks, you know, that don't sit around blocking all the time mm -hmm. and just try to do something and force their opponents to to get fatigued by blocking so she has uh, it looks like she has at least she's one blocking cards yeah. just one item yeah yes that's what it looks like uh, and i completely agree with you like seeing aggressive tackle of austin's is is really really cool yeah. it, it trump just throws away the paradigm that we mm -hmm. sort of gotten used to where oh, so that's an odd pace yeah can't block one. with yeah. equipment but she obviously doesn't have any equipment anymore unless she has an evo in hand she won't be able to block with that but you mm -hmm. know uh we, we we know she doesn't have any evo so Alex Lowe definitely opting for these very, very aggressive lines, like boosting with a the yellow card. again, yeah. Uh, is not oh, typical. Or bang. Uh-huh. Making go to one. So and he might. So now he can attack if he has... Yeah, that he, turns the weapon right back on. Mm -hmm. Or a yellow. He can attack with the weapon, yeah. Boosting with yellow cards is definitely something you don't see often in this format because, you know, they are pretty... Card and efficient, especially when it's like the two two attack ones or three attack ones, like this outpace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the same thing as we spoke about earlier, where you're losing two cards in your deck uh, and only taking one card from your opponent. Uh, in terms of deck size wise. Oh yeah, but yeah, when you keep this, it gives plus one to one of the attacks, so that yeah, it gives plus one to the outpace. Yeah, so once again, though, even on the previous turn cycle, we saw Alex Lowe only able to convert one of his cards to plus one. Mm -hmm. That was the uh, the Evo zip line he converted to plus one by scrapping with a junkyard dog. In this case, the Evo Whizbang as well only converted to one damage, like one card in hand for one damage. That is not a very, very efficient rate. Mm, yeah. And is kind of has what pulled this game back uh, for Yuki Lee Bender here because, you know, it started off Alex O was very far ahead with a seven into seven, uh, but just a couple of turns of having cards that only came in for one point of value. Mm. Now Yuki's even up the life totals and she has the tempo. Not as aggressive as what we expected indeed. So now that's a dumpster dive attacking for four, not, not boosting an equipment. So that's a four going in. Oh, using the red firewall for, to, to fully block that one. Yes, which, is, which could be a bit risky. We've spoken about how these block cards are very, very premium to stop over. One of the previous turns. So basically yeah. that's two of these very important block cards not in his hand anytime soon. Yeah, and it looks like Yuki not, doesn't have the overpower this time. At least not representing it. So... That's uh, that's both fortunate and unfortunate for Alex. So, you know, he 
sort of got rewarded by using his fall block mm -hmm. on the four attack thing. But at the same time, these block cards, you can't really arsenal them. You can't really hold them in hand forever. So you sort of just need to hope you open o your opponent overpowers the, mm -hmm. the turn you draw them. Because uh, otherwise, you either force to use it or force to pitch it away. I and think he has the chest, the, the evil, evil chest. Yeah. That's so, it. so. Yeah. Getting a resource off the evil buzz hive, and now with two evos, the gun just mm -hmm. costs one yeah. resource, but doesn't have go again. So, we would like to see him start with something else first. He has to start. Oh, nice! Oh. So, yeah, so the liquid cooled mayhem Li here yeah, only costs yeah, him two, it, it only costing two. So, he'll he won't be able to have another attack, but five is enough to force your kid to do something. She has to block it with at least one card if she doesn't want to die, she's down to four. Yes, definitely. But with Alex low at three, this is the critical life total we talked about, Roman. That three, that six damage overpower hydraulic yep. press that we haven't seen yet, but we know is in Yuki's deck. Unless Alex low draws a block card, he could just die to the hydraulic mm -hmm. press. This is actually quite a scary position for Alex low to be in. Okay, so she blocks with the big Bertha. She get pretty low if she only blocks for three yeah so that's down to two so, so she definitely has, uh, has something up her sleeve yeah so, so let's see what she has a hydraulic press um i don't i don't believe we've seen is a pitch it the or no, we haven't uh, seen it yet yeah. so that's a crankshaft so is that, that another she, I think oh she's using off the top no that's oh, the mini boss boss field. Field. okay so it's so she's deciding whether she wants to crank it and it looks like she has can't really tell. Uh, I, I see a yellow boom grenade in her hand. I can't yeah. tell what the other card is. Looks like doesn't have the hydraulic press yet. But at the same time, this mini force field just buys her a little more time to find that card. Because we can reasonably expect that that's kind of the win condition that she's expecting mm -hmm. with her opponent, especially at three. But she's cranking it. So she gets one action point. Yeah. Yep. So she's up to two. So likely maybe doesn't have a boost card and she still wants to swing the weapon yeah. this turn. So you can, you know, play a At big non-boost card like a junkyard mm -hmm. dog or something and then come with a weapon afterwards. Or play a boom grenade and not have to crank that. That's also very, very effective. Oh, the under loop is very relevant. Yeah, so it looks like she did crank the boom grenade. Uh, saying that potentially has a zero cost uh, a zero cost attack in arsenal representing that she will be threatening the boom grenade further on uh doesn't really care for keeping around the following mm -hmm. turn okay and alex will down at one shot he's getting very low so yeah, yeah. and yuki is set up he, very he well has two cards in hand now and yuki set up very well to defend with his mini force field on the field here that's three damage prevention she has a hundred percent uh so you know she's effectively at five over here let's see whether alex is able to get through with that's a lay waste. waste. So that's three da damage prevention on the field already for Yuki. She just needs to block with one card and she's safe yeah, on this. I mean, she's pretty, pretty well equipped for that last turn. And she, if she can find the... Oh, I think we see the hydro hydraulic press. I yeah, think there's a that's blue? That's, yeah. That could be a blue one, no, but the opponent's at one. Um, I'm, I might be seeing... It looks red. It looks red to you? Know. Okay. Yeah, it looks red to me. But okay, cool. Well, in any case, blue or red, the opponent's at one, you know, uh -huh. it's, uh, <laughs> it's going to be lethal either way, unless Alex will finds a block yeah. card, and it looks like that uh, mini force field okay, just stopping so the, the pistol shot, the gun shot there. Yeah. So let's see the color of the hydraulic She looks anxious about playing it, yeah. <laughs> uh, is there a block card in Alex Lowe's hand? We saw him pitch that firewall, as you, yeah, as you pointed out. Yeah, it was a yellow firewall that we saw earlier. Yeah, we're definitely not up to it. Okay, that That's is a red hydraulic press. One, yeah. And it's coming for six. If he doesn't have the block card, this is just game over. I don't think he does. Is Alex it looking game? at his hand. It is game. Yeah. I think so. He's no. checking all his cards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they block? No, they don't. He's <laughs> block written in the, in, the, in the bottom of the card. No. No yeah. block. So and that's it. Yukili Bender goes to 10. Oh, only one <laughs> more win to lock this top eight. Look, not even a smile. <laughs> She's yeah. locked in. She's stone cold oh, killing yeah. her whole competition over here. I mean, oh we just have to give massive props to Yuki over here. Both days drafting Dash database coming out 3-0 in a meta, in a draft uh, meta that people thought the only answer was we force Techlo every yeah. time. 
both times you see Yuki Libenda just not even dash. wider, but like Teclos, yeah, exactly. And in this rough out as well, there were three dashes. It's not like she was the one of two dash or the one of only dash, there were three other dashes. Yeah. And she's just showing us what you need to prioritize when you're playing dash, how you beat those Teclos that want to block you out. It's been an absolutely superb masterclass play by Yuki. Would you say it's the most challenging deck to play? to pilot and to draft in this format, in this Bright Lights format, Dash, Dash Ooh, IO? Uh, I don't know about most challenging. I do think that all the heroes are actually pretty challenging to, mm -hmm. to really ascertain like what, is, what mm -hmm. is good, what you actually really want. But I think in terms of exploration, in terms of what the community has explored the most, it seems like Dash is perhaps one of the less, the more underexplored heroes. I don't know about more challenging, but she just seemed to be less explored, but Yuki here just showing us she has explored it yeah. and she knows what she wants yeah. in her Dash database deck. It looks like it's a puzzle. Every single game you play and you have to have like perfect sequencing and like make sure that everything is going to flow together, but the cards don't come in the, in the, in the, the order that you want. So sometimes yep. it, it feels like it's, to me at least, well, like not at the same level <laughs> as Yuki Libenda <laughs> by far. It looks like a very deep puzzle that you have to solve every single game. And you know, we know that card games and especially Flesh and Blood is already a puzzle. So it makes it all that much impressive when you see someone like Yuki Libenda like masterfully put together turns like that, turn after turn. I definitely agree. And that was a game where we didn't even see any boom grenade go off. No, and remember the no previous game we saw two boom grenades go yeah. off. This time she was like, no, didn't even need it. Just the one overpower at the end to finish the game. Okay, so we will have an interview with y Yukili Bender, I assume. She's 10-0 now. She'll be right back with Flake. Don't leave. Uh, we'll be right back. By now, it's familiar territory. <laughs> I've got Yuki Lee Bender. Good friend, Canadian. This is it. We're just owning the broadcast now, Yuki. <laughs> Do you want to ask me anything at this point? You're just like, this is your third time. By the way, last time that you were you won, they're like, bring Yuki in for an interview. I'm like, no, I think we're good. Like, I think we've <laughs> spoken too much. So, uh, yeah, go for it. What do you want to, you have anything to ask me? What's your favorite hero in Bright Lights Draft? <laughs> What's my favorite hero in Bright Lights Draft? We don't want to talk about my uh, Bright Lights Draft. <laughs> there are like tweets going around from Brendan Patrick about how absolutely abysmal I am at that format. Oh no! <laughs> no, it's terrible. Uh, yeah, it, there was there was a there's a circulating photo of just how absolutely punchless I am. But let's talk about your performance here. Still perfect uh, in this format. Sorry, in this tournament, ten and zero. Yeah. Up to now, and the most. In intriguing aspect of this is that uh, as you walk past the curtain in here, Brian pulls you aside and just says, I, I'm the, thank you for showing what Dash IO can do, that it's, it's uh, you know, such a fascinating hero. What was your initial impression when you're looking at and start diving into Bright Lights? Was, is Dash IO something that you've always thought had the highest ceiling, that had the highest potential, or was this just a, a means of saying, I don't think a lot of people are going to be drafting it. I should get good at this hero. Um, yeah, we were pretty much always high on it um, on, on the podcast, on the bubble. We were talking about Boom Grenade with four power boost cards and overpower 
from, I think, our set primer, or at least our, after we had played pre-release once, we were certainly on it. I think from the set primer, though, we were just saying, like, fundamentally, if you spend one resource, play a boom grenade, get an action point and a counter, you're getting, like, six damage for a resource. And it's just absurd. And, of course, you don't do that all the time. But Dash's hero ability is just so powerful that when you get items off the top, you just kind of bury your opponents in value. And you have so many ways to kind of systematically work through the game because you always have full information of what you're boosting. You don't accidentally boost your hydraulic press or whatever your key card is for your win condition. And that kind of reliability and, again, the fact that you are just chaining, like, even from yesterday, just those boom grenades off the top, the, the fascinating way that you set up that, that kill shot. You needed an item in the discard, throw the boom grenade out there, crank it, get it into the graveyard, make it happen. That was awesome to see. Mm -hmm. But now we're shifting gears. Now we're going back to CC. Now we're going back to Icelander. How quickly, or how difficult is it rather, to just quickly shift gears from not just limited format, but a completely different hero, a completely different class, a completely different mindset? Um, are, do you, are there any similarities that you can draw from playing Dash IO to playing Icelander? You know, there's, it, they're so different, but like, how do, you, how do you bridge that gap to go from playing limited, playing yeah. Mechanologist to Icelander? Yeah, it's going to be a bit of adjustment for sure. Um, luckily, I've played quite a bit of Icelander, so I feel pretty confident on that hero, and hopefully I'll feel right at home. Um, I usually like to just take things kind of like play by play, moment by moment, and not really think too much about the big picture. So just like every time I'm just going, these are the plays I'm going to make to finish this turn, we'll get to the next turn. And I think I'm going to really, especially changing formats, like you said, try and do that just to reset and be like, we're not playing Bright Lights, we're playing Icelander. How do I make the best play possible here to try and win the game? Yeah, I mean, talking to some of the players that dropped out of the tournament, and they said, well, I'm just going to focus on tomorrow's calling, which is sealed, mm -hmm. and they don't have to shift gears. There's no you know, switches and dials that have to change in their mind. They're just going to be going through the whole way. Is this dual format type of, of event, like Worlds, Limited, CC, how much, how much harder is it to, to prepare for these rather than just going for a single format system? It's definitely more to practice because you have to learn two formats. But um, for me personally, I just I love draft. I've always loved draft, and um, I draft all the time with my locals at Armory, and we actually have like very high level Armory draft. They they take games off of me all the time. Like a bunch of them beat me all the time, and they they do the exact same things that you saw me doing. They do that to me. So some of it's like some of it's literally I learn this from my locals. So yeah, I mean, I love draft and I always feel pretty prepared and I'm lucky to have that scene. I know for some people it's harder to prep and I, I can empathize that, you know, getting drafts together is not easy. So who are these locals? Because you have been dummying the field all day long, all, day, all yesterday. Who are these locals that, you're, that you just can't beat? Um, well, in this format, uh, Lucas Ng is, um, I, think he, I think he lost his win and in for nationals and he like top aided a PTI event. He was he had a deep run, I think, at the calling in Vegas as well. Like he's, I think he's a player to look out for. Um, he's beat me three times in Dash. Um, once in Swiss of our PQ, once in finals of our PQ, and then once in top eight of a PTI event. All in draft, all in Dash. <laughs> so I can't beat him. And and Jay is also very good, my podcast co-host. You've been putting on a clinic here in not just CC, obviously, but for for two straight days now, six rounds of uh, Bright Lights Limited, Bright Lights Draft. You're on the Bobble podcast. Again, if you guys want this kind of level of, of gameplay and insight, you guys have to check it out. Absolutely. Go check out the On the Bobble podcast for sure. And just as a little taste of what kind of insight and information that you get from that podcast, let's give, I'm going to ask you a question sure. regarding this. What's one card that a Dash IO player might overlook that you would value high, higher than most other Dash IO drafters? I think maybe Steam Canister. That card is very, very sneakily good. Being able to manipulate Steam Counters on your items is super, super powerful. I think people kind of understand that overpower, boom grenades, four power boost cards are really good. Like that, That's kind of the basics. And then I think it's like some of the sneaky items, the Steam Canisters are good. Um, the, the equipment is really good. The, the defensive items and the equipment's really good. You need, you need the life total to keep your hand when you have it, and you need... Uh, sometimes you draw a bunch of items, and having that buffer really, really helps because you have 18 life, you're pretty fragile, and if you don't draft equipment, you don't draft defensive items, you can really beat Glass Cannon, but I think when you get those defensive pieces and the Steam Canister to kind of let you move your setup turns, 
you become really, really flexible. Love to hear it. Last question. Favorite part of Barcelona so far? I mean, I think it has to be Worlds. I've, I spent most of the week when I got here being jet lagged and then having food poisoning. And then, oh, yeah. Um, well, actually, the Sagrada Familia was great, too. We did that, and that was wonderful. I love that. But, but yeah, it's mostly been, uh, mostly been Worlds. It's been a bit of a rough week up until, up until now, and now it's going great. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like I, I feel horrible for everybody who has ever had to make it to North America for the major tournaments. I, I'm the same way. I, catching up on all this jet lag and everything has been, it's just been riding this wave of adrenaline. And again, just four more rounds to go. And then, hey, who knows what happens tomorrow. Yuki Lee Bender of Canada, 2021 national champion. Perfect record, 10 and 0 here on day two. We are done with Bright Lights Draft. It is time for Classic Constructed. Don't go too far. We've got more of the World Championships here in Barcelona. Stay tuned.
Back in Barcelona for the World Championship. This is round 11. I'm not called Roman Nicolas. I'm called Roman Nicolas, but that's okay. It's going to be fixed very soon. <laughs> and it's the first CC round of the day, guys. Pretty exciting. I know what matchup we're going to get, so we're going to talk about it a little mm -hmm. bit later. I think we're going to see, uh, take a look at the standings for now. Um, see who, uh, who are the top heroes for this for this tournament. Look at those those Icelanders in the in the top of the standings. Yeah, and my friend, I know that you don't want to see that because you're afraid that Icelanders <laughs> is going to go to Living Legend if she wins. Yeah, I really do want a Living Legend this weekend if possible. But to be honest, if you look at the full top 24, you know, if you look at the top 80, like there's three out of eight Icelanders there. Yeah. You look at full top 24, there's only one other Icelander there. Yeah. So, you know, there's and some not hope. necessarily some very hope. good matchups <laughs> for Icelanders also. If you look at that Reinar, if you look at, at this Azalea also, it's not very, very easy to win. There's a couple of Dromais also. Definitely. And the OG dashes. I think out of this 24 that we see, the OG dashes are probably Icelanders' worst matchups mm -hmm. over here. So, you can imagine the top three Icelanders there, Yuki, uh, uh, Shing and Chu Heng probably don't want to face the OG dashes. Mm, you, yeah. you imagine if you're bringing Ice under the tournament like this, where the discourse was that Droma is the best deck. You imagine that they have really good Droma plans, mm -hmm. and you know it's clearly been working out for them. But do they have a good OG dash plan? Now that's something I imagine not many people prepared too much about. The discourse coming in was definitely Droma, Bravo, and Icelanders. So mm -hmm. you know, those dashes might pose a problem for those Icelanders. What about this dash IO? Is that a good matchup for Icelander? Ooh, so the way I like to describe mm -hmm. the way I like to describe aggro matchups into Icelander is that they are they are Icelander favored, but they are fragile because the aggro deck is going to constantly ask you questions. And if you have one turn where you didn't where you don't have the enough disruption, you don't have the key piece of disruption that you need, you can just implode. It was it was that way with Briar, right? You know, you're favored most of the time, but they get one Channel mm -hmm. turn off and you didn't have the disruption for that turn, you just die. Yeah. So that's similar for Dash IO. However, Dash IO has better tools than some of the other aggro decks that we've seen before, like the Ninjas or the Briars, particularly Teclocore. Teclocore is a very, very strong uh, item that Dash mm -hmm. IO has access to. She can even tutor it up with Spark of Genius, which is very good into Icelander. Also, Dash IO is quite insulated from Blizzard. Yeah, because of the action points as she can get at will. Exactly, because of items being cranked off the top and also the boots. Uh, the Achilles Accelerator, yeah. if you try and like shut her down because there's a boom grin on the field she, with a blizzard, she can just pop the boots and say, no, you have to block breakpoints. And Ice and I hate blocking breakpoints. She is so bad mm -hmm. at it. Yeah, very, it's going to be very interesting to see uh, what's going to what's going to happen to these Icelander players. And then if we, if we look a little bit down uh, the rankings, there's still Olevia in contention. So that's pretty good. Mikhail, Mikhailovsky from Poland. And then look at that, there's some faces, some hero faces that we don't see all the time, like Dorinthia mm -hmm. at 8 points, Yuto Suzuki from Japan. And I can tell you guys already, that's one of the matchups that we're going to see next. I'm so that's so going to be Yuto Suzuki from Japan with Dorinthia versus Pudding Tam on Katsu. The OG heroes <laughs> from Welcome to Wraith, batting up for the for this top for the for this round eleven. Very cool to watch. It's been a long time since I've like done the commentary on the, one of these games. It's going to be very very exciting. I I can't wait to see the matchup. Just the classic Welcome to Wraith matchup, as yeah. you said. You know, going back to our roots, going back to just good clean. Combat <laughs> chain gameplay. You know, none of these dragons, none of these like wizard yeah, stuff going just around. Just fair flesh and blood. Yeah, the way James White intended it to be played. You know? <laughs> exactly. And they're both doing so well here at eight points each. That's just, you know, they're all in the X2 bracket here. So very much live for top eight. It's going to be great to see, uh, you know, potentially a Dorinthia or Katsu, even the Azalea, the Levia, as you pointed mm -hmm. out, uh, all in contention for top eight. And I want to just take a, a, a last look at the, the, look at the 24 uh, Dagon White <laughs> from the US playing Bravo. So we know some of these guys in the, in the Wolfpack team, they pick Bravo, like Michael Feng, Michael Hamilton. It didn't go very well for them. I don't know if they won like, too many uh, draft rounds or if their, their Bravo pick was the bad, what the, the bad one. Do you think it has to do something with, the, with that Bravo pick? 
I the think fact that we don't uh, see any of these yeah. very famous names at the top of the rankings. I think to some extent you have to put it on the Bravo pick just a little, uh, <laughs> just because I mean at the you know Bravo is the second most represented deck, uh, no third most represented yeah. deck yesterday. However, zero of them were in the 4-0 bracket mm -hmm. after CC rounds. Which means every single Bravo dropped at least one game in the it CC means rounds. Mm -hmm. In the CC rounds last yesterday, and you know when you have amazing players like Michael Hamilton, Michael Thorn on it. You have to wonder what happened there. I mean, at the same time, you know, the fact that those best players are on Bravo also tells you the strength of the deck. Uh, but, you know, the results at the end of the day, we've seen this before, Roman. Tons of Bravos show up and the conversion rate just isn't yeah, quite it's there. Not quite yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But Dagan so, White holding the flag up for Bravo. Yeah. So maybe oh, we're going to see like a little bit down in the rankings, that's Matteo Favretto that we watched yesterday. He's very impressive combo bolting deck. Mm -hmm. He had a tough time in the draft section or, or today. I think he lost two games, but uh, still very much in contention if he manages to do what he did yesterday, which means like basically not lose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, just maybe if he can get 4-0, but he has to dodge all the all the Icelanders that we see on this page also. Definitely. And then Brody Spurlock, another big name on Dash IO. Speaking uh, of it big looks names, like, yeah. yeah, but it looks like his draft portion today wasn't going very well. Yeah, he started the day of today X1, uh, which means he picked up two more losses today in his yeah. draft, which is... Um, you know, pretty unfortunate for him. I managed to take a look at this draft deck. He had a pretty solid max deck uh, yep. with uh, quite a few pumps in it. So a little unfortunate to see him uh, drop two games today. Let's see if he's able to make that up in his CC rounds. Now, again, you know, very strong player by himself. Showing up on Dash, oh, you mm -hmm. have to imagine he's got some spice in it. There's a reason he brought this deck. And yeah. to be honest, into the top decks, into Iceland, you know, it has game into Iceland. We just spoke about yeah, this. It's an aggro deck, it. but, you know, it has game into Iceland. Uh, it is pretty good into Dromai. Uh, Bravo and Azalea could be rough, but you know, it's Brody Spurlock. If he's bringing that deck, he has some to his matches. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Oh, look at that. The first French player, Simon, Simon Diaz from Lyon, France. A very experienced, very good player with Dromai. He had a tough time in the, in the draft portion also today, but he mm -hmm. won against the French national champion, Kevin Penek. And he's a very good, very intense effusive player i i definitely uh, love to see him and to watch him live because i i want to i want to show the world how how france does it but uh, <laughs> yeah so far it looks like he he's had a, a tough day today so maybe mm. we'll see him a little bit later stefano meoni on azalia one of the very best european players very strong italian player i think he won the national championship this year and maybe last year so very mm. very good player and very very cool guy I'm definitely very happy to see Azaleas in the top yeah, in, in the top three tables. It was one of the one of the best decks for you. Yeah, I uh, I had my uh, my pick for the tournament was Azalea. It was the place you want to be just because I feel like her only bad matchup is Bravo. Uh, and we did see, you know, yesterday after the CC rounds in the 4-0 bracket, there were the same number of Azaleas as there were Dromais, and mm -hmm. there were way more Dromais who showed up than Azaleas. Yeah. So, you know, um, I do feel pretty validated that Azaleas did well in the CC rounds, but of course, it looks like some of them did drop their draft games. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, they're, they're still, uh, I think, some in the X2 bracket and some in the X3 bracket. So let's see whether they're able to make it up in the CC rounds. Okay, so they just told us that the, the players are still sideboarding. So we'll take a look at the cards to watch for, for this matchup. For, uh, so for Katsu, the Wanderer. Look mm. at that. Harmonize Kodashi, Mask of Momentum. Of course, you know these cards. They've been there since the beginning of the game. Surging Strike also, but Surging Strike has had some new tools recently. Uh, very impressive tools uh, in, in Outsiders. In the, that combo line that ends with Bonds of Ancestry. So how, how did it change the game plan for, for Katsu? It basically gave them a combo line that wasn't that didn't end with something that was mostly only relevant into fatigue, mm -hmm. right? Because the Mugenshi release and a lot of wind rind was really, really good if your opponent's trying to block you out a lot and you're mm -hmm. losing your threats. But if your opponent wants to just race you or put you on the back foot, they didn't really care if you put a bunch of surging strikes back in your deck. But with the Bonds of Ancestry line oh, that yeah. ends in Dishonor, <laughs> yeah, Dorinthia's gonna need to care about that. It is, it ends with Dishonor and it also deals a lot of damage, <laughs> yes. really a lot of damage. So usually yeah. you, you can even die, at right? Yeah. And for the entire Iron Song, we see Glint, the Quicksilver, of course, one of the big Welcome to Race cards, uh, Welcome to Rave cards, but there's also Glistening Steel, Steel Blade that's, that was released in the... Um, in uh, the, the Classic Battles. Yeah, in the Classic Battles between Reinhardt and Dorinthia. Very impressive card also. Mm -hmm. 
So um, yeah, what's what's the the most important card in this matchup? Because you don't can't really afford to block too much with the Orientia. You need to be able to put some some counters on this down blade very fast if you want to to, to race some yeah. deck like Katsu. So what do you do? So Glistening Steel Blade is definitely a very very a key card in this matchup because it forces the Katsu to block. Normally when an aggro race as Dorinthia, if you don't have cards that make your opponent want to block, you don't get value of these reprise cards that we see like the Glen, the Quicksilver mm -hmm. and Singing Steel Blade. So Glistening Steel Blade tells them, hey, if you don't block me, I'm gonna snowball out of control. Yeah. You have to block me and once you start blocking me, I'm gonna have my reprise cards. Now so for Katsu, one of the questions, one of the solutions they have for that playline from Dorinthia is the defense reactions. Now, Katsu has what is arguably one of the best defense reactions in the game in the form of that flick flag. Flick flag, yeah. Now, of course, the uh the condition that your next blocking your next combo card blocks for two more not gonna be too relevant if the first dom blade doesn't even hit in the first place uh but at the same time that is a zero for four defense reaction that you can expect katsu's will run mm -hmm. and probably will bring in for a matchup like this okay so it's very important also to to see who's starting the game when you're doing TR, there's always the, the question of how much damage you're gonna push and if you can afford to to give away a lot of cards so it looks like yuto was starting and just was happy with getting an Arsenal card for later. Yeah, and looking at the equipment here from Yuto, over here, normally Dorinthia players either have Tunic or Courage of Blade Hole, depending on how long they expect the matchup to go. So in something like a Dromai, for example, you'll expect to see them run Tunic because that matchup, that matchup can go pretty long. However, in a matchup like this, and in what's very much an aggro race, the, uh, you can see uh, Yuto has elected to run the Courage of Blade Hole instead mm -hmm. to you know, have one of those power push turns to really put the Katsu on the back, yeah. foot, on the back foot. Very interesting. So, first attack from Alex's side, it's a surging strike. So, one of these very annoying cards, because even if it doesn't have the complete combo line, if you let it hit and it has go again instantly, so you can, you can just attack again, yeah, you need to give, to, yeah. you, to give away two cards usually. Yeah, and, and very, very critical there by Alex Slow, not starting a turn with a Kadachi. Normally, you'll see Kadachi into Surging Strike mm -hmm. because, of, you know, if you have the combo piece in yeah. hand or if you want to tutor the combo piece, you're on Kadachi after because, you know, now the previous chain link wasn't the Surging Strike mm -hmm. that the combo cards care about. So, you know, you start with the Surging Strike here, leaving the one floating, uh, making you to, you know, think about what he potentially wants to do with the one floating. Is it going to be a one, uh, like a one card, uh, a one for four go again attack afterwards? Or is he holding for a Razor Reflex or something later down mm -hmm. the line or something? So, a uh, very, very tricksy play by Alex though coming out already. And that is really the story of this matchup over here. Both players kind of have these combo tricks, uh, combat tricks uh, up their sleeve in form of Ancestral Empowerment, Razor Reflex on the Katsu side. And Dorinthia obviously full of these attack reactions. And already Yuto really considering if he wants to block that one, it shouldn't be that hard, you know, <laughs> but it is, as you mentioned. Oh, oh, and ending with the Warmonger's Diplomacy, which basically means that you cannot only attack once with the Dawnblade when you're not in the uh, it, it depends where she gets her go-again source from. If she, mm -hmm. like, she can't play like a Warrior's Valor or a Hit and Run, but she does have attack reactions that give go-again, like Glint the Quicksilver, and mm -hmm. that she can still play through uh, the war mode on Warmonger's yeah, Diplomacy. Definitely. So if that hits, then she can still get go-again, still attacking. But yeah, you see the Hit and Run being pitched there. Not a card Yuta was allowed to use because definitely. he chose war. Because he chose, or he chose war, yeah. So very interesting line from Alex though in the previous turn, actually. We saw him pitch the Blue Whelming Gust Wave, and we knew he had a Surging Strike in hand and the Warmongers, of mm -hmm. course. So he could have gone for surging into a blue whelming gust wave as the you know he had a natural combo in some sense mm -hmm. wasn't red whelming uh but he chose not to i think part of that is because he knows he needs to whittle down the dorinthia's armor for a little bit because if you're going to come in with all those on hits like a red whelming but a dorinthia still has the oh as you mentioned up, so i'm sorry yeah. i'm cutting you off but he has a he has a, a big attack reaction a puncture i think yes it's a puncture so not yeah. getting buffed up because there's no equipment blocking so just going mm -hmm. plus two over the sink below but um, it's still six <laughs> oh, and there's a second one. So he packed a lot of defense reactions, apparently. Yeah, and you have to wonder whether he's also running those flick flags, you know, the classic ninja mm -hmm. defense reaction. So you two over there not leaking any damage, but definitely pretty happy that you got two cards out of Alex Lowe's hand. You know, you're against an aggro deck. You kind of don't mind if they block you. He strike to start off, so it's probably going to be a seven attack because he has, yeah, there you go. And do does the damage at the beginning of the deck like that matter? Or do you think like Yuto is gonna take it all to the face and start his turn with a four, with a full hand? So five cards? I think the damage definitely matters because both these decks actually really 
love playing when the opponent is in the sub five life mm -hmm. because when you're sub five life katsu is uh, threatening to put you into what we call kadachi lock, where you're, where you're forced to start blocking mm -hmm. kadachis and durinthia is very very happy when you're sub five life and you just start blocking dawn blades because then now all her reprise effects are on so yes i will say that the damage even though it's vanilla on that turn mm -hmm. will matter later on if yuto gets that low but given that he took that risk and took all the damage you have to imagine he's going to come with, with something really really strong here and that's exactly what we see is going this on is right now this is very impressive so iron song determination into warriors valor it's going to be a very big down blade coming in for seven with dominate it looks like i think i see a fade for seeing alex low's hands so it looks yeah. like he's very very tech he's for this matchup yeah very very defensive Definitely, almost like the. <laughs> Do you like remember the his Katsu yeah. fatigue decks <laughs> from the beginning of the game? Is he going back to this one? <laughs> well, there's no more drone of brutality, so you know, yeah. <laughs> definitely a lot less effective. But the number of D reacts that we've seen already, um, you know, he seems to be very, very comfortable blocking yeah. out, and he seems to want to just you know play those effective generics like Light mm -hmm. and Strike, um, and just use Kadachis to potentially end the game. Let's let's see how he deals with this Dawnblade for seven. I have to be honest, I have a little bit of nostalgia looking at these very defensive Katsu builds. <laughs> uh -huh. I hated playing against them when I was facing them at the beginning, but now I can definitely that imagine. I've been gone for a few years, so, I will get back to it. So that's, yeah, this attack for seven means that you probably have to give away some pieces of equipment. So Dawnblade for seven is it's just incredibly difficult to block, yeah. especially with the Dominate, right? You're going to turn on a reprise no matter what. Definitely. And you see two cards left in the Dorinthia's yeah. hand after she took an E-Strike for seven. So, you know, you have to imagine that the Dorinthia is prepared for you to be able to block. And there's no way you block a seven attack uh, without blocking from hand mm -hmm. unless you give up either Tunic or Mask of Momentum, yeah. right? You can, you can have a full uh, defense, defense reaction on Arsenal, but if you put three blocking equipment on it, you either can have Tunic or Mask Momentum, not something he wants to do but this early be honest, in the game. Yeah, it's not an option at that point in the game. Exactly. Maybe later when you're really low on life and that you know that you, it's the only way to survive, but at that point you can't really afford to lose that those key pieces of equipment. Exactly. So no matter what, Reprise will be turned on or this Dawnblade is going to hit and get both go again from Warriors Valor and be allowed to swing again from Dorinthia's yeah. hero ability. Oh, that's oh. not of war. So use defensively to boost the the defense the defense of his attack actions, I guess. Yeah, and let's see whether yeah. So he's probably also going to banish. Yeah, uh, and I mean draw he has another to, to, two. Yeah, that's the only way to. So that's very very interesting to because use it. he. Oh, it so looks like he didn't. Oh, he's choosing defend from Arsenal. Uh, I, I believe nice. the most he's choosing is different from and Arsenal he's and plus one. Away there the we go. Tunic. He made a slide. Yeah. He doesn't care about so. that tunic. So that Even is that early in the game. That is one of the few ways he can play around reprise, the defense of Arsenal. Like not only wow. is the defense reactions from Arsenal, but he did end up giving the three block on armor that we were talking about. Either give a mask momentum or a tunic. So you lose the tunic then out of what with the defend from arsenal clause something you really 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 see uh we saw lexis in a previous meta actually use that a little bit because they could even load a voltaire instant speed and then block with that mm -hmm. uh but very rarely you see that mode being used in a non-ranger deck really so blocking from arsenal and then and you know he's not even punished there's not much actually that can punish him in on that play so very heads up play by Alex low it just turns off the turn for yuto suzuki no tunic left but at least yeah no counter on that double blade so that was definitely quite risky because while reprise it was wasn't, yeah while reprise wasn't turned on there's still other pumps that you know don't really care for like we saw the puncture just early on they'll yeah. just straight mm -hmm. up buff it uh but alex Lowe did have the fate for scene in hand as well which looks like he's what he's going yeah. to arsenal over here so he was definitely prepared for even just a pump but he just wanted to say i'm going to turn off your reprise now however that was very costly. That was a lot of armor Alex Lowe used. He only has mass and momentum left. And we haven't even seen a Steel Blade Supremacy from this Dorinthia. Steel Blade Supremacy, Glistening Steel Blades, there's still plenty yeah. of power cards in Yuto's list. All we saw was Iron Sun Determination. That was only one, and there's uh, probably uh, two of them also left in the deck. So that, those big turns with Iron Sun Determination uh, into, the, into all these big attacks. It can be devastating, so he, he'll need to, to, put, uh, to put together something strong now. He won't be able to defend a lot. I completely agree, and yeah, especially without all that armor gun. Uh, with all that armor gun, it's like, there's still three steel-based supremacies and three glistening steel-based left in Yuto's list, uh, we have to imagine, so... 
Uh, let's see whether, you know, Alex... There's no way he can afford to, for, uh, that he can let his opponent find these key pieces, so... Oh, Do you YouTube think, so the, the fact that he blocks with Courage of Blade Hole, does he mean that he's going to crack it next turn? That is what you would because imagine. Because there's no reason to block that one. It's just 100 wins. It doesn't do anything apart from dealing free damage. Yeah, so you have to imagine that he's uh, opting to do that. But at the same time, when you block with Crown of Providence and filter a card, that is a bit of a risk to take because you mm -hmm. don't know what you're going to draw. Yeah. So committing to Courage there of Blade Hold before you draw... It. Um, can be a little risky. Let's see if that paid okay, off. So oh, that's the glistening seal blade. So very, very interesting. So all of these dawn blade attacks will cost zero. Uh, yes, they'll cost zero, and there's a good thing steel blade. So this is really yeah. scary. This is the other it, power turn we are yeah. talking about, Roman. That's one of the power turns. Now, yeah. don't he has access to a lot of power turns? Yeah, and uh, no armor left for Alex, except the mask of momentum. Yeah. But we do know he has a fate for scene in Arsenal. So. Probably gonna see that over here. You defend from Arsenal. You don't turn on reprise. Oh, looks like this is very yeah. scary because there's still two two resources floating and <laughs> lots of cards in hand, and that's the twinning blade. So even if he caught, if he didn't hit, he can just attack again. Twinning blade yes, the into spouse of war. Another attack for the down blade for five. Yeah, Twinning Blade, one of the best punishes for when your opponent overblocks yeah. you. That was two cards, and you just say, I'm going to attack again. Oh, so now Singing Steel Blade. Yeah, I, I really want to commend Yuto's uh, sequencing over there. He uh -huh. gave it go again with Glistening Steel Blade, but not the buff. And then he comes in with Dawn Blade. He'll Alex overblocks, mm -hmm. and he goes Twinning Blade, and then he plays an yet another yeah. go again card and the buff this time oh. into another Twinning Blade. Oh yeah, he'd be able yeah. to attack twice, but he won't be able to hit because we know that there's a fate for scene in the arsenal for Alex. Yeah, so so this will not hit. Well, this Donble is also going up to six, and Alex is currently only blocking for five. So, um, so his Donble is actually oh, yeah. already going to hit. Uh, so getting the uh, another twinning that you can imagine that what Yuto wants to do, he's playing around the defense reaction perfectly over here. Yeah, he's just saying you might have a defense reaction, but it doesn't matter. I'm gonna get the uh, get the counter. Yeah, because he so plays twinning blade again, and he, yeah. and there we go. He's got the first counter, and now the texture of the game changes very, very differently. When Donley's coming in for four, that is so much more difficult to block. Uh, then when it's just coming in for three. Also popping the refraction blow ultras finally, because that was the first time Dorinthia actually triggered. The first, you know, you attack oh, twice the Dawnblade yeah. with the Twinning Blades, and now it so attacks again with the Dorinthia trigger. on yes. that own blade. Yuto showing oh us... Oh my god! An absolute masterclass Dorinthia play here, saying you want to turtle up. That, that fish for the Twinning Blade from the Singing Steel Blade was so incredibly yeah. heads up. He was playing around defense reaction from Arsenal, Perfectly by Alex Lowe then. I also got really punished for using all his armor for being that defensive. Now this is Dawn Blade coming in for six, Roman. Six. <laughs> this is impossible to block, basically. <laughs> yeah, this very, very... Especially when you have to block with all the cards from hand. You don't have a card in Arsenal, so all the reprise effects are, are active, are online. That was just such an incredibly effective use of Courage of Blade Hole. That was four Dawn yeah. Blade swings. Oh. On, a, <laughs> on a Courage of Blade So Alternate. this is going to attack for 12. Yes. Uh, sharpened Steel, double Sharpened Steel he also into Dull Blade. He also has a Steel Blade Supremacy in his hand. Let's see what he opts oh. to use. It here. Now, you know, it is a little scary if Alex Lowe just puts 12 on this and there's none floating. Oh, we can just definitely, yeah, get yeah. rid of all that, do, those counters. He might be able to get rid of, unless an Iron Song responds in Yuto's yeah, hand. Yeah, he needs something like, like an Iron Song response because he doesn't have that many resources. It looks like he had a very red hand. Yeah, and let's see whether, I mean, Alex Lowe's list does have some two blocks. We saw the Descendant Gust Wave on the previous, mm -hmm. uh, on the previous turn, only, you know, blocking for five, which is critically what made the Dawn Blade go up to yeah. six. Uh, so it's what made the Dawn Blade go over the block. Uh, so, you know, if he has a few too many two blocks in his hand, he might not be able to block 12. At the same time, we've seen him run a lot of defense reactions, so maybe he's able to block more than 12. Yeah. Maybe even get over an Iron Song response, potentially. Let's see what he does. Oh, again, the defensive art of war, apparently. That's what it looks but like. But he won't so, be able to do much with it. So if he draws three attacks that all block for three, um, then he will be able to block 12 on his Dawn Blade. But if he draws even a single attack that blocks for two, we see that 100 wins like a yeah. Banisher is out of what that. Critically, yeah. one of those cards only blocks for two. Absolutely. If he draws one of those, he will need to put Mask of Momentum in front of this if he wants to stop the on it. 
Oh, oh, so that's 12, actually. That is 12 with the flick flag. Yeah, and the flick flag box for four. Oh. And he had no way to use it. So losing all these crucial oh. counters on that down blade, that has to be feel devastating for you, too. This has been three turns in the game, and we've yeah. already seen like the tempo shift like four times. Yeah. <laughs> this is absolutely amazing. Yuto put in cash in all the equipment to get all those counters, and unfortunately drew one of his hands from during the red heavy hand that had no attack react or no free attack react. Couldn't keep those counters on. We had and now we might see uh, the game slow down a little bit because yeah. a lot of these power cards are used. There's no equipment left, maybe uh, almost on each side. As so for blood into stroke. Unfortunately, that was one of the one cost attack reactions that Yuto had in his arsenal. Mm -hmm. So he couldn't use yeah. it the previous turn because of the all red hand and lost all those downblade counters. Roman, I just want to point out that both players are still above 30 life. We are on turn 4 or 5 and all the equipment is yeah. gone from both sides. <laughs> we always see oh. that it's impressive <laughs> when players manage to keep their equipment very, very long, very deep into the game. But these players that needed it very early and now it's gone. So they have to be very careful about, about their blocks for the remainder of the game. Oh, look at that. So Alex Lowe not even worrying about this one. Yeah, when it's just vanilla damage. Yeah. yeah, that was just three cards for yeah. nine that Dernte just did. That's, you know, that's mm -hmm. a, a card you can beat that rate, yeah. you know, uh, until you start threatening, uh, threatening Dawnblade counters. You're not too worried. Um, is that, is that uh, like, can Katsu go off with a Forka hand or do you really want it to, to be as efficient as possible with one card in Arsenal and try, try to build the longest, the longest combat chain that you can? So, especially with cards like Bonds of Ancestry, like going on a four card hand is perfectly, perfectly reasonable mm -hmm. because, you know, Bonds of Ancestry it's already good draws enough. a card. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Basically, draws a card. Uh, but the, what critically the fifth card does is potentially hide an attack reaction with the Ancestral Empowerments. We've already seen him pitch two of them this game. Uh, but, you know, cards like Ancestral Empowerment and cards like Razor Reflex is what that fifth card in Katsu really lets you do to really get push that on hit through. Mm -hmm. Like, say it's a Dishonor or the Whelming Gust Wave that lets you draw more cards and go even further. Yeah. And you mentioned it earlier, but there's no, there, there hasn't been that many harmoni harmonized Kodachi attacks yet. So it looks yep. like he, he wants just to, to use as many cards as possible on his opponent's hand. Fluster Feast for four. There's no go again on that one, and we can safely assume that he's not going to use any way to, to give go again with the Breeze Rider boots. So mm. he's, it's just an attack for four, and I think Yuto is happy to take it. Yeah. yeah, so I, I wonder what read Yuta is able to make from this, because remember, no, well, that was one of the things that, you know, if you talk about the previous turn cycle, what did Yorinthe did, they just came with a Dawnblade with no pre-buff, and normally on a naked Dawnblade, you don't block it, because it's going to turn on all the reprise effects, so it, you know, normally you might make the read that Alex Lowe has a defense reaction, he has a couple of defense reactions, that's why he held those extra two cards, but really it's just that the Dorinthia's turn, the previous turn cycle, was a really, really bad turn for the Katsu to block, so Yuto still doesn't really have a good read on what Alex Lowe's uh, hand could be, but effectively because of the naked downblade swing, Alex Lowe had to IP himself one. He lost yeah. a full card basically. So now that's an attack with downblade for three because of the glistening sea blade, he can get out of hand pretty fast. So once again, Alex will have to be very careful with his blocks, blocking with a dishonor apparently. Yep. Oh. Looks like he's potentially going to turn on the reprise, but you have to imagine, you know, we've seen a Flick Flag, a Fate Foreseen, and a Sink Below. Yeah. So you can imagine that he he's running nine options. defense yeah. reactions. Mm -hmm. You have to imagine one of those is sitting in his arsenal yeah. right there. Uh, so even if he turns on the reprise, he'll be quite safe from some pumps. And this is quite telegraphed. When you see the opponent turn on your just block for three mm -hmm. on your Dombler as threatening glistening steel blade, you know oh, that they have more defensive pieces. It yeah. is extremely telegraphed that they are, that they have the capacity to block the Dombler for more than just three. But he has even more of these defensive <laughs> pieces that you mentioned because that's a noisy respite. That's not even a defense reaction. So he even get get got one life out of it. Pretty cool because yeah. he took it a lot of damage on the previous turn, and now he's going Kodachi Kodachi with the with his blue card in his in his pitch zone, blue card for zero. Yeah, this is very a important. Extremely, extremely defensive Katsu list over here. He really wants to just get the game to the point where he can put uh, Yuto on Kodachi lock, but you know, getting there is going to be a little tough. Although you know, with at this point, what you can imagine, fifteen, no, twelve defensive pieces, three Oasis. Three things, three phase, three flick flex, uh, and cards like C and C, which you know mm -hmm. also defensive because you force cards out of your yeah. opponent. Um, you can imagine that you know that's the way he's been winning all these games, and potentially the way he's gonna get there in this one. 
Okay, so YouTube valuing his life and also his arsenal, apparently, giving away yep. two cards to these Command and Conquerors you mentioned. So that's obviously less power on his side for his turn. And the, oh, oh, the Ooh. nourishing emptiness. Oh, oh he's playing Eye of Ophidia. Hmm, that's a YouTube channel I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, a pretty good one, if I can <laughs> say so, yeah. But that's, I mean, I'm always excited when I see this card because I feel like it could fit in so many decks and you don't see it because, like, people don't want to try it out because it can be dangerous. It doesn't block, of course, so it's, it can be, a div it can put you in some difficult spots sometimes. It can do some wonders for so many decks. So I'm excited when I see it. I, mean, I love the way that these players approach, like, thinking of outside the box, just put the eye of a Fidia and see what it does for you. Definitely very innovative deck building yeah. that we are seeing here at this World Championships. And yeah, I'm too excited about Ivor Fidia as well. I know that Levi Rao in his Azalea list today yeah, actually so was running running it, it was very impressive. Uh, we yeah. know that it's very, very good in Azalea, of course, but yeah. yeah. And also really good over here, especially when, it, when you're going to go up yeah. to Intellect 5. You know, when your opponent wow. doesn't have the arsenal, unless he gives a mask of momentum, uh -huh. you're going to draw an extra card. Using Ivor Fidia to, you know, filter that a little he we saw him opt one to the bottom keep one on yep. top we can expect a pretty pretty threatening turn from yuto uh, suzuki coming out here as long as he doesn't get command and conquered again okay kodachi into kodachi okay blocking a second kodachi uh, yeah, very heads up play to stop yeah. the mask momentum you never want to get destroyed by one of these break points on the third attack yep so over here, Probably Yuto has to wonder, like, if this 100 wins hits, Alex can go ahead and find a Winds of Eternity, or yeah. not, but it's only going to be form of vanilla damage, so... Yeah, that's not part of the combo line, so you won't be, yeah. you won't be able to finish off with something like a Bones of Ancestry, so it's not too worrying for now. Exactly, it'll almost just be for vanilla with another 100 wins or a Winds of Eternity. Yeah. Uh, not something Yuto is probably going to be too concerned about. Uh, and if Alex Lowe does go ahead and do that, you two Suzuki can rest easy knowing that there won't yeah. be an arsenal, which is very, very critical because all the big turns you two has tried to set up, Alex has always had the arsenal mm -hmm. uh, to you know play a defense reaction from or use Art of War defensively mm -hmm. uh, from. But it looks like Alex didn't. Look at that. He didn't even attack yeah. with, the, with another card. Yeah. So he didn't no use way Katsu. To no, no Katsu ability on that turn. Which means he might have the defense reaction on yeah. arsenal, which means you two like has it. to be prepared for that. Or maybe he bluffed it and he doesn't have anything. Yep. Or maybe another... Another this Respite. So that's Blade Flash. Yep. The Sword Attack gets go again. And there we go. Mm -hmm. That was the Defense Reaction Arsenal. So oh, Alex felt very tricksy flash, with the yeah. cards to trigger the previous turn, saying, huh, am I going to use it? I don't think he was ever <laughs> going to use it. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the, as we spoke about earlier, these are very tricksy, tricksy decks from both oh, sides. Oh, Double Singing Steel Blade! by Yuto Suzuki, so what do you get in this situation? You have many options, but so double you need to decide. Oh, th oh, there, there, was, there was no reprise. Oh, yeah. Th there was absolutely so no reprise. So it was just two, it was just plus two. It was two cards for plus two. That is not how Yuto Suzuki wants to use those cards. He does get to swing Domblade again because uh, during yeah. the trigger from mm -hmm. the Domblade hitting, but that is a third singing steel blade that we've seen, Roman. That's, we've seen three singing steel yeah, blades, two glistening steel yeah. blades. Mm -hmm. A lot of the power cards are just being drained out of Yuto's deck because, uh, to not much effect because Alex Lowe has all these defensive pieces. We know that there's at least two Iron Song determinations left. So some way to push damage through and yeah, that's it. Wow, he actually yeah, got through on this the, turn. the response on that one. Yeah, and uh, Flusterfest was blocking for 5 because of the Flick Flex ability. Yep. Uh, but it, critically, it came from hands. Iron Song response was turned online. Alex Lowe not blocking with extra cards that we've seen him do quite often this mm -hmm. game. So, you know, the Domley counter is there. So, it's back to Yuto. Uh, I mean, it's back to Alex now with the Kadachi. But let's see whether Yuto is able to capitalize on this start of what could be a snowball on the Domblade. We talked about the combo line at the beginning of the game and we haven't seen a glimpse of it yet. So yeah. I'm very <laughs> worried about if we're going to see something that's one of these very explosive strong turns from, from Alex. Okay, so that might be, be like water can turn into anything you want, basically. That's a starter for the combo. Yeah, it could turn into Surging Strike and yeah. you know, he has the one floating to pay for it if it hits. And you have mm -hmm. to imagine the zero cost in hand yeah. to fish for the Whelming Gust Wave, which you know, draw a card. So... Uh, let's see what the Yuto respects is. He might just opt to, you know what, you, I have my count on a Domblade, I need to keep this up. You don't have the full combo line because you only have one card remaining. Uh, maybe I'll just let you have it. Looks like he's not opting to take that risk. He's saying, I'll go off with this Domblade 
just on three cards. Yeah, basically, as long as you make sure that it doesn't hit, you are not going to get threatened. And this one, critically, like, be like water, you can't pump it with the breaking scale, so there's, there's no risk of being destroyed by one of these tricky effects. Definitely. Once again, Yuto starting off with what we call the naked down blade, just no pre-buff. Let's see. In the past, we've seen Alex, you know, just choose not to defend. And yeah, this is one of those oh. things you can definitely do. This doesn't turn on reprise, oh, it doesn't yeah, do anything, perfect. just prevent four. And gaining one, so that's two from these Aussies respites, making very good use of them. Still yep. using puncture. Oh, this is so respite. Seven. Yeah. What, one of the ways oh. you can block from hand without turning on reprise. And flick flack now. Looks like he's using energy potions in his build against the, the, the Katsus, which sounds a bit weird to me, but since it doesn't block. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but at the same time, you know, if, if you know your Akatsu opponent's potentially more defensive side of things, you mm -hmm. might need the energy potion just to construct a much bigger turn. Uh, we saw uh, Dorinthias do that against Olden back in the day mm -hmm. as well. Just, you know, cards like energy potion let you, you know, construct those really big turns that you need to go over defensive decks like this Alex Lowe's Katsu list. Very, very fascinating um, Katsu list over here. You know, it's, since it's no, not one of the matchups that we watch a lot, it's always very interesting to see how these players that, seems to be, that seem to be masters of their, of their heroes, they approach this metagame and these specific matchups. Absolutely. I mean, we, we spoke about how innovative Yuto's uh, list, list was, but we also have to give a lot of credit for Alex Lowe's. How often are you going to sit across a Katsu and expect that they're going to have Oasis, Respite, Fates, Sinks, and <laughs> yeah. Flick Flags in them? And that's, you know, sort of edge you can just get uh, in a game like this where, you know, you don't know what the opponent's deck list is. Mm -hmm. You're going to sit down, you're going to side for aggro, and your opponent just has 12 ways to stop <laughs> your damage, and you just die to Kadachis. So. Yeah. He's playing, like, full control. Yeah. <laughs> So Yuto with not a lot of, you know, threats left in the deck. Uh, let's see if he's able to pull stuff up. But still, Dorinthia, you know, still a very, very tricksy hero. And, you know, he's nowhere near Kadachi Lock yet. So there's definitely a chance he's able to, you know, get past Alex Lowe's defense, defensive pieces and get to the point where he's turning on these other reprise effects. So that naked down blade coming for three. Is yep. there a chance that Alex doesn't even really rely on the combo line and just threatens yeah. it to run his opponent out of cards. Out of cards against a deck that has a weapon that's, uh, you know, attacks for three or just one resource is pretty unlikely, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, but, you know, you can definitely run them out of threats. We've seen Alex will do that yeah. already. You know, two glistenings, three singing steel blades, all gone. Uh, out of cards unlikely, but to Kadachi lock, yeah, very, very, very potentially. I mean, the Kadachi is what can run the Durantia out of cards, right? Because that's one card from Katsu yeah. uh, to get two of the Durantia's cards if the Durantia's at one. So, respecting the attack reactions, that's yep. a Glyn the Quicksilver. Activate yep. with an activity, the reprise effect, so that you can draw a card out of it. Yep, win the quick server, the best punish uh, when your opponent blocks a naked down blade. It's a, it's a whole reason why you normally don't block naked down blades. This is the card for, uh, uh, that punishes you the most when you try and block something like that because then you're going know, to draw a card. But when you block for six, you, will, you are asking the Durante opponent to go up to seven mm -hmm. to even make use of the go again effectively. So let's see whether Yuto is able to do that. Uh, Alex Lowe, this time not super telegraphing that he has a defense reaction in his arsenal, mm -hmm. but we've seen the way he's playing. He's been yeah, he's very he careful. might still have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's exactly what Yuto is considering apparently. Oh, emboldened blade. So that's oh. a new card. Yeah. So that oh. wasn't. A, so if it's a defense reaction, he could have destroyed it. It destroys defense reactions in the arsenal. Yeah. But it wasn't. So it's a new card from the um, the expans ex expansion slot. Sorry, from yeah, uh, from Bright Lights. Lights, and it's a very cool card that. I wish I could play in <laughs> Boltin, but I can't. But it's very, <laughs> very impressive use. So yeah. yeah, he would have destroyed the defense reaction if it was if it was one, but that unfortunately, was, unfortunately, it was a common and conquer. That was quite unfortunate for you. Yeah. We've seen time and time again, Alex Lowe throughout this game had the defense reaction. But in we Arsenal, know that he's playing the emboldened blade now, so yeah. it's going to be very interesting to see how he uses them. Yeah. Just slightly unfortunate timing from Yuto Suzuki there on the Emboldened Blade, but of course that is one of the risks of that card. It is yeah. a pretty high risk, high reward card, if you will. There's one card that basically did nothing mm. uh, for Yuto Suzuki there. Uh, Suzuki there. 
But at the very worst, it's a three block, it's a blue card, it's definitely okay in, uh, in these Dory builds. Naked Dawnblade again. Definitely. And then, going back to the previous turn cycle, to be honest, when you block six on a Naked Dawnblade, you are kind of telegraphing that you don't have the defensive piece. Uh, because, as we spoke about, when you block six from hand on a Dawnblade like that, you get blown out by cards like yep. Linda Quicksilver. Um, so Yuto probably could have expected that there wasn't a defense reaction in Alex Lowe's arsenal, uh, but still went for it anyway. Masters get them Bolden Blade out of hand, try and fill fish for some better cards. And here we see, right after the turn we yeah, play in Bolden Blade, he that had the defense reaction. Devastating. <laughs> <laughs> yep, very far from Yuto Suzuki there, but I think he has a Glinda Quick. Oh, sorry, he has the Glistening Steel Blade that he's about to set up in his arsenal. And we've seen two CNCs so far from Alex Lowe, so he's just hoping. That it Alex can, doesn't threaten yeah. some sort of on hit that he needs to block. Oh, Steel Blade Supremacy in Yuto's hand as well. Steel Blade Supremacy with the uh, Glistening Steel Blade in Arsenal. That could be a pretty explosive turn. So this does nothing, right? <laughs> a Wolming Gust Wave. That's a naked Wolming Gust Wave, if you will. <laughs> does nothing. Just attacks for three. Doesn't cost anything, of course. Oh, so he's using... Maybe he's going to use the Breeze Rider Boots then. Yeah, so this is one of the ways you can start the combo in the middle. Because yeah. you freeze riders, and now you can find Bonds of Ancestry, and that will be turned on because your previous chain link, you know, is a whelming gust. Wave. Interesting. So, yeah, so it's one, it's one of the few ways you can start in the middle. And of course, there's cards like Razor Reflex that also mm -hmm. help you start in the middle of a combat yeah. chain. Uh, not something we see often from Katsus, but sometimes your hand just line up, lines up in a certain way that yeah, I mean, you don't I, have a starter. I don't remember seeing it. So, yeah. <laughs> it's not something you see a lot. Oh, Ancestral Empowerment also to boost it once more and gain a card out of it. Interesting. So, so Ancestral and Breaking Scales. Uh, it's definitely interesting sequencing from Alex Lohe. You could just have started with Ancestral and not use a Breaking Scales yet. Uh, but it looks like yeah. you have to do both. Uh, I mean, if you do it, you have to, to, to use the Breeze Rider Boots now. Yes. Yeah, he definitely has to use Breeze Rider Boots if he wants to extend the chain, which you imagine he wants to do uh, if he pumped up this Whelming Gust Wave. Yeah. Uh, but using both pumps over here... I guess so, he's... One, yeah, yeah, now he has to use Katsu and the Breeze Rider Boots and maybe wondering about the timing of the effects if he has to... But it doesn't matter much anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, so you are allowed to order the triggers since mm -hmm. they are your own triggers. Uh, Breeze Rider and Katsu both trigger on hit and you get to order yeah. it. Uh, but yeah, as you rightly point out, it doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, so he's just checking through his graveyard, trying to decide what he and might What's want. left in his deck, because he's yeah. used lots of, uh, of his offensive options also. But I, I don't think we've seen crucial pieces of the, of the combo yet, so he might definitely have enough in his deck. Yeah, yeah we definitely haven't seen that many uh, Surging Strikes. Uh, yeah. We've seen a, a few Be Like Waters, though, uh, and a few Hundred Winds as well. Not many Surging Strikes. Uh, but I think that's the first Red Whelming Gust Wave that he's played, and now, because uh, he's played the, uh, the Gust Wave, he'll be able to play the Bones of Ancestry. Yep. Crucially, though, he won't be able to use um, the Dishonor, because you need the complete line to be able to profit from the effect. Yes, but the Breeze Rider Boots is active, which means every combo card yep. has go again, so I think what we're so going to see... It can be a very long one, yeah. What we're going to see is probably a double Bonds of mm -hmm. Ancestry turn. That's something a Katsu can do after you've popped the Breeze Rider yep. Boots. You go Bonds of Ancestry, and you either fish for another Bonds that's in your graveyard, or a Gust Wave that's mm -hmm. in your graveyard, and then you have the other piece in your hand, yep. and you can just do it again one more time. So this looks to be what could be a very, very scary long term from Alex Lowe. I almost wonder whether it could threaten lethal, really, which is, you know, Dur during this at 17, there's already been two attacks in the chain, and I think Alex Lowe, it might be close to threatening lethal on this turn, Roman. Yeah, this is the thing, because, you know, these ninja heroes like Fai, who's very efficient at, uh, at putting uh, a lot of damage on the, on, on the board, like, every single turn, but you don't have these huge turns like, like Katsu can just... I'll try to kill you with 30 damage in one turn. I mean, it kind of it could happen before when um, when Fai was at the at the top of his <laughs> of his power was oh, at no. full power. <laughs> but yeah, remember that time? So yeah, we all did. <laughs> <laughs> but now, yeah, I, I think the the highest ceiling in terms of damage is definitely Katsu. Katsu Dash I was also definitely up yeah, there. Yeah, I mean in the ninja. Oh yeah, yeah in the in ninja. Ninjas, camp, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, Bonds and Ancestry, Ancestry coming for. So, he ended up banishing a Dishonor there, not yeah. going for what? Maybe not going for the double uh, Bonds of Ancestry line, though. He could still have another Gust Wave and Bonds in his mm -hmm. hand right now. So, you could still definitely go for it. Uh, if he has, I, def I think I see one Gust Wave in his hand. Yeah, it looks like um, it. 
So in which case, at least you know, one. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, now Yuto is thinking because remember, Mask is going to be threatened <laughs> during this. Time, oh yeah, right. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, but so it's still weird that he used the ancestral empowerment uh, at that point in the game, at that point in the turn, because he could have used it to push some damage at uh, after after a while. But if you attack for four anyway, you figure that your opponent will have to use two cards. He doesn't have any pieces of equipment anyway, so it's it's basically the same. So Yuto taking a look at uh, Alex Lowe's graveyard mm -hmm. over here, trying to decide how he wants to block this Bronze of Ancestry. We've seen him, you know, in the previous turn cycles, always blocking the second attack yeah. that's going to threaten a mass momentum. That is typically what you want to do against Katsu. Uh, but when this second attack is coming in for four, you know, that's a little... You have to put two cards in front of this, and you also mm -hmm. have to wonder whether Alex can threaten Mask again this turn, yeah. because there's a Dishonor that will have go again, because of the Breeze Rider Boots that was popped this turn, so that's and also going to come in for four, yeah. also going to threaten Mask, if there's two other cards in hand, you know, if Yuto blocks this, very likely Alex can just threaten Mask again. Mm -hmm. None of these harmonized Kodashi have been used yet, so that's a very nice way to, like, prolong the combat chain. So he's taking the four now. Yeah, Yuto took the four, and that's a dishonor now. Yeah, yep, so now two Yuto cards from him. going and blocking two cards in hand, so stopping the third link at this point. Now, unless Alex Lowe has something like a double strike, it's unlikely. Oh, I mean, if he has another bonds in his hand, he could threaten yeah. mask again. If he goes another gust wave into another bonds, that's he can make three chain links again. Well, threaten mask again. Let's see the, what he ends looks up doing. Like it's the end, so he's breaking the chain, maybe. Oh, he's looking if it's only on the combat yeah. chain, but I think uh, it's, it's this on turn. The, yeah. it, it should be this turn uh, on Breeze Rider Boots. Um, okay. Yep. Now, Dishonor, of course, doesn't have the text, as you pointed mm -hmm. out, because there was no surging strike on the combat chain. Okay, so that's another <laughs> Whelming Gust wave. We'd go again, of course. Yep. So this looks like it could be another Bonds, and, and it is yeah, another it Bonds. Is. So, so, wow, just an absolutely explosive line from Alex Lowe here. You know, we thought he was on this super defensive This is very impressive, list. yeah. And now he just comes up with this turn with double bonds in the same turn, starting with just a whelming gust wave, not even Making a surging strike. Making me lie again, because I was like, yeah, maybe he's not even relying, relying, <laughs> relying on the combo line, but look at <laughs> it, he's doing the, tw the double combo line <laughs> in one turn. Definitely, you know, after he sort of uh, wasted a whole bunch of threats from Yuto, from Yuto's oh side. Oh my you know, god, man! Yeah, Yuto Don't used yeah, so Iron many threats. has been dishonored. Oh no! No. no, no, yeah, yeah no, there's, no, 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 so there's no right, descendant yeah, so either. That's, okay, so. that's it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would have been a, a bit sad, but there's still lots of damage. Look at that, Yuto Suzuki down to six life. That's very, very dangerous now. And it's very close to the Kodachi lock that we we're talking yeah. about, and full tempo on Alex Lowe's side as well. This is a scary place for Yuto yeah, Suzuki. Look at that, the Kodachi that you just mentioned are gonna start swinging now. One Kodachi, two Kodachi. Three cards. Yuto has oh, to be wondering. Surging strike as a second attack, which is very, very annoying to block, of course. Yuto has to be hoping that Alex Lowe draws one. Uh, that Alex oh, draws one of those defensive wave. pieces that he mm -hmm. has so many of. So that's going to be two damage. Oh, not Wait. blocking a descendant. Yeah, and if there's another attack. I wonder if Yuto. Oh, oh my god! The other bond. So that's the complete line, and you won. Yeah, that's it. He was Ooh. at 21 life. <laughs> I didn't expect that. I mean, I was like, yeah, that was a nice turn and maybe uh, Yuto will have to block for a while, but I didn't expect him to win outright on this turn. That was Master incredible. Full game. He blocked like for six turns <laughs> and then he went full speed with that Katsu combo line. Yeah, Alex Lowe just dealt 30 across wow. two turns with full blocks from Yuto's side. And that it looks like Yuto yeah. is still shocked. Yeah, that was a very I mean, quick I am ending. shocked, but if I was in his part, I'd be definitely... I am just wow. I'm just dumbfounded right now, Roman. That was I thought we were in for a bit of a grindy game with, with the Dorinthia trying to push over the Kaltsu's blocks, but the Kaltsu just said, Nope, time for me to pivot. Here's 30 damage. Good game. Oh my god. That makes me want to play Katsu now. <laughs> yeah. I want to play like that, you know? I, I want to be that kind of guy. I want to play like Alex. Alex is yeah. my idol now. And wow! You have to remember, that was a game where the Domblade went up to three yeah. counters. That was a Domblade yeah. coming in for six on turn like three of that game. And the Katsu yeah. just managed to block it out completely. 
a bit of an unfortunate draw from Dom from the Dory side on yeah, that turn with that all red hand. Four red hand, yeah, exactly. that was devastating. Couldn't for, keep those counters. Mm -hmm. uh, but then Katsu at the end coming with a, just a natural combo line at the end, surging descendant bonds in that same but hand. But that's what you get sometimes, that's what you, you know, get. the natural combo, yep. and then you win outright. Wow, very es impressive from especially Alex. Especially when your opponent had the non-block in hand with the Iron Song Pride, just yeah. just the perfect punish at the exactly right time for Alex Lowe's Katsu there. Wow. Well. I don't know what to say because I'm. I mean, it's one of the of the matchups that we never see, and that, I mean, it makes me go back to one of the times in Flesh and Blood where everything was so simple and so so efficient, and that's. I mean, I guess that's what I want to see a little bit more of. Yeah, but as far as simple goes, I'm not sure if that game no, that, that we just saw yeah. was very simple. But yes, I yeah, the you know combat, I mean? chain, combat yeah. chain games, right? Yeah, you combat see chain games. Games being played on the combat chain, attack reactions, mm -hmm. all these blocks happening, reprise. Ah, it's an wow. absolute beautiful game. Yeah, it, it is a beautiful game though, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I've... I love the way these guys are going at it with like the the eye of Ophidia and all these new cards that I could, that you never see in these in these decks. But that, that's definitely maybe that was a bit dangerous on um, on Yuto's side just to play with all these non blocks. Yeah, and that definitely played played the role in the end. One hundred percent. The energy potion, the Iron yeah. Sun Pride, the Eye of Ophidia. As you're talking about, I don't about. know how quite many of those guys, but uh, yeah, that's quite a few non block for a deck like Dorinthia, especially when you play it aggressively like that, like with lots lots of uh, bl equipment equipment blocks in the early game and uh, and using the courage of Blade Hole very early on also. Yeah, one hundred percent. Although that courage of Blade Hole did get him three Dawnblade counters, so yeah, <laughs> you could say it was effectively used, but unfortunately couldn't keep the Dawnblade counters on the on the weapon there, which is one of the pitfalls of Dory. Like a lot mm. of times, as Dory, you work so hard to get the counters, and your opponent just puts a whole hand in front of the on from the Dawnblade, and yeah. you just if you can't get over it, you spent all those power cards, all those equipment pieces, and just couldn't get those counters to stick. Wow! So that's. Another round of CC, three left. What's the, um, what do you think is going to happen to, to this poor Katsu that's at the top of the tables now with all the, the, the Icelander players? How do you feel is his path forward if he has to face probably one of the, one of the top, of the top players like Yuki Libenda? We saw that she was playing Icelander and that was, uh, she was undefeated, of course, yesterday. So what's the matchup for, for these Katsu players against uh, Icelander? So, as we spoke about earlier, I think Icelander to any aggro deck is going to be slightly favored for Icelander, yeah. but fragile, as always. You know, if the Katsu starts going off, has the surging strike lines with the combat tricks up their sleeve, and you don't have the disruption, you don't have the blizzard, you mm -hmm. don't have the channel lake frigid, that's when you just implode. You're going to be yeah, forced to block out. You take 30 out. damage, and yeah, yeah, the end of the game is pretty close. Exactly. Or you're forced to block out, forced to get off, and Arsenal and the Katsu just continues yeah. to pound you. Uh, <laughs> that can definitely happen, but on average, if you're able to. You know, disrupt the Katsu because they are pretty resource tight. Uh, you know, Surging Strike is a pretty expensive card to start with, so the pretty resource tight, the couple of Frostbites can definitely tax them out of their turns. So, on average, it's decent for Alex Linder, but fragile. Yeah. So, we're gonna see in a while how Alex does for the end of, the, of this game. I don't think we have another game to show you guys, so mm -hmm. we're gonna cut, cut in a few and see you as soon as possible for round 11 or 12, for round 12 well, of yes, this World Championship in Barcelona, Spain. See you then. Hey everybody, this is Logan Peterson from Flesh and Pod, your favorite podcast on the news, notes, and goings-on of the world of Wraith. And I'm here to tell you that I think that the hero that is going to take home the title in Barcelona is none other than the esteemed magnate himself, Teklovasen. I believe that this is Teklovasen's time to shine. We've already seen Dash IO and Max the Hype Nitro pull off some impressive results in the Calling Melbourne. And this is the time for Teklo to stand up. I think that there's been a lot going on with this hero in the darkest depths of testing discords across the world. And this is the time that Teklovasen is going to shine both in draft. And in Classic Constructed, we're going to see some singularities. We're going to see some Teclo levelers. We're going to see some spice. 
and it's going to be a fascinating watch regardless. I'm sorry that I'm not there with you in Barcelona. It, it hits right here. However, please do find my co- counterpart and podcast partner, Derek Oswalt. He'll be there in Barcelona. Uh, so go ahead and tell him hi. But remember, he is not actually tanning grace. Don't believe anything he tells you. And if you are interested in hearing more of these hot, hot, hot takes, then you are more than welcome to join us on Flesh and Pod every Tuesday morning uh, for a hundred and, I don't know, at this point in time, 103 weeks straight. And also, if you just want to talk at us, you can find us on Twitter at Flesh Pod. Uh, again, it's Flesh and Pod on YouTube. It's Flesh and Pod on every podcast platform under the sun and the moon and whatever heavenly body else you want to put under. It's all the same. And uh, also, if you just want to get into these conversations and the best thing to do is just join our discord. Those links are always in the show notes, but until then folks enjoy Barcelona, uh, have a drink for me and we will all chat later. Cheers. Hello everybody. This is Boston from Boston games. I produce fresh and black content for the Spanish community. And I really hope you're enjoying these worlds as much as me. My bet for these worlds is a drama. A Spanish player is taking down this trophy. Fala galera, beleza? Meu nome é Gabriel Brandão, mais conhecido como Brandão TCG. Eu fui o primeiro brasileiro a atingir mil pontos lifetime no Flash and Blood. E a minha criação de conteúdo atualmente é mais sobre criação de alter art, né? Criação de arte. E se você quer conhecer mais sobre o meu trabalho, me segue em todas as redes sociais de Brandão TCG, que vai ter tudo atualizado, tudo bonitinho. E sobre a minha torcida. Eu tô torcendo para a comunidade do Brasil. É claro que se for para torcer para algum herói, atualmente eu acho que eu quero ver muito a Dash IO representando bem. É um deck que eu vou migrar com certeza, já tô montando meu baralho. E se você ainda não sabe do que você tá jogando, assiste aí o torneio, fica antenado e se prepara que o meta vai mudar muita coisa, vai melhorar, beleza? Então, um beijo no coração de vocês e boa sorte.
Hey everyone, it's TC Talk, and welcome to the Flesh and Blood World Championship in Barcelona. Hope you all are enjoying your time so far watching the event. I wish I could be there with you. Sadly, I cannot. However, thank you all so much for your support in this game, from creator to viewer to player, whatever your role is in this game, you all are the reason that we're at where we're at, and we're able to watch big events like this and have the success we're having. So thank you all so much. Continue to be a positive support in the community. It really means a lot to everyone involved, especially the workers at LSS who work every day trying to give us the best game they possibly can. If you don't know me, I'm TC Talk. You can look up my channel, uh, TC Talk, on YouTube. I've been making content on the game for a little bit over two years now. I'm mainly known for my ninja content, but I tend to dabble into other classes like Assassin and Ranger and just anything that I find interesting as well. I also just do general coverage of the game with event recaps and things like that. So if you want to check it out, feel free to. Um, as my predictions for the event, it's really hard. Uh, Obviously, I want my fellow ninjas to sharpen their kadachi as well and bring it home for the class. That would be really cool to see, whether it's Katsu or Fai. However, if I want to give one cool, fun dark horse, I would say Reinar is pretty well positioned in this in this event. I think a lot of the top decks like Icelander and Dromai and Bravo, he plays pretty well into. Uh, so if he if some of these Reinar players out there can get past the draft portion, I think they actually have a reasonable spot. Uh, to get into top eight, so we'll have to see. But overall, I think the meta uh, post Lexi is in a really cool spot. There's a lot of cool different decks that can be played, and I'm really excited to see who shows up. It's a grind of an event, lots of regular rounds, lots of draft rounds, have to have a lot of different skill sets, so really excited to see that. But yeah, sit back, relax, enjoy the event, enjoy the world's experience, and again, thank you so much for being a positive influence and a positive light in this game. Please support all the players to the best of your ability. Show some good sportsmanship in chat, and I'll see y'all in the games. Thank y'all so much. Hey everyone, it's Bagel TCG. I hope you're all really enjoying the World Championship. I'm super excited for this event. I think it's probably the best meta Flesh and Blood has ever had, but I do think the best deck in this meta is Icelander. I make high-level strategy content over on Bagel TCG, so you can go check out my thoughts there, but I think Icelander is probably the best position deck for this event. And uh, since Hamilton is the king of Icelander, I think he's going to take home his second world championship two in a row. Michael Hamilton is my call to win this whole event. So let's check out how that call pans out, but enjoy the event. Thanks for watching. What's up, everybody? It's T from the Librarians of Solana podcast. I wanted to hop on here and wish the best of luck to everyone traveling to and participating in the world championship this weekend in Barcelona. Good luck to everyone involved. Make sure you have fun, but especially good luck to my teammates, Matthew W., Matthew McInnes, Matthew Folks, and Jacob Baugh. Take it home, boys.
And welcome back to the booth here at round 12 of the World Championships of Flesh and Blood. I am Brian Gottlieb. I am joined by Nusen Zhang, making a rare appearance in the booth. He thinks he's too good to hang out with us, but I drag him in here because we have his favorite hero with us. We have Fi this round also taking on a Reinar. So a banger of a matchup. Both these players sitting at, I believe, eight and two, or excuse me, nine, nine and two, and two right yep. now. So very much in striking distance for that top eight berth. This isn't a nonsense match. This is a real match, and it's Reinar versus Fi. And why don't we go ahead and take a look at those standings to understand exactly how these final rounds of the tournament are starting to come together. And the biggest thing to happen over this last round, Yuki Lee Bender picked up her 11th win. That's a lock, Newson. That's a virtual yeah. lock. It seems like Yuki Lee is going to be our first top eight competitor Congra here at the World Championships. Congratulations to her. Deserves 11-0. Pretty incredible start. Ace the draft as well, yeah, yeah. right? 6-0 in draft. So, so impressive. Uh, drafting Dash both times, playing beautifully thus far today. Still a long way to go to claim that title of World Championships. But it looks like Yuki Lee Bender going to go ahead and occupy one of those top eight slots here at Worlds. Then you see, close behind Yuki, two more Icelanders. So, uh, Shing Sang and Chu Heng Yang, both in range, again, of putting more Icelanders in that top eight. It yep. could be a frosty frosty occurrence for our world's top eight but but you go from there and the icelanders actually get really sparse so while the top of, the very tippy top of the tournament is being dominated by icelanders right now it seems like there's a lot of room for other heroes to still punch their tickets including things like Fi. two different excuse me three different players on Fi sitting at nine points right now we have a reinar at nine part points in the hands of pedro ugioni coming from brazil so brazil Ooh. making a very strong showing here at this world championship. Newson, anything else on this uh, collection of players and heroes that's really standing out to you right now? Don't forget that Doran deck on sixth place, yeah. nine points. That's Decimator Great Axe Dorinthia, yeah. by the way. So Fatigue Dorinthia sitting in sixth place right now at the world championships. We're going to see if that becomes a real deck moving forward. I want to catch Dario Veneri over there from Switzerland, 17th place, sitting on eight wins right now, but a dash IO. Still in striking distance. We have a Leviya in striking yeah. distance as well, uh, coming from Poland. So all these heroes still in range of claiming one of these top eight berths. It could be one of the wildest top eights we've ever seen here in Flesh and Blood. It could be. It's such, such a variety of heroes, right? It's like six or seven different heroes. Covering a lot of In the bases. top 24 at the moment. Yeah. You know, we have noble players like Dagan White, Pudding Tam, you know, all these top level players. They're used to the stage. Just for, they need to play three more rounds, keep their head focused, and then top eight. That's what it's about, Newson. You have to zone in on your games. You need to not be distracted by the noise of world championships. You just need to play good flesh and blood. A couple other players I want to highlight in this top 24 right now. Cody Williams. Cody Williams has been on the verge of a breakthrough for what feels like forever. Just always in contention, always very late. Well-respected player over in America. Just hasn't quite gotten to punch his ticket to the big dance. Maybe this is the moment for Cody Williams. Right, funny story. My friend, he played Cody Williams round one, and he beat Cody Williams. So Cody Williams actually Bounce lost back. round one to a Katsu, which was my friend. And then uh, now he's back at nine points on 14th place. Just two wins from securing his split. Securing his place in the top eight. Impressive stuff. You need that type of fortitude if you're yeah. going to make a run at the top eight here at Worlds. Uh, you know, another hero worth highlighting, Katsu. Yeah. Katsu kind of having a big resurgence alongside Fire. It is those two ninja brethren really showing their stuff. We just saw Alex Lowe uh, put on quite a nice performance on Katsu. Really found the right pieces at the right time to take down Yudo Suzuki on Dorinthia. Yudo, of course, still in striking distance. And I think that's a big deal for Japan to really make their presence felt here on the world stage for the first time. Yep, 100%. That's th like, mostly the Hong Kong players are doing really well at the moment. You know, we see... Shang, Pudding, and even uh, Kelvin. Kelvin Law, yeah, yeah also they're striking distance. All, all, all striking distance as well. But then some Americans too. And then just a lot of Europeans, to be honest. Yeah, and, it, uh, it's a really beautiful spread, and it really encapsulates how much of a global game flesh and blood has become. I want to talk a little bit about the matchup we are going to be watching, though, as I mentioned. <laughs> it is Reinar versus Fight. Let's kind of analyze some of the key cards in this matchup, Newson, for Fi, we're really looking for these big explosive turns, and they do come from things like Art of War, Lava Burst, and maybe Mask of Momentum, and that's kind of our first interesting strategic point to address in this matchup, Newson. I know you're a huge Fi fan, and there's kind of two schools of Fi. There's 
Harmonized Kodachi Phi, their Searing Ember Blade Phi, and which mask you choose very much hinges on those weapons. But in this case, our Phi player has access to both and really has their choice. If you're taking on a Reinar, which way are you leaning? Because Reinars can be very defensive. Maybe you do want that yeah. longer, slower game. Or do you think Mask is just the setup for Dromai at this point? I think Mask is mostly for the setup for Dromai and decks that don't like to block. Whereas if you're versing Rhino, you know they block. All, all their cards block for free. Um, they run defense reactions. So Mask and Momentum, a low chance that will hit. Mask and Pouncing Lens will probably be a more suitable uh, solution for the hit slot. But I do believe they will also play the harmonized Kodachis with it as well. Just that chip damage that gets there. I think it's going to be a long game. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And I want to say I love the way this fire is built. Using a lot of space on equipment pieces, which I think is a really cool evolution for Fi. I think you sideboard very little as Fi, and what you actually want to do is maximize for things like this scenario, where you need to be prepared for something like a Dromai. Meanwhile, on the Reinar side, it's just good, classic Reinar gameplay. We're looking to intimidate, we're looking to defend, and then we're looking to get to the point where our <laughs> Blood Rush Bellows can push out that absurd amount of damage. Yeah, so Blood, blood Rush Bellow is one of the most powerful cards in the Rhino deck, right? You know. I think it's in the game. In, in the, the game? game of Flesh right. Absolutely. I'm the ability to, to do 18 damage or even 20 damage is really good. And you have three copies of that in your deck. So I think the Rhino's plan is mostly just they'll probably be defending a lot and then just a lot of making trades. Set up that Blood Rush fellow. Wait till Fire gets a mediocre turn, you know. Less, less on hits like with, without snatches, Command and Conquers, anything like that. And just go off with the Blood Rush Bellow. I think you're exactly right, Newson. And the whole game plan is going to be get into the range of Reckless Swing. Find that final two surprise damage. And of course, the Fi is going to be wanting, around, wanting to play around that. At some point, it just comes impossible, though. Reiner does push enough damage to make things uncomfortable. And there you see Pedro Ogioni shaking his hands in anticipation. Ready to play in the feature match area. Ready to represent his home country of Brazil. Taking on Daniel Fratarelli on Fi. And there you see the setup, Newson. It is going to be Searing Ember uh. Blade and Mask of the Pouncing Lynx. So no Kadachis here, just going with a kind of traditional Fi approach. Flamescale Furnace, Tiger Stripe Shuko, Snapdragon Scalers to round out the set. Yeah, so an interesting card to watch out for is when uh, Pedro would decide to use Scaling Fleshbag uh, on, on Fi, the ability to rip a card out of Fi's hand is huge. It really determines if you can get to Chain Link 4 or not by losing that one card. Yeah, I think Skyline Fleshback was a huge tool for Reinar, a huge pickup. Yeah. Really changed the way the hero plays, gave that little bit of defensive oomph you needed to disrupt key turns as Reinar. And you've seen Brute players really start to shine since the printing of that card. Reinar, sort of a long-suffering hero, not really having oh. broken through yet, but I think Reinar's time is absolutely coming. And here you see a sensor <laughs> defended by a sensor, just a very common play that we see all the time. Hold the line, defense reaction to the last card played there. Not in effect in this instance, but this is a great matchup for that card. Newsletter. Yeah, but I don't think Pedro would want to see it. You really want to surprise your opponent with that card when they're out of the war. You know, the ability to uh, block for two and prevent the next three damage is quite huge against fight. Fair enough. Yeah, I, th I think that can absolutely steal the tempo back on Pedro's side in the right scenario. So a well-defended first salvo there from Pedro. Going to lead off with a pulping for the first offensive blows coming from the Reinar. Yeah, pulping super solid. You know the fire's not going to be running defense reactions against Reinar. But, you know. So this pulping most likely is going to gain the dominate and gain go again. Yeah, an annoying card for Fies to deal with for sure. And this is how Reinar can really get ahead is just... Find those awkward blocks. And if you're Fi, you just want to say, send me the bill. You really don't even <laughs> want to participate in this game whatsoever. You want to push damage. Pulping means you're, you're really at a loss for ways to interact with this card. You're letting the Reinar do their thing, get action points, which can be challenging for Reinar if you're not hot on your scabskin leather rolls. Yep. <clears throat> so this pulping just enables them to play another six power attack or just pitch a blue, attack with his two cores. So minimum six damage coming after this depending on Pedro's head. Yeah, it looks pretty good for Pedro. And as Ooh. we expected, Fredarelli just taking the bill here. But here's another annoying on hit. It is time for a race face, Newson. And this is a card I think has really fallen out of favor a little bit. When it first came out uh, in Uprising, was in every deck list. You don't see it as often anymore. Here's a really nice spot for it, though. I think this, I think this guy has um, 
come back a lot of resurgence in this world championship just because of how dominant Dromai, Icelander, uh, all, all these class dependent cards, all these is um, doing. So race face really good. It's just sort of like a command conquer against certain decks, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, sometimes more devastating, and it's going to mess with the Phoenix Flames. It's going to mess with the Searing Ember Blade. It's just an awkward card for Daniel to play around, and uh, you see kind of a troubled look on his face. Like, this is a like this is probably a must-block against, against Fire, honestly. It's just, you can't really do what you want to do when, when you get hit by a race face. You yeah. Can't, I, okay. I agree 100%, Newson. And you see Stab Wound being committed to defense here, but that is three damage leaking over. A race face is on. Let's see how it impacts the turn as we pass things back over to Danielle. All right, so Danielle is a race face at the moment. Maybe it's a Lightning Strike or a Command and Conquer just to set up and just disrupt. Yeah, this is a fine start. Ronin Renegade okay. not affected here. Can we produce that wide turn that Phi loves? It's not going to be an explosive turn. What do you think about the choice of flame, flame scale Furnace in this matchup, Nusen? Any consideration to Spring Tunic? I will tell you, I've been playing Ooh. a lot of Phi lately. My opinion on the chess slot has totally changed. I'm a Tunic believer. I want Tunic in actual every matchup at this point, and I'm not exaggerating. I always, always, always want Tunic. I play in a very aggressive way, uh, and I think it just really pushes your game plan into the next level. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel about Furnace instead of Tunic here? Um, honestly, I think against Rhino, where you're trying, or well, you're trying to race, race for damage, right? Furnace is a card that could be able to defend for free, especially when he's playing Master of the Pouncing Links. If he was playing Master of Momentum, that card can still block for two, but w but he wants to use Master of Pouncing Links to use for the ability to grab a two cost on there. So that's two battle one gone. So uh, fair if, enough. If he plays Tunic, he. That's only one battle one for, uh, whereas Flamestone Furnace is three battle one. Yeah, giving up some block value for sure, but that output you get from that one resource can be so, so massive in so many scenarios. We'll see how it plays out as the matchup goes on. And look, Daniel sitting here at 9-2 and two at Worlds. Let's trust him. Don't listen to what I have to say. I'm just an <laughs> idiot caster. I'm sure he's got this one figured out. Going to take a skull crack here. And again, Daniel saying, just send me the bill. And Newson, these life totals are getting very, very disparate very quickly. Yep, so I think this is Daniel's turn to shine, I think. He, he's, 15, he's 15 life short. He's got five cards in hand. Let's see what he can work with. Probably an Art of War, maybe? Could be. Leading things off with just a brand with Cinderclaw Blue, Blue here. So only one damage coming through. There are quite cool cards that, that, um, that Daniel is playing, like the Red Burning Fawns. But here's a double strike. So looking to go pretty wide on this turn. Of course, you really want to pair those double strikes up with any kind of anthem effect. Not happening here. So just two just damage being offered here. Buffed from that Tiger Stripe Shuko, of course. It's just really, really like chip damage at the moment, right? Just what, tech for one, tech for two, tech for one. You really want, you really want to see those threes and fours. Yeah, I, I like <laughs> the chip damage plan as Fi. I do think it's important in how you get through Reinar. Problem is this Reiner has done a lot of damage early, and that means you're kind of on a clock to start presenting some real number output. Searing right. Ember Blade, next we'll play here. Clean block. Yeah, we, might, we might see a Lava Burst this turn, Brian. It's looking like it, to be I, honest. I think there may be one in Arsenal Noose, so it's possible that is just queued up, ready to go. Going to go ahead and activate Fi's Hero ability, get that Phoenix Flame back. Another one. Chip, 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 chip. chip. <laughs> All day. Yeah, so I think the Rhino player, see, he's just happy to wait for Blood Rush Bellow. He's just wait, happy to block with, two, block with two cards and just send send six to him. Each turn, five most likely will take it. Just six vanilla damage instead of any on hits, right? So, five will be, five will be pretty easy to take damage because five usually likes to play with four or five guard hands. That's where the explosive damage comes from, right? Like, two... Four card five hands versus three or two card five hands. Really hard to deal with. And I think we're sorting out a little bit of a judge issue here. Possibly, yeah, a mis mispaid for yeah. fi ability. It Only should... two Draconic Chain Links at the point it was activated. So we are going to take that no, last no, it, resource. It should be free. That double strike did gain Draconic from that brand from the first Chain Link. So 
Okay. Right? So it was went brown, double strike, serial blade. That's three draconic chain links. Yeah, I think you're correct, Noose. And I, I'm not sure how that actually got resolved. We will go ahead and try and get a runner down there just to make sure it is being appropriately dealt with. So players just trying to get this sorted out right now. Doing some counting. You see a lot of finger pointing going on. A lot of chip damage was turned around. Brian was like one, two, one, one, one. So just yep. working out lap totals. Every damage counts in this matchup. You want to you want to get everything right. Oh, one hundred percent, one hundred percent, and it's critical for the integrity of the matchup as well. From the judge here the way it goes the double strike is no longer on the combat chain once it is banished and you actually want to check for draconic chain links you have to go ahead and see that they are being appropriately represented on the combat chain so it was correctly dealt with no resources floating here oh really oh that's learn something new every day yeah that is the word we were getting from the judge staff and i appreciate their clarification i honestly did not know that, Newson. Yeah, me too. That's why I, that's why I was thinking, oh, that, that double strike was draconic. You know, Brad. So, so far, I've questioned Danielle's equipment choice. He's obviously much better than I am. That's pretty foolish. Question a judge ruling. They're obviously much smarter than I am. Pretty foolish. I'm just going to sit here and silence the rest of the match, Newson. I have nothing else to offer. <laughs> Every, everyone around me knows what they're doing better than I do. Just let them do their thing. Yeah, 100%. Right now, Danielle's thing is more chip damage. That double strike coming back for an additional chain link. As you mentioned, it does feel like we're heading towards a crescendo here for Danielle. And I, I wonder if there's yeah. maybe an opportunity for Lava Burst as well as Mask acti Activation here in Newson. Do we want to go and get something like Salt the Wound, use our Snapdragon Scalers? Is this a spot where you really do have to push that level of damage? This is a spot where Pedro will most likely want to defend. If he wants to... Because he does he sees the snapdragon scalers he sees the mask of pouncing wings he knows that more damage is pot potentially coming if he does not fully block this as well as Daniel might ha be able to just might have another lava burst or an, or some card like snatch to go with the snapdragon scalers yeah. after right yeah it's a, it's a real threat here for uh pedro you have to figure out exactly what your opponent is looking to do here and if you're in Danielle's seat, you hold all the cards because you can just arsenal that card. And mm. you, maybe you make Pedro commit more cards than he wanted to on this particular turn. And I think we are seeing a bit of hesitation from Pedro really trying to figure this one out. This is an important blocking decision. Needs to get this one right. Going to commit the Scabskin Leathers here. And that is it for the time being. And this is a beautiful bait from Pedro. Yep. He's taken the initiative back and passed the decision back to Danielle because we know... Pedro does have a defense reaction at the ready and can fully cover this up should Daniel go ahead and commit those Snapdragon Scouts. Oh. He is going to do it, and that is going to spur the defense reaction with the quickness from Pedro. Beautifully played there to go ahead and get a little extra value. What that means is the Snapdragons, go ahead, give, go again, Let's and go. it is the Snatch at the end. So kind of a little gamesmanship there. There was a counter to the counter, but Daniel had the alternative play to really not get punished to the max Ooh. by that defense reaction. But here's a second defense reaction and a beautifully covered up turn from Pedro there. That is what good defense looks like, Newsom. And two cards left for Pedro. Going to be able to come back with some offense of his own as well. Yeah, that was that was huge. You know, making him burn the Snapdragon scales, not being able to do any damage. He only dealt five damage that turn, Brian. Yeah, really, really well defended from Pedro. Good decisions all around. And is going to be really happy with a virtual win on that turn. No arsenal for Danielle going into the next turn. Uh, no real benefit from that turn short of five damage, which given the position the Reinar is in, fine. I'm happy to take five damage at this stage of the game. Because he knows he's going to send six back. The five player most likely is going to take this, yep. dropping on the 19. The life, and the life difference is starting to become quite a big difference. Yeah, and we get to the point where you start having to worry about reckless swing coming to the party and it's it's all over from there if it happens this early in the game 
So, Danielle, really going to have to find some offense over the next few turns. Looking for that first big Art of War turn. Something that really shows off Fi's ability to produce that explosive damage out of nowhere. Oh, 100%, Brian, 100%. Uh, well, he does run kind of explosive cards too, like, you know, the Spreading Flames, the yeah. Burning Fawns. Oh, you know, they're they're that coming at some point. Pump. Yeah, they're coming. This is going to go with a little half defense here. Starting to preserve some life total. Soul Bead Strike going to be committed to the defensive side. Yeah, now, now, now Daniel knows that Pedro has no arsenal. Nope, there's no... So, there's no more defense reactions up there. Three cards. Usually, three cards is usually... Three card fire hands is usually around 10 plus damage. So, just happy to take the trade, block block it out a little bit. <clears throat> it just feels like there's this moment coming for Pedro, though. You find that first Blood Rush Bellows, and, you know, you take a little damage on a turn, and you're just going to offer maybe 22 on the spot, <laughs> that you have that kind of offensive output if your cards line up correctly. Yep. Yeah, 100%. The fact that he's already on 22 and without seeing a Blood Rush Bellow as well. Really and, scary. And Pedro maintaining his life to 32 is quite, quite, a, quite impressive. I actually think this shows off really well why, oh, okay. why I believe Reinhardt was an excellent choice for this tournament. You are well positioned against decks like Dromai where you're popper rich and able to punish them consistently. Uh, and you have really good matchups against things like Five, These aggro decks that are coming to prey uh, on the Dromais, you've closed off that entire section of the metagame. You know, maybe there's still a tough Icelander matchup on the docket, but look, everyone has a tough Icelander matchup. I think this is a very savvy choice by Pedro to bring Reinhardt to this World Championship. 100%. Here's another race face. M another two cards must block or you're not having a really great fight turn. Yeah, we saw this do a number on Danielle previously, really blunted some of the aggression. And once again, a race face coming down. Looking to steal some of Danielle's thunder. And this is the first time Danielle has played a five-card hand in a while, too. So you have the feeling of setting up for something big here. Erase Face says, oh. no, sir. And it is time for a sizable piece of equipment to be committed. A Knight and Strike, Tiger Stripe Shuko, and Flamescale Furnace all being committed to the defense here. Yeah. Bit of an overblock. That's quite, that's quite early to throw, throw away the Tiger Strike Shuko. The, the more turns it lasts, the more, more one damage it deals. But... I think Daniel's just saying, I can't wait anymore. I yeah, need to do damage. Yeah, he's got to press the issue. And you do see Mounting Anger coming down to start off the combat chain. Critical four breakpoint. We know Pedro does have another defense reaction at the ready. Yeah, Moves it go. forward. Sink below. Committed to the defense here. Will nice see clean an cover. Ancestral Empowerment? That will be huge. What's the Ancestral Empowerment count here? Do we have access? Oh, there are yeah, several there in the deck. Okay, so... Not going to happen here. It is just going to be Blaze Headlong. Offering four damage. A little bit of go again. So, uh, you know, a nice start to the turn. Two four power attacks. This one, Pedro, just going to accept. No real risk here. Vanilla damage. Ember Blade. Next up. Expect Phoenix Flame to get involved in this chain as well. Clean block on the Ember Blade. Now it's time for Fi. Back comes the Phoenix Flame. I wonder when uh, Daniel's going to choose to... Now, hold on. That, <laughs> I, I hesitate. Can that Phoenix Fame be brought back? Isn't this the Erase Face turn? No, he, he blocked it out, remember? He, 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 used, he committed yeah, the equipment. He committed like, a, now he I'm gun-shy, no, no, I'm, no. I'm afraid of, uh, of, of missing something on the Phoenix Flame. So that was a clean Phoenix Flame, and yeah. that is exactly why willing to commit the defense on this turn. And this is a nice turn. This is a really well-put-together turn, having yeah. lost a card from hand. Good damage output. Life totals start to look a little bit equalized. It is equal. 22 Reinhardt all falling yeah. down to 22. But Fi has given up basically most of his equipment. I don't think he's going to be blocking all that basket pouncing links in the remainder of the game. It's just no. we need the size. When he chooses to use it, sometimes you don't want to you don't want to destroy it too early because your opponent's just going to block it block out the whole turn. You, you really got to find your moments. Right, Brian? I think that's what Fi is all about. Just picking your spots, finding your moments. Sort of treading water. Much like Reinar does, but in a very different way. You tread water with offense. You look to produce enough output every single turn of the game to make your opponent uncomfortable. Whereas Reinar looks to produce enough defense to find the power cards. Yeah, and Pedro is probably wondering, where is my Blood Rush Bellows? It's, you know, it's turn 5, turn, turn 6. I've seen so many cards... He really needs it. That's why he's probably having a good think right now of what, what he wants to do this turn. Sometimes, though, Noose, when I'm 
playing a deck like Reinar and I'm in this position where I haven't seen these power cards thus far, I actually feel better. I know that I'm coming up to some powerful turns in just a little while that will be able to put my opponent to the test. And we kind of saw this in our last match that we covered uh, on day one in round one with Michael Hamilton not drawing pummels for the entirety of the early game and then firing off a double pummel turn, closing the game eventually with another pummel. Just had it all lined up for the late game. And Pedro's going to find himself in a Ooh. similar position. Cadaverous Contraband coming through for Pedro, usually used in this matchup to rebuy something like Blood Rush Bellows. Uh, just going to offer six here. Kind of vanilla-ish, I think, without a power card in the graveyard. But you'll happily get back a six or uh, some other card that you can use in this scenario. I'm shocked that that's this. he left this in the matchup, to be honest, Brian. It's just... Does point to some aggression, right? Yeah, but I don't think he has anything apart from, like, barraging beatdowns. And I, I don't, I'm not sure he's played one yet. This might, this might yeah. be literal vanilla damage at this point. <coughs> oh, yeah. <coughs> and Daniel happy to accept vanilla damage. No problem for a fi in this scenario. And so a bit of an off turn from Pedro. No disruption there. Oh. Four card hand for fi. Starting thing off with Mounting Anger. Not bad. And a blue pitch. So resource is going to be available throughout the turn as well. We see Pedro has drawn the Blood Rush below. I believe this turn will be a Scaling Flashback turn, trying to slow down the fire, take as yep. less damage as possible, and fire it back with Blood Rush below. Agree 100%, Noosa. And also, that Tunic's going to be ticking up to three on the next turn. Everything's oh, lining up. Yep, you throw the Scaling Flashback here, you blunt Danielle's offense on a turn where you know an Anthem is available, and you come back with your own Blood Rush Bellows. But it looks like Pedro may have other ideas here, starting to pull a card forward for defense. Let's see how he wants to play this one. Going to oh. defend with the Blood Rush Bellow. Interesting. Maybe one's in his arsenal already? It's a possibility. But that, 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 was a big, that was a block that we did not expect. Yeah, it is a possibility that we're heading into the next turn with Blood Rush Arsenal. We'll see how this plays out. And Sound Flashback such a powerful headpiece equipment for Rhino. Like, the potential that that headpiece could have stopped is like probably five or more damage Possibly. Yeah, I, I think this is the card that made this hero real in this metagame. If it were not for Scowling Fleshback, I do think Reinar would just be a little soft to uh, Disruption. And yep. yeah, I, that, taking this snatch here really points to the fact that Pedro probably has another Blood Rush Bellow ready in Arsenal. Oh, uh, and this, well, this snatch is, is really whatever, right? He gets the act intimidated card, he has two cards, and most important, he's used to snap drain skills. He cannot give yep. that snatch go again. Can't give it go again, so it's a very safe let go here from Pedro. There is the tunic ticking up to three. All right, let's see what that card is. Oh, he had arsenal. two blood rush colors, Brian. Two. It's so easy, so easy for Pedro. Is going to get the pitch. There's the discard of the pulping. Had to block with that blood, blood rush spell. Guarantee success on right. this discard. We so need to see a now. blue, and we need to see a big attack from these two cards. For, Let's see for what the Pedro. pickup is. Yeah, you saw a little lucky rub there oh, from Pedro. I think that was a sink. Below. Not what Pedro was looking for here. What is going to be the output on this turn? Can he still cobble together a nice one? It is going to be Mandible Claws. Starting and things off. Looks like a pack, pack hunt in hand as well. Pack hunt sink below. So two reds. Yeah, out of resources now. And I wonder what that card is in Arsenal. Is Pedro going to be able to find, uh, you know, maybe a nice on hit here? some swing big could be good yeah swing big yeah. would be nice swing big for 10 you know absolutely i would take that if i was in pedro's seat but <laughs> things certainly could have gone a little better on the first blood rush bellows of the game and we know only one more left in the deck having defended with a blood rush bellows as well there are things like cadaverous contraband which we do know is present in this matchup uh you know remembrance i don't think so but may maybe there's ways to go ahead and blood rush bellow again or maybe for pedro you're just saying I think I'm fine. Like, I, I, I'm just offering enough damage here. I have my opponent at a low enough life total. We're going to get them into reckless swing range eventually. I think you really have to fade that Art of War turn coming anytime soon. That's what you're afraid of if you're in Pedro's seat. We still haven't seen that mass output explosive turn from Fi. Something like that could really put Pedro in a grinder, especially with Mask of the Pouncing Link still available. Yeah, and Daniel, the most beautiful thing is Daniel doesn't know what's coming next. He doesn't know if he drew the blue for the second man of course. He doesn't know... He drew two reds, you know, this, the, t the Blood Rush Bellow turns can be, it can be so mysterious, you know, it could be either 18 damage or it can just be like 13 damage. Yep. And you, have, you, can, you, have you have can't no expect to know, to know that kind of damage with the first mandible claw attack. Yeah, and you see Danielle reaching for defensive cards here. So worried a little bit about the output and that makes sense. If you think about the average output of 
a Blood Rush Bellows turn in this spot, you could say, well, maybe he has enough to put me down to two, and then I'm in reckless swing range, which is absolutely where I do not want to be. So I understand the fear. Commanding oh, okay. Conqueror is the follow-up oh, here. That's... Not going to get buffed by the Blood Rush Bellows, critically. This card is so annoying in Spy. No, as, as a Spy player, when I see Command Conqueror, it makes me kind of... It makes me kind of feel kind of sick. It's yeah. just, you don't have your Crown of Providence, because you, you're, you're playing both marks. Most of your cards do block for two. Yep. So a, a wild time Command and Conquer on a hand that doesn't have money free blocks can demand free cards if one of your arsenal cards is a power card. Yeah, look, as Fi, anything that takes you off that five card hand once you've arsenaled, you're pretty upset about. Yeah. You, you really are playing towards those turns. And I think this was a pretty criti critical juncture to have disruption if you're Pedro. Your Blood Rush Bellow turn didn't really turn out enough damage to actually put life total uh in threat on this turn and that means you are at risk of danielle just going off but saying i can afford to give up oh. my arsenal here it was uh just a starter so bren with cinder claw you would have liked to have that for the turn <laughs> but let's see what danielle can put together on the back of a four card hand pedro at 15 life danielle at a somewhat precarious five not many more turns left in this game noose yeah i think this the, this is probably danielle's one of danielle's last turns right either he, he pumps out the damage or he doesn't but Luckily for Pedro, he did find a sink below in, in that Blood Rush Fellow hand. So that is another card available for him to defend with. Yeah, we know we have that in Arsenal. There's the second double, double strike coming down. Oh, we see a reckless swing as well. So these double strikes, they do matter. That dice is showing how many times the card is hit. So we, potentially, we can see Assault the Wound. Off yeah. the Mask of Pouncing Links. Damage output could be there on this turn. Good defensive options available for Pedro. Choosing to take some damage here. Let's see if he finds his window to get full value out of those four blocks that his hand is absolutely loaded with right now. Pedro really thinking. I think he's probably thinking if he wants to commit the last last piece of armor on the Scab Skin Livers to block this out. To avoid one damage, to avoid one hit from the salt, possibly salt the wound. It's an interesting decision, and Pedro has been very thoughtful about these things. Thus far, has reached the right conclusion seemingly every time. Very yeah. pensive look on his face. Okay. Ah, the decision was on Danielle. Going to go ahead and crack the mask here. Says this is the time. Probably looking for oh, Lava Burst. Okay. Yeah, taking the consistent damage here. So we're probably going to see a hit jet uh, so, uh, starter with go again into the Searing Ember Blade. Into the Phoenix Flame, into the Lava Burst, most likely. Seems like a very reasonable progression here. But is that, that enough? Is news? that 13 damage? I don't think so. I, I think it's light, too. Let's see. Oh, oh no, Mounting no. Anger. Okay, this, this is a little bit of a game changer here. But we do know he has that sink below in the Arsenal. But there is also a possibility that there is that last card is Ancestral Empowerment. Sink below. Looks to be getting the clean defense here. Probably sinking the reckless swing because you don't want to use two cards to block before. Okay. Yeah, here's the Ember Blade. And I think if you're in Pedro's you're spot, so you're, happy. you're very happy with how this turn has played out. This has gone completely fine. There was some risk here, but I think this is just going to be covered up very, very nicely. Ronin Renegade. Uh, look, this is fine output from Phi. This is not a bad turn by any stretch of the imagination, but I think Danielle needed something special here. <laughs> And Phoenix Flame for one, ending with Lava Burst. It's only six more damage. That does not bring Pedro into lethal range. Doesn't bring him into any threat of being, quote-unquote, Kadachi locked by something like a Phoenix Flame. It's just going to take another clean three block here. Falls to a comfortable six, I would say, with two cards left in hand. Almost certainly going to demand a card from Danielle every single turn of the game from this point. A hundred percent. And I don't think Danielle will be... Block it. We'll, we'll, we'll just probably commit one card and just play with three cards. He cannot, he cannot, he cannot afford to block with two cards. I think you're exactly point. right. And there is one point of defense left on that flame scale furnace over on Pedro's side. We are looking at two points of defense: no. one from the tunic, one from the scabskin leathers, which have not been rolled Ooh, yet. Barraging beatdown as well. You know, barraging beatdown into a mandible claws that demands two cards. It's pretty good. You can't just shove your armor in it. Yeah, pretty good if you're in Pedro's spot. Let's see what he wants to do with the turn. Oh. Yeah, just Mandible Claw. Just mandible. Oh, okay, okay, so that means Danielle looks to have a chance here at another four-card hand. The problem, though, Noose... Oh, I know what you're going to say. ...is that you fall to two. And that's never where you want to be against Reinar. No, this, this is probably the Flame Scale Furnace block. Okay, you know, yeah, yeah. Three. that's good. Yeah, you don't, you don't want to go to two, but you can go to three. Yep. 
I think that's a completely reasonable response oh. here. So, Pedro, not. I wonder what that last card Pedro's hand is. Probably maybe another defense card or a card that doesn't block. But if it's a card that doesn't block, he does have a blue card to things. So, it's really strange what he might have. The mystery of the arsenal will persist into the next turn. Oh, maybe it's that reckless swing that we saw earlier if he didn't sink below it. Turn passes back to oh, Danielle. Just, Things this, getting this very close. Coming, yeah. Yeah, I think Danielle got exactly what he wanted out of that turn. But me and you did not expect just the mandible claws. We expected a six power attack. Searing Strike going to be the starter here. Is this the moment where Dan Danielle can finally find the Art of War? Push through some breakpoints, make things a oh. little vulnerable. And it is finally the first Art of War of the match for Danielle. And at a huge, huge moment, this is the chance. This is the possibility of snatching victory from the jaws of defeat for Danielle Frederelli. What, what a perfect title draw out of war. The game's so close right now, three to seven. And you finally see your first out of war. This this turn might be this turn might be massive, Brian. And if you're if you're Pedro, you had to know it was coming at some point. This is just gonna go ahead, leak that damage. Now we get potentially even more output. Yeah. So that thing, that soaring strike warhead. But I don't think the bullet is useful at the moment. Yeah, no relevance there. Searing Ember Blade coming down. Three damage represented. Still two resources floating. Oh, okay. So this. Oh no! Time for hold the line. The, line. the <laughs> perfect card for the scenario. And Danielle is reading it. Not oh, going to gosh. like what he finds here. Just a critical, critical draw from Pedro in this moment. Has that prevention shield floating now, and some of the wind absolutely taken out of Fi's sails on this turn. Yeah, that prevailing two will prevent that Phoenix Flame. That two damage. That's a huge deal given where these life totals are at. And it's going to pay a resource to get back the Phoenix Flame. Comes down. Gets eaten up by that Prevention Shield. Should be two. It is two. Yeah. Under Art of War. Yep. Full yeah. Prevention Shield. Eaten. One card left in hand for Danielle. Can he get a little more offense? Salt the Wound. Lava Burst. Or is it just another Arsenal Snatch. card? Oh. It is Salt. Okay. But he has blocked quite a lot. I don't think anything... Yeah, it's, it's not a great salt, honestly. I think it's four, if I'm counting correctly. Only, only Soaring Strike is hit, right? Yeah, I believe yeah. so. So Pedro can just happily block this out. Or oh! He could take it, Noose. He could go ahead and take it. Yeah. And that means some offensive fireworks likely to come back Danielle's way. What a back-and-forth match we've had over these last few turns. Every time one of these players looks to have cemented an advantage... The other player seems to have the counter punch. Well, Brian, I think a pulping just seals this game, right? Could do it, Noose. Could absolutely do it. It's going to be sensor, though, the play. Okay. Just offering five here. Is this sensor? This is two. This is demanding two cards. That's big. That's big. Five's damage output is going to go down quite a bit. That's such a great spot. You know, the sensor... Sure, I can put a free block and go to one, but you can't go to one against Rhino. You have to be fair of Reckless Swing. But when you, you know what, though, Noose? Sometimes you don't have the choice of yeah. playing around Reckless Swing. You were just committed to going ahead and putting yourself out there. And I wonder if that's what Danielle has to think about right now. Do you have to leave yourself vulnerable to that Reckless Swing? You say, and that, look, counting the graveyard, I guarantee this is what he's thinking about. He says, if you have it, you have it. If you don't have it, I can't beat you anyway if I give you two cards. That's what you have to be ever so aware of is what is my actual opportunity to win the game you cannot play not to lose the game you have to play to win the game yeah you just have to you have, you have to take these risks right let's see if danielle thinks this is the time to leave himself vulnerable to something like a reckless swing and that arsenal card been floating for a couple turns now noose i i wonder i wonder if it's already rolled up in there oh this is uh this is a critical spot right Tense now for danielle moment. you know do round I play into 12, the reckless swing. Round twelve of the world championships, and you might have to gamble with your life against a Reinar on a reckless swing. Scary, scary spot to be in. But both players, they want to advance and go to ten two. You know, have that have that one loss available for the later rounds, just to guarantee that top eight. You you do not want to drop. 
Go, drop to X3 with two rounds remaining. No, winner here is life in over. prime position to punch their ticket to the top eight. Stakes could not be higher. It is going to be a defensive card. It's another hey, it's sensor, sensor blocking a sensor. This is just weird now. It doesn't mean anything. No importance to it, but it's weird. All right, we're going to, it's going down to one. If he has, if he has it, he has it. But I think that Arsenal is reckless. Swing. There's a very good chance, News. But I, I totally agree with the way Daniela approached this. You, you can't play around it forever. A two-card hand is not going to do anything to win this game. Produce damage and make your opponent have it. That's the only way you get out of this with your 10th win in your pocket. So it's probably going to be a starter into, into a pitch blue. Serial Blades in one. That's seven damage. It's not bad. Not bad. Not bad when Rhino's on two. Yeah, I could be pretty happy with that. D Danielle checking that graveyard again, saying, uh, there's still two of those left, aren't there? I yes, there are. Yes, there are, Danielle. Yeah. You need a little you... bit of luck to get through this one. What do you think about Sensor? Oh, C and C. C and C the play here. Oh, okay. that, that's a good... Yeah, that, that's great. I mean, you're not, you don't have to worry about Reckless Swing in this <laughs> case. So just offering six damage. It's going to demand two cards from the Rhino. Oh, you swing big. I wonder what that means about what's left in the hand. Left. Yeah, you asked about Sensor Noose, and I think it's a criminally underplayed card. I think there's so much opportunity for high-level play with that. Oh. oh, Double defense reaction from Pedro. And again, I feel like the tempo of the game has swung yet another time, possibly in Danielle's favor. Is that the reckless swing in Arsenal, though? I, I That's the question. Is there's nothing else it can be. I know. It makes so much sense for it to be the, the reckless swing. Pedro playing some mind games, maybe? Non-threatening Mandible Claw. Coming in for just three. I guess, though... If you have all blocks yeah, of two... Yeah. I was going to say, uh, it's five. It, it could actually be quite threatening. If this represents two cards from hand, that's a disaster for Danielle. In a world filled with disasters, such as Reckless Swing, such as Mandible Claw... Man, that, was, that might have been a close call for Pedro, you know? If he didn't draw... So, say you drew a pearl, two for for zines. That come out kind of kill, might have won him the game. Pretty scary. Pretty scary. He's yeah, honestly, drawn two fate for scenes. Maybe got away with one there. And did Pedro? Breathing a sign of relief. Pedro knows he's probably in the driving seat right now. You know, just just forcing a card. Probably has reckless. Most likely has reckless swing and in, in the arsenal. He does only play two. Okay. We've seen one. Pit. We've seen one pit. Yeah, we've seen one. We're not too sure if he sink below uh, to the bottom that turn. But I just can't tell what his answer can be if it's not Rift or Swing. You know, he's had the blue. He's had resources yeah, to play. He's been it. present for so many turns at this point. And you know Danielle knows that. It's, it's very clear when you're in these scenarios and you see that arsenal float for a few turns. You start to get a very good sense of what it could be as a high-level Flesh and Blood player. 100%. Really in the tank over this Mandible Claw. You understand why? I honestly think he drew four two blocks. <laughs> you know, if you drew your three block, you, you know, okay. It oh, is Command no. and Conquer committed to the block here, and now I understand what the trepidation was like, maybe thinking about just playing a Command and Conquer on the next turn, trying to dodge that Reckless Swing, but I think... Danielle keeps coming to the right conclusion. Playing scared doesn't get you anywhere. Instead, it's time for Art of War. Okay. All the marbles. Two cards drawn. They draw need to be good ones. He news. needs to draw blue and he needs to draw starter. They need to be real good ones. What has Danielle found? Is there offensive output on this turn? Can we get three chain links wide? Did we hit perfects? Okay. This is a starter. Start. Okay. Red right. starter, too. So break point being offered. All right. Yep. There we go. There's the reckless swing from Arsenal. Now it's time to go ahead and I'll accept just, uh, the fist bump. Go ahead and choose one. But we know what they all are. It is a six. Right. And that is going to get the W for Pedro. Wow. And our yeah. Reinar player moves on to 10 and 2 prime position to go ahead and potentially punch a ticket to the top eight. Yeah, honestly, what a great game. Pedro is showing that you play slowly, you ask him a reckless swing. He's going to take, he's going to go down to one, he's going to go down to two, and you just finish him off with the reckless swing. That command and conquer could have been quite scary, but 
Luckily for Pedro, he did. And it's so cool that Pedro's from Brazil, and Brazil's only had flesh and blood for him. Yeah. A year and a bit. And he's already at the World Championships, trying to make his mark on the world. Dude, another burgeoning market. This is back-to-back -back rounds where we've seen these places that are just finding their footing in flesh and blood. Uh, I, maybe it's time to take that disclaimer off of places like Brazil, like Japan. These are fully formed regions putting great players here into the World Championships. And potentially, can you imagine what it will mean for the Brazilian community to have a world champion of flesh and blood honestly, in their back pocket. Honestly, it'll be crazy. They are the Brazilians are so committed to this game. Yep. Yeah, you see endless passion coming from that region, and I, I love seeing folks getting out here and and playing at this high level. But Noose, what does it mean for this meta game if a Reiner is able to punch its ticket to the top eight? Where do the Icelanders fall in that matchup? How do they feel on just? having to face this menace that can produce these large chunks of damage out of nowhere but is also very comfortable shifting into those defensive roles uh honestly i think reiner has an okay game against lysander you know it's not like it's probably 50 50 the the way the ability to disrupt your opponent's hand you know Icelander likes to block a lot you know play the two cards hands yeah. but if you're reiner you're and you're stripping a card that is critical for their what a for ice fan turns or the or the attack for their uh, wounded ball they have to take some amount of damage. And with the, with the way Rhino is built now, they are playing a lot of blues and, and yellows, making Frostbite's not that effective. I agree. I agree. They've shifted to a very uh, resource-heavy direction, and I think that is going to pay big dividends as we move through the rest of this tournament. But I know you want to hear it from the man himself. We are going to bring in Pedro for an interview to hear about his epic win there on Reinar over Fi. Do not go anywhere. We'll be right back with more Flesh and Blood. Flake here with Pedro Gioni. Reinar fans just rejoice. This is why you play Reinar. And first thing, man, congratulations on an exciting win. Thank you, Flake. Yeah. It's a pleasure, man. Like, it's just, first of all, I just want to say, it's a pleasure to watch a Reinar with this kind of success. Yeah, like, Reinar is definitely an underdog when people think about Reinar. And uh, that's kind of one of the reasons that I play because uh, like I, I like to win but winning with Reiner is has uh, such flavor like yeah, it's called fear yeah. <laughs> that, that's the flavor that we have yeah. but you're doing it man on both sides of the table <laughs> playing as Reinar and receiving as as the opponent is just not very uh, comfortable but the pick seemed comfortable for you because you just were were you locked in on Reinar or you is that just your go-to deck here and what was the thought process selecting that deck into this meta? Yeah, I started playing the Nationals with Reinar. Uh I really wanted to uh enjoy the game, like not playing with the best deck. Uh so and my the, the Magilla meta had a lot of Dromai's Bravo uh dash, so 
I've, I thought that w would be a good spot for Reiner at that moment. And I qualified at, uh, at first for uh, during this race, the Nationals. And at that moment, I saw how Reiner was strong. Like I was testing before and getting good results, even against Lexi, that was the top meta. And yeah, I decided to just play to enjoy the game. I love the hero. Uh, and for words, definitely, uh, like the main goal was to here, come here to enjoy the event. Uh, I wasn't expecting getting this result. Uh, but you earned it. Yeah. <laughs> and you're here. And it's like I said, it's an exciting uh, thing to watch as well. It's it's not something that for the light of heart to bring Reinar to a tournament. There's a, a certain car that I want to bring up here that, um, uh, funny enough, both players registered, which was, uh, where is it? Which is Sensor. Both, both you and your opponent had Sensor in the deck. And I want to ask... The inclusion of that card. What are the? What is it like? The target, the number one target that you were looking to to basically single out when you're playing that de when you're playing that card. Yeah, Ryder has a lot of two cost cards, so usually you end up with one resource. Uh, so sensor fits perfect with this curve. Uh, I used this at Nets and the battle harness that I took the second place. Uh, and like you just rose cabs play a sensor uh, a six attack intimidate and then playing sensor you can shut down some heroes it's a really powerful card and sometimes you can just block nine take tunic and hit sensor so yeah it's why the, not yeah why not exactly a lot of players just start their whole reinhardt journey with just roll scabs and then you don't do anything that's usually my yeah. experience with it but you've had a lot of success in this tournament in your career there's a lot of your countrymen out in brazil that are watching that are cheering you on a lot of people are so happy that you won and i want to single out a specific uh few turns in a row towards the end of that game it seemed like it was just the first player to blink both like i saw the the frustration of that that late game turn where you had two cards and they were both fate for scenes in your hand and you didn't just pitch the cards you slapped them down with disgust and you pu <laughs> and you pushed your your you know you pushed the claw forward and you're like three and did you think at that moment that the your that match was lost that that's all you can present and that the you know fi is just going to come back hot and heavy on you yeah not really it was more a drama than I think because I was really comfortable with the reckless swing in the arsenal. It was at one, so I just it was kind of mind game to ah like he was playing around the reckless, but yeah, I, that was uh, part of the discussion <laughs> at the booth was saying that at a certain point the five player can't run scared anymore. They're gonna have to play to win rather than yeah. play to not get killed by reckless swing. So when your opponent on that last turn, pitched a command and conquer, which ultimately was going to dodge the reckless swing. That wasn't going to win them the game, and they just took the. Did you? What was your? What was going through your mind? You it, see the command and conquer get pitched. What are you thinking? It was a total relief. <laughs> uh, uh, I was afraid. Don't know. Maybe he had some ways his respite. Uh, it's unlikely to fire run it, but you don't know. Uh, and maybe he could draw another Command and Conquer and hit for seven, but um, I was safe for, for that. And yeah, uh, but seeing that Command and Conquer, uh, it was so relieful that, uh, yeah. I well, enjoyed. Pedro, you are uh, well positioned. As you can see, your record is incredible. You are well positioned for a top eight, and you're doing it in style. <laughs> Roll dice, smash face. That's the Reinar way. Don't roll dice. <laughs> Don't roll dice. <laughs> Don't roll dice. Flake doesn't roll dice. Pedro advises against rolling dice. We don't roll dice. <laughs> we win games and we smash face. Pedro, congratulations, Thank my you. friend. You still got a couple rounds to go. Yeah. Finish strong, my friend. Good luck moving forward. Thank you. Beauty. We'll be right back with more Classic Constructed here. Round number 13 of the World Championships of Flesh and Blood Live in Barcelona.
Olá, jogador, você está na GNTV, mais precisamente no Fabcast. Eu sou o Mozendia. Olá, eu sou a Paloma. Eu sou o André. E eu sou o Rafael. Semanalmente a gente se encontra para bater um papo super descontraído sobre Flash and Blood. A gente tenta ter uma conversa mais descontraída, voltada para o jogador casual que está começando, porque a gente sabe que é aí que começa para poder ir para o competitivo. E não só o jogador casual, como a gente tenta abraçar todo o público competitivo, não competitivo, que está entrando agora, que já joga faz tempo, enfim, todo mundo aqui é bem-vindo. E a gente faz tudo isso com muito bom humor, um bate-papo descontraído, gente, para atrair o maior número possível de jogadores para o Flash and Blood. Então siga a GLTV, fique por dentro do Fabcast semanalmente no YouTube e no seu tocador de áudio preferido. Hi there, my name is Dan, also known as Ravenous Babble on YouTube and Twitter. I'm a part-time content creator that covers the Flesh and Blood trading card game. And on my channel, you can catch me babbling on about various topics such as news, meta, market, kind of do a little bit of everything. Ever since I started playing the Flesh and Blood trading card game, literally since I drew my first hand and saw how deep and complex the game could be, I knew this was a game that I wanted to support and help cultivate. This game and its community really is something special. So for that, James and everyone at LSS, thank you for all the hard work that you do and for giving us such a fantastic game to play. Now, who do I think is going to win the World Championships this year? Well, I think the US is going to bring home the trophy, and I think Mara Faris on Dromai is going to claim it. She got second at Pro Tour Baltimore, and I've got a feeling she's hungry for that win. Plus, Dromai is stronger than ever. Either way, best of luck to everyone playing the World Championships this year in Barcelona. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boys, I'm Simon TCG. And if you guys are watching this, either A, you're in beautiful Barcelona enjoying Worlds, or you're watching Worlds in the stream with me. And I think I speak for everyone that this has been an awesome year for Flesh and Blood, and here's too many more. But obviously, you really want to know who I am. I'm Siphon from Siphon TCG. I do deck techs, I do coaching, I do live VOD reviews, I kind of do everything. And I'm also like the funnest guy you ever meet. But mostly, you want to know who's winning Worlds, don't you? Well, considering that uh, the best deck in the format is just Control Dash, like, why else would anyone play anything different? And then the second best deck is Kano. Well, that, there's your finals right there. And if it's not Control Dash that's going to win, it's going to be Kano. But, so, you know, I don't know what to tell you guys. So, um, why don't you just come to my YouTube channel, find out why these are the two best decks in the format, and enjoy the stream.
Muy buenas, aquí Pablo y Sergio de los Sunflower Samurai saludándoos desde el Palacio de Aranjuez y esperemos que os lo estéis pasando increíble en Barcelona. Sí, tanto en Barcelona como los que lo estoy viendo desde casa. Con los recientes cambios al metajuego nos enfrentamos a un meta más diverso que el de los otros eventos grandes que hemos jugado hasta ahora. Correcto. ¿Qué héroe o baraja te sorprendería que hiciese en esta torre? Mira, mmm, héroe o baraja se me hace un poco más complicado por lo que has comentado, que está muy abierto el tema. Yo quiero que gane alguien de, de nuestra comunidad, de España, porque nos lo hemos currado un montón, nos hemos juntado, hemos hecho piña como, por ejemplo, un, un país que, que, con el que somos muy... Tengo mucha amistad, ¿no? Como es Polonia. Hemos conseguido hacer un poquito de piña parecido a ellos. La verdad es que confío, nos ha costado coordinarnos, pero por una vez la comunidad española se ha juntado toda y lo hemos hecho bastante bien. Confío en que hagamos un buen papel y, oye, que nos llevemos el, el Mundial. Pues yo, la verdad, la gente sabe que me da mucha pena que Bravo no parezca de las barajas más potentes para este torneo. Hemos visto como todo el mundo ha dicho que no, que no es una buena elección. Así que me gustaría mucho la justicia poética de que un Bravo lo acabase ganando todo. Si no puedo ser yo, que la verdad es que dudo que juegue Bravo en este torneo, pues me gustaría cualquier otro jugador de Bravo. Y si puede ser alguna región que no haya tenido éxito hasta ahora en un torneo tan grande como, por ejemplo, Oceanía, mejor que mejor. Esperemos que os lo paséis genial y nos vemos pronto. Nos vemos. Si quieres contenido original de Flesh and Blood en castellano mientras disfrutas de las desventuras de los Sunflower Samurai, puedes seguirnos en nuestros canales de Twitter, Twitch y YouTube. ¡Somos los Sunflower Samurai! Hey guys, Matt here, aka Sinfab TCG. I'm a variety YouTuber for Flesh and Blood based out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, here in the United States, and you are currently watching World Championship Barcelona. I cover everything from box breaks to uh, meta meta game to deck text to just fun experiences uh, within my local community of Flesh and Blood. What I love most about this game is all of the people it brings together from all walks of life from all over the world, and we are witnessing that right now with world championship barcelona i think a member of the u i think somebody from the u.s is going to bring the win home and i think dromai is going to be the deck that they do it on so let's get back to the games and let's have fun guys rooting for everybody playing this weekend and i'm just excited to see some great games play out take care everyone until next time sin out greetings fellow flesh and blood fans dagan white here from iowa of the united states Hope you're as excited as I am to come to the top of this year's World Championships in Barcelona. After getting top 16 last year in San Jose and winning the Dev Challenge, I've been training very hard to make sure I convert into a coveted top 8 spot this time. If you were to ask me who I thought would win the World Championships, it would be hard not to bet in the United States again. I'm expecting to see Bravo players come out in full force. If you'd like to follow along with my journey, you can find me at Kadachi1 on Twitter. I wish all of their competitors the best of luck, and without further ado, let's get back to watching some great games in the flesh and blood. Hello, welcome back to the Flesh and Blood World Championships here in Barcelona. I'm Brendan Patrick, joined here by Erica Forsloff. Erica, we have a pretty interesting match coming up here. We have Aaron Chance versus Philip Van D on Fi. So it is going to be Dromai versus Fi. The information that we have, though, is that last round Aaron actually played against the Fi and won the match after taking them to, to time and sort of fatiguing them out of threats. Yeah, interesting uh, playstyle there, because uh, typically when I play uh, Dromai, I'm super, super scared to face a Fi in any type of situation matchup. So, because Fi has the capability to go really wide and be able to clear Dragos very, very effect effectively. So, um, it's really fun to see these uh, Dromai uh, stacks uh, having a really solid plan into those uh, Fi matchups, and I think that's super, super crucial. All right, we're all very late into this tournament. Let's take a look at the standings here. And there is Yuki Lee Bender at 11 points. Sang Xing also there. I believe they're both probably locked at this point. Probably. Um, interesting to see the hero breakdown. I mean, we've gone through two drafts. We see a lot of Ice Laners up there. 
couple Jermai's, some Fies, and then just like a full spread of heroes, right? Mm. Dash, Reinar, Katsu, Dorinthia. Not what you expected coming into this World Championship. No, definitely not. And uh, I think we all go in, we went into it thinking this was going to be a super wide open meta, and that's exactly the results we see here. The spread is absolutely fantastic, and I think you could basically have brought any hero into this uh, tournament and do really, really well. Well, the match we're about to spectate is Aaron Chance on Jermai. Let's look at let's take a look at some of those key cards to watch for this Jermai deck. We have Chromai, Rake the Embers, and the new card, Tome of Imperial Flame. Tome of Imperial Flame really changed the way players approached Dromai, changed the deck building, the general play lines, etc. Just talk to me about how this card impacted Dromai. So this card is huge for Dromai. It's all of a sudden you can uh easily pay for those uh, big dragons that costs a bunch and since you run often a red line drama in order to get activations on your uh, red cards in order to pitch them in order to get ash that is super super crucial for uh, drama in order to run that good ash economy uh, the tome of imperial flame basically unlocks a new level of drama that we've never seen before but the crucial part here is that you need to be royal in order to get the extra value of drawing the extra card in this situation so we are back to the royal drama build basically that uh, we've seen uh, Mara Ferris uh, rock uh, really hard in uh, Baltimore, for example. And uh, so it's uh, a really, really fun uh, new build that uh, Dromas players come up with. And Aaron's opponent, Philip, is on Phi. So let's take a look at some of those key cards. We have Mask of Momentum, Lava Burst, and Art of War. Art of War, such a polarizing card ever since it's come out. Just been a very powerful, aggressive card. Lava Burst, a uprising, limited staple, but also very, very good and cost constructed. And Old Faithful, Master Momentum, the piece of equipment that has been carrying ninjas since Welcome to Wraith. Yeah, so Mask of Momentum is super, super key in this matchup because uh, typically what Fi wants to do is just basically farm dragons. So thanks to Mask of Momentum, and we can uh, push some damage into the dragons, the on-hits effect will actually count, and we will be able to draw cards as of out of Mask of Momentum to get that extra value and then uh, try to go face with the extra cards that we have left over. And that's typically the game plan that we see Fi pull off into the draw mice. Yeah, this is traditionally seen as a Fi favorite matchup. It's one of the main reasons you would bring Fi to a tournament like the World Championship. Jermai was probably expected by most teams and players to be the most played deck. It ended up being Icelander, but still we saw people respond to that, respond to Jermai being the suspected best deck and deck to beat in the metagame. You saw Reinar show up, you saw Fi show up. From, from what I understand, the main reason you bring Fi to a tournament like the World Championship is to beat up on Jermai players. Definitely, and uh, we saw a, a decent stack of Fi's. We saw like a 30-something spread of uh, Fi's in the metagame, so they were definitely there. So I'm super happy to see that some Fi's made it through and uh, hopefully got some good uh, game matchups into those Jermai's to be able to feed off of them. But at the same time, I believe or imagine that uh, the Jermai's have been also uh, figuring out and working on this matchup as it's probably their biggest threat coming into this world. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting dynamic. You you talk to Jermai players and talk about the Fi matchup, um, and it's kind of it's kind of cliche with Jermai players. Most of them think it's not that bad, uh, but you know Jermai players are known for saying that the bad matchups are not that bad. So <laughs> we'll see. I know Philip probably probably took Fi, really hoping to get paired into this matchup. I mean, Fi was a hero that was kind of held down by Le Lexi in the in the past meta. Yeah. So it's sort of been unleashed since that hearing has hit Living Legend. Yeah, so we see uh, Droma here starting off with the Wave of Reality that has the Ward 1 uh, activation on it. Uh, super good into this matchup probably because uh, you can block some extra damage and we also get notified here that Droma is actually going first. Yeah, what do you think about those Mage Master boots in the matchup here against Spy? That is a really interesting uh, choice. Typically, we see the Snapdragon Scalers in uh, the draw my lists uh, as of late. Trying to go a very much more aggressive uh, type of build. Together with the Snapdragon Scalers, you can get the go again of crucial uh, no attack actions that don't have the natural go again, such as Dash for example. And so, uh, seeing the Mage Master boots here is uh, giving me a little bit of thought on what the game plan mm. is here. Yeah, so you see Aaron Chance activate that gold token, really just looking to create some early ash in this game on turn zero. Yeah, that's one of the big upsides with running the Crown of Dominion, and you get the extra gold that you can then push some uh, red cards into and get that good uh, ash generation start off. So starting out ash neutral here with a Yenderai. Yeah, and the site's not to attack, so just going to establish some uh, slight... 
low board state, I would say, and just the Arsenal card. I think uh, Droma is uh, one of the heroes that loves to utilize the Arsenal the most because it's super, super crucial to have that uh, red card to start off with so that you can get the go again on your dragons. So having that extra security to know that you always have that uh, availability is uh, super crucial. So using Arsenal for that is uh, super good. Yeah, and Tome of the Imperial Flame is a lot different than sort of our previous draw card in Flesh and Blood. Uh, three of a Kind, in the sense Three of a Kind gave you space to block with uh, cards in your opponent's turn, and they could give you a reasonable turn after that. Well, Tome of, Tome of the Imperial Flame sort of gets exponentially more powerful as you have more cards in hand, so you're very much incentivized to play a five-card hand into a Tome turn. Definitely, since you need to pitch two cards in order to not... Uh... <laughs> run into the extra effect of uh, disbanding all of your cards uh, and then you will get the resources uh, on the back foot of it so that is what uh, empowers this uh, Tome of Imperial Flame uh, play in the drama. We do see that wave of reality come into play here. Yeah, creating that uh, Spectra Shield to be able to block some extra damage coming in. Uh. Mage Master Boots are particularly interesting. In terms of poppers, I believe Philip only has access to Command and Conquer. Yeah, so not a huge uh, six power attack count. So uh, he's probably just looking to go aggressive and try to do as much damage to face as possible. And uh, looking at this Yandera, he's not super keen on uh, pushing some damage into Yandera as he has that defense counter on it that he needs to take off before he can actually kill off the Yandera. Important to note in Aaron's list, Aaron does not have access to Sap Dragon Scalers, although uh -huh. he is playing cards like Dust Up, cards that can, you know, be paired with Snapdragon Scalers right. um, in a matchup like this. He is not playing them, so it does look like his Mage Master Boots are his only option, which is probably the reason why he's opted to play them. Mage Master Boots can be very, very powerful into other Dromai's and against matchups like Bravo, where you can play something like a double passing Mirage or play mm. this. Yeah, so getting the double passing is absolutely good versus uh, decks that can't really go wide and uh, help to clear those off. And of course, thanks to the Spectra, you can't really clear off the double passing on a single turn. You have to do that in two turns. Uh, so it's super awkward to deal with when you can only do basically one uh, attack a turn. Looks like Philip is sending this all face, not pinging the counter off Yenderai. And here's a Lava Burst 4-5, satisfying that dra Draconic Change chain link condition yeah and i believe he only blocked the first attack the soaring strike so he is not going to face with this uh, situation that mass momentum is going to be active and uh, if he decides to take this then he will uh, get an arsenal out of this as well and from what we, from what we understand in regards to the last match it does seem like aaron chance plan into this matchup is to play more defensive. That being said, Jermai is a very dynamic deck. It can pivot game plans very easily, has many endgame plans that are just inherently possible um, with the core build of the deck. So Jermai is sort of a Rubik's Cube of a flesh and blood deck when it comes to the role in the matchup. Can it be defensive? Can it be aggressive? Because right now we're going to see, you know, I talk about Aaron Chance playing passive and defensive less match. A card like this, Tome of Imperial Flame, can put him on the aggressive side very, very quickly. Definitely, and it also gives you the ability to uh, filter your hands. So basically, you can draw up to two and then uh, see, okay, what is available to me and what's the maximum damage output I can do or what's the most optimal play I can do out of this hand. Pitch the two red cards that you don't necessarily need and then uh, optimize accordingly. Uh, it's a super strong uh, kicker, basically, for Droma and able to just tutor their turn uh, perfectionally in, around this uh, Tomo Imperial Flame and also pay off for the two uh, extra pitch that they're going to receive uh, on the returning end when they when they yeah, what I mean, this Tome of Imperial Flame, what it really did, uh, in my opinion, in regards to Jeremiah, is it changed like, this metagame around Ash. You just generate so much Ash inherently by playing this card in your deck that it's, it's just way less of a worry. And an issue that Jeremiah could face against aggro decks in the past, it still does to an extent, is that once it got behind on Ash, it couldn't really get enough space to sort of create that and come back into the game. But we see already Aaron all the way up to four Ash here because of that Tome of Imperial Flame. Yeah, it's super, super strong. And we're also going to activate the Flamescale Furnace here to go up to a third to activate a Themai, actually. Yeah, Themai does just, you know, it is one of those dragons that kind of just has that big butt, is a little bit harder to kill. <laughs> yes. A 3-4. And a and a, okay, now okay. this is a serious dragon. This is Invoke Dominia. It's going to potentially look at Philip's hand. 
So mm. Dromai doesn't run that many blues, but he actually was able to get that blue dust up into his hand to be able to play this big oh, dragon style. Oh, and as well. He has the oh, one no. of three poppers. Surely going to be picking that card. What a Dominia. But it's kind of an awkward hand. He has full red, so even playing out that Command and Conquer would require three cards to in order to get it out. Yeah, Philip probably would have snap popped this though if it was anything except Dominia. So oh, probably. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> God. Oh yeah. Sorry, sure. shaking his fist at the Dominia here. Yeah. So this is absolutely huge for Aaron. He's getting the super strong value of finding that Command and Conquer and be able to take it out of Philip's hand. So, I mean, Aaron is gonna do a bunch of damage into uh, this fight on the back burner. Yeah, what a play here to mine to Dominia and snagging the one of three popper in Philip's deck. Really showing the power of this Tome of Imperial Flame because you go from zero to a hero in a turn and it's absolutely massive to see. Now, Philip, we're going to get it. We're going to learn a lot about his game plan this turn. Having those three red cards in hand, is he going to opt to clear any dragons or is he still going to just send face? Because up until now, we haven't seen any sort of dragon management out of Philip. No, he has to take care of this uh, Dominia, absolutely. Uh, and with four powers, it's uh, basically one uh, mounting anger in his hand that is uh, able to do it, but he's going to have to pitch for it. And uh, he's not going to have enough pitch to go for the Searing Ember Blade either. So, um, yeah, not having a single blue in hand can sometimes be very awkward for, for a fire running on the Ember Blade. Yeah, Dominia really is one of those must-kill dragons. Under no scenario would you let that card attack twice. No, because you see what happened. You get them to see your whole hand and they're going to fetch out all of those six power attacks that could potentially come in and kill them off with, or pop the dragons with the phantasm. So uh, it's absolutely crucial that uh, Philip takes care of this. It's really interesting because Dominia and its friend in the deck, Tomaltai, are two dragons that are very, very hard for this red line Dramai deck to cast. But via Tome of Imperial Flame, they are actually able to play these big dragons with these huge payoffs. You know, Tomaltai melting equipment, Dominia taking your card out of hand. Mm. It's just incredible what this Tome card has done for this previously very red line uh, deck. Yeah, so uh, we see that uh, dragon being taken care of uh, absolutely immediately. But then becomes the question how much uh, punch we can uh, get more out of this uh, turn. And also we get activated ability after Mounting Anger, so that's uh, a little bit of an upside here for Bally Philip. Yeah, it's going to be able to kill the Thamai as well, so Thamai, I mean, potentially if he faces at it, which it looks like he has Thamai. You know, that, that four butt can be a lot because it can't be mm. cleared by the weapon, which is maybe why Aaron decided to run it out. Yeah. Um, it could have also just been the dragon in his hand, but harder for Fi to deal with uh, on the Searing Ember Blade because of that four defense. Interesting line here that he opts to... Oh, yeah, of course. So, I'm not... Sh I'm a bit curious now because uh, the uh, endurance counter on... Uh, Yen yeah, exactly. So, the, the endurance counter on uh, Yendrai suggests that you prevent the uh, damage being taken, so uh, I'm curious if it still counts as an on hit. Interesting. I actually, I actually don't know that either. I've, uh, I've never encountered that scenario. Yeah, Philip was very fast on uh, activating that uh, mask of momentum and uh, pulling up the card, but we saw the judge uh, quickly stepping in there and seeing if... Uh, Looks like it does count. It does count. Okay, so we're, we're off to the races here. Looks like a brand with Cinderclaw. For two here. Yeah, it's not the strongest pickup there from the Mask of Momentum, but at least he's able to swing some damage back and uh, equalize the damage, because Fight did took a little bit of a punch on that big dragon turn that uh, Aaron presented. Yep, and is able to clear the entire board of Aaron Chance, and this is one of the reasons why this matchup is traditionally seen as Fi favored. Aaron Chance was in a very, very commanding position, and the Philip has gone to stabilize the board. The life totals are close, but we are at parity here. Mirror guy for Aaron Chance. Yeah, so this is the one of the most powerful dragons that uh, Dromai has uh, available to her. Getting that Phantasm off of your first dragon attack can be super, super huge. Yeah, another one of those... Kind of there's a short list of muscular dragons, and I feel like Mira got obviously Tomaltai and Dominia mm. are, are up top. But in terms of the normal dragons, like Miragai and Chromai are those ones that you kind of never let stay on the board. Yeah, but I would imagine that Philip wants to clean this one off, so don't let uh, Aaron get away with uh, that uh, first off uh, Tomaltai and get that Phantasm off of some card like that would be absolutely devastating uh, on Philip's side of things. Uh, he does have the Art of War in hand, so that uh, could potentially lead to a very, very wide turn, maybe in the future, unless he needs to be able to use that to pitch to go extra wide this turn. It's actually opting into just uh, snatching the Mirror Guy, popping this. Okay. That's a very aggressive play here. 
I think it might have been his only play because he was all reds and an art of war and needs to clear the mirror guy. Right. Maybe, you know, trying to get something to uh, kick off his turn with that actually has go again because it's a, they ha it's a, it seems like it's a very awkward hand and if you don't have those stalkers with the natural go again sometimes you can get really really awkward hands where you basically only have the finishers and then if you can't really go wide then you lose so much more potential in your uh, in your lines still wondering if philip is planning to ha did get the blue off the snatch by the way still wondering if philip is planning to run out this auto for this turn or opt to arsenal and play it off a five card hand We'll I think, find out very soon. Yeah, I think Arsenal in the outer war is uh, potentially going for a five-card hand was what, what I want to suggest, but absolutely. Philip is opting into outer war here, dishing out the Cyndaclaw blue from his hand, so being able to get those two cards and be able to present some more offense here. Looks like he did have the additional blue in hand, so that makes sense. Yeah. Question now is, though, if he has the... Uh, a better line to work with, basically, if has any of those Gohagen attacks, and yeah, seems like he figured it out. I see a blue Soul Bead Strike also drawn. Uh, not the best. Art of War, of course, uh, pushing all of these uh, attacks with a plus one. I would suspect that Aaron Chance has the full six defense reactions in here. Potentially as well as the sand covers, just have two sand covers in the list. Ah, yeah, we saw him pitch the sink below and the fate for scene on that uh, early big wide uh, dragon attack. So uh, it's probably very standard for Dromite to run those uh, cards because they are being able to use them both for pitch and both for defensive uh, capabilities like we see now. now. So the Ember Blade is not going to get the plus one from the Art of War, but uh, we still need to use that uh, pitch somehow to get some uh, offensives out here. Still uh, looking really good on the Dromai side of things, still sitting that at 32 uh, HP. It doesn't uh, feel like uh, Fai is getting a lot of damage to. Yeah, I was going to ask you what you think Aaron Chance's sort of path to victory is in this game. Is it weathering the storm here and trying to set up boards of dragons? Like... How does Dromai ultimately win the game? Because we saw Aaron Chance have a huge pivot turn, put three dragons on board, one of which was Dominia, and it just immediately immediately gets cleared on the on the crackback. How do you win this matchup as the Dromai player against Fi? I believe as a Dromai player, you have those big dragons that require a lot of your big your opponent to present your bigger attacks into those uh, dragons in order to clear them out. So avoiding damage to face by presenting these dragons on board that they must be cleared is uh, absolutely a good way to go. So I think uh, that play by Aaron was uh, really, really strong. But of course, it's all about what you draw into, of course. So being able to pull that off in, in the first turn was uh, super, super crucial to get to this point where he is still at a super healthy life total and also able to push a lot of damage with those big dragons. So I'm really, really uh, happy to see how Aaron is uh, pulling off so far because, uh, as we mentioned, draw, um, Fai is typically the more favored match going into this one. So, uh, And this one is a kicker. We have the Lava Burst ending up on this one. Yeah, we've already seen one Lava Burst so far and it's coming in for six as well. Oh, sorry, seven Was because seven of, of Tiger War. Strike yeah, Tiger Strike plus Art of War. Oh. So much damage for, for Aaron to deal with here. Yeah, so we see finally a big turn. And uh, these are the pickles that uh, Aaron needs to deal with. These uh, big turns are not going to be few and far between. This is basically what uh, Fi loves to do. Just go wide and push everything to face, present as much damage as possible, and uh, basically just run over your opponent before they can uh, break a sweat. And we see Aaron, he's holding back on his hand, and he of course wants to build more momentum on his own and try to build those board states again with those dragons and be able to present damage back, of course. Uh, but he's going to have to require cards to pitch for them so uh, he's gonna require full hands to do so but um, of course he's opting in to uh, block something out here to uh, stay healthy and we see the one of miraging metamorph be used for block there with the dust up mm. two card hand for Aaron chance Mirage for one of the more offensive uh, cards, it can be one card or one pitch seven is uh, huge. Of course it has the Phantasm, but if you run against decks that doesn't have a lot of poppers, like we see here with the Fies only running the three, then absolutely those could be very powerful. Like pushing seven damage through on uh, a one cost is uh, super huge. Another Yender I hear for Aaron. It looks like Philip has drawn another Art of War. Such a key card for Fi in this matchup. 
Yeah, we saw last turn how he was able to fix his hand. So going from an absolute uh, dumpster to uh, something actually really, really potent and powerful. So that was uh, super fun to see. And Art of War is probably, as we mentioned earlier, the, one of the key cards in this matchup to uh, push some extra damage through. Getting those extra key cards and finalizing your lines is uh, crucial. Looks like he's activating Fi on Aaron's turn. Maybe has a uh, And passing. In hand. Oh, yeah, on Aaron's turn. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. So maybe, yeah. So that is actually an interesting uh, line. If you have an extra blue in hand to be able to pitch in for that Phoenix Flame, I mean, this Phoenix Flame is going to come in for zero and nothing, so it's not going to do much. But what it will do is uh, enable a turn to actually function. Because as I mentioned, some of these cards have this crucial thing points, like the Love and Vain Loyalty, who needs that uh, Red Draconic starter to uh, be able to get that go again. So important to uh, establish uh, some kind of starter in order to get the rest of your Draconics through. We have Blaze headlong here for four with Go again. Yeah, question is if I don't think he's going to do much with his uh, Art of War. I don't think he's going to pitch it for uh, the Searing Ember Blade. Probably he's going to arsenal that and come in with a five couch hand with the Art of War next turn and just uh, try to push through as much damage as possible. Aaron's life total is very healthy for being sort of being on the receiving end of an Art of War last turn. We mm. have another, our second sink below coming out here. Yeah, and sitting at 2-ash is a pretty comfortable uh, position to be in. Oh yeah, of course, we're going to activate the Fi on this ability, because we saw earlier that he uh, grabbed the Phoenix Flame, or grabbed, he threw up into his second Phoenix Flame that he is running, and so he's able to capitalize on that on uh, this turn to uh, go even wider. Probably debating whether to send it at Yenderai or at face here. Yeah. I mean, it's just one point of damage. It's not... Oh, no, it's going to get two from the Tiger Shop Shuku, of course. So, I mean, sending two to face is probably a little bit more value. If you're not planning to clear Yenderai this turn anyway, I think it's uh, probably wiser. 25 all for Aaron and Philip here. Back over to Aaron's turn. I believe he has a two-card hand to uh, pull off something big. Oh, it's a Kyloria here. Oh, that's really good. You get the card draw. Like, it's basically Snatch <laughs> with Go again. Uh, a super, super great uh, favorite dragon uh, from the draw mice. It also has additional text that if the opponent controls an item, mm. you can steal that. Easily forgotten about if you're sitting on the other, on the other end of a Kyloria and you're yeah, potentially I've playing a wizard. <laughs> I've heard situations about that. Because <laughs> you always assume that you draw a card and then it's like, oh yeah, there's this extra text that is situationally good as well. So opting to take the four here and letting uh, Aaron draw up, he still has to go again, so uh, yeah, he potentially Philip, go wide. Philip is on the cusp of a five-card Art of War turn here. Um, does have Art of War and Arsenal, yep, yep, I yep. believe. So. so, I mean, he's not going to make any excuses to not utilize uh, this hand and just go absolute bonkers. But Droma is still able to push through a lot of damage, and I'm super, super amazed by how far, not far ahead, but Aaron is keeping good pace with this five player and actually keeping a bit on the back foot. The question is where he's going to end up after this big uh, Art of War turn. Oh, it looks like Philip drew another Art of War. Oh, wow. There's definitely an Art of War in hand, and I assume there's one in Arsenal. So it seems like we have some judge uh, discussions going on here. This matchup does look a lot closer than it probably should be if you were bringing Phi to the tournament with the core thesis being that you were extremely favored into Jermont. Definitely. I personally brought Phi into one of the pro quests that was run uh, recently. I ran into a couple of uh, draw mice and I personally run the... Um, Kodashi plan to be able to clear those dragons much more effectively. Uh, so I'm super curious to see also that uh, Philip is opting in to run only on an Ember Blade uh, build here. So we have these different camps that uh, either you prefer the Ember Blade, it's easier to get the Phoenix Flame out because you have that additional Draconic uh, chain link that is easier to build upon to get the Fire ability for free. Uh, and then you also have the Kodashi build that you can utilize the Brand of Sinteclaw to give your Kodashis that 
critical uh, draconic ability to be able to get the same value basically from the fight. So there's basically two camps uh, on that. Like, either you're the Searing Ember Blade fan or you're like the Kodashi fan club. We're not exactly sure what this judge call is about at the moment. I did see the graveyard get picked up, and I believe they picked up Phillip's deck as well. Mm. So we'll see if we can sort that out and get more information for you all. Which side of the table would you prefer to be on? I, it's, an in, it's interesting because the testing group that I played with also came to the conclusion that Phi was not a good matchup, but it was definitely not a terrible matchup. Right. Um, and most Phi players that I knew bringing that deck to the tournament believed that Phi had an om a near auto win into Jermai, which I think is absolutely not the case with, with Tome. So the thing about the Tome deck is it's less defensive. Um, it's, I mean, it's a bit more fragile, right? The Tomes themselves don't block, whatever. But Tome just gives you so much more equity to actually run away with the game yourself as mm. Jermai. And Jermai is just this deck that can pivot off being the aggressor, the defender, just so dynamically throughout the match. It just, feel, it just felt like Jermai was a more powerful deck, although Fi's kit enables Fi to be sort of a counter to Jermai, right? Just can inherently mm. clear so many dragons, has access to that mask momentum, and is able to get card draw basically on demand. So... I would say it's a matchup we actually didn't worry about too much, to be honest. Nope. Because we also thought that there wouldn't be 43 fives at the tournament, <laughs> which there was. So, uh, yeah, didn't really get the memo on that, that all these people <laughs> were going to bring Fi. That being said, ultimately, it's something that you probably would prefer not to pair into, but preferable to something like a Reinar, to yeah. be honest. I'm also thinking that uh, since uh, this world's uh, competition, you bring players from all over the world, and of course you have these uh, regional uh, so kind of metas where you have uh, regional favorability on which heroes are the most popular in each region. Now we've seen Lexi reigning the meta quite extensively for the past uh, couple of months in each and every single region. So uh, we have been seeing uh, Lexi basically running things all over the place, but of course we have seen a couple of one-off uh, heroes winning uh, across uh, several different uh, countries and the callings uh, as of late. So it is uh, very interesting uh, to see how all of these metas now combine into this world championship where we're gonna see like all the worlds collide basically and bring all their local metas into this one and uh, basically pan it out. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the regionality of decks is super interesting when you come to a tournament like the Pro Tour or like the World Championships. I know at the previous World Championship, actually in the ProQuest meta that led up to that, people were not really considering Briar too much. It kind of fallen off a bit, yeah. but Europe really brought Briar into yeah. It was one of the most represented decks. So it's, it's super interesting when preparing for tournaments based off regionality, right? Because on, at this point, a lot of the callings do happen in the U.S., but that's a totally different, um, that's a totally different meta than if you were to fly over to one in, uh, in, in Europe or in Asia. Yeah. And then when you bring, bring players together at these pro tours or these world championships, it changes the, the dynamic completely. Like, honestly, I don't think a single person in this room expected Iceland to be the most played deck. No, was. definitely not. I was expecting draw, uh, Iceland to probably be top three, but I would not expect it to be the number one hero. I was expecting probably draw my Bravo, possibly. Uh, but I've also heard that uh, in Europe, especially as of late, Fi has been super, super popular. And as we go into this uh, new meta without the Lexi, uh, it leaves the door wide open for the Fi's because the Fi has been a bit intimidated by the output that Lexi can put out and all the disruption that she can do. It, it's not panning out well for either of the Ninjas in each region. So now that the, the doors are open for uh, the Ninjas to come out, I think they are taking full capacity of it. Well, yeah, coming from a testing house that ended up on Jermai, I wish I had gotten the memo that Europe was <laughs> going to bring five because nobody told me that. Um, I honestly expected the ninjas to... they were, I felt like they were more of a sort of philosophical threat rather right. than something that would actually materialize in the tournament. Right. And we pretty much got the opposite scenario where both Katsu and Fi showed up in absolute force. Anyway, let's go take a look at those standings once again as we work through this judge call. And again, Yuki Lee Bender and Sang Shing both like both locked for top eight. And we see our metagame breakdown. What stands out to you the most here? Uh, Reiner. Uh, <laughs> we also have that one solo katsu in this whole uh, what is it, top ten? Yeah, we have two catches actually in the top 10. So uh, also the uh, one of uh, Dorinthia here on uh, 11th place. We have one Dash IO on the 16th place. So like looking at the top 20 that is competing for uh, the top eight that is going in now with this round and next round only remaining before we cut the top eight tomorrow, then 
I mean, this is looking absolutely beautiful to me. Wow, Christopher Ayali on Max Nitro combo in 22nd place now. Christopher Ayali started the tournament off 1-2, I believe. Mm. <laughs> I remember talking to him and his friend Matthew Vore shortly after Matthew Vore was 0-2 to start and Chris Ayali was 1-2 to start. Uh -huh. And they were... they. They were actually quite excited to get the Pablo Pintor narrative and try to win the tournament. It looks like Chris Alley is actually doing it. Chris Alley was the, I don't know if I mentioned it, the finalist at the previous World Championships, losing to Michael Hamilton in an Icelander, the Briar matchup. But also, like, the only, one of the, the only Max Nitro, I think, at least up here, but maybe that made it to day two. I mean, the deck wasn't very represented. Right. Um, and it's very, very niche. So would love to see it at some point on camera. Maybe we'll see it in the top eight. Maybe It'd be wild to have a Max Nitro make it all the way to top eight. Yeah, I believe he has to win this game and the next one in order to uh, have a contention for the top eight. It's going to be quite stacked to get those last points in now uh, for these competitors. I can't even imagine the nerves going into these last few rounds. We saw how much Yuki was shaking on this <laughs> last stream. And I like going into this uh, tournament with so much stakes on the line. It's uh, a very narrowing experience. And it's something that the players also has to deal with, like the handling the nerves and handling uh, yourself in a controlled manner uh, to make yourself... Um, succeed in this type of tournament is also a crucial, crucial uh, ability that you need to uh, adopt. Absolutely. Well, let's look at page two as well, because there's more to the story than just this page. We see Mara yeah. Faris, previous Pro Tour Baltimore top eight, go. Sam Sutherland, Australian national champion, ah, I believe. Yeah. Um, and also Dash, sort of Dash specialist, has been taking Dash to big performances for years at this point. A big um, believer. <laughs> definitely works in his favor. And, yep. And yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's phenomenal to see. We see our first Bravo here at 37th right. place. You know, I guess Maximilian Klein there at 30th. Maximilian Klein, I believe, top eight of Pro Tour of yeah. Baltimore as yep, yep. well on Lexi. Mm -hmm. So it's funny because I know, you know, our big, big, big stars of flesh and blood in the form of Pablo Pintor um, and Michael Hamilton, they might not be on page one or page two, but if we, there's so many names up here that are recognizable. And it just goes to show that flesh and blood is one of those games where if you put in the work, the output does tend to follow. Yeah, that's also some, one thing I wanted to mention because there's so many names on this table at this point in time that we haven't really seen or heard a lot from before. So this is basically an old wide a space wide open for anyone to come in and do their best and uh, if they have everything lined up against them because we also need to remember that there is some luck dependence in these tournaments like what you're paired up against and what you have prepared against and what you're strong against uh, can sometimes play against you if you're unlucky with the game pairings and uh, face your worst uh, matchups in the first couple of rounds that can really really devastate the tournament but then we also have these uh, Pablo Pintor uh, roundouts where they can just lose the first couple of rounds and they just win out the rest of them uh, so so sometimes you just need that uh, little bit of luck to get all the way. But it's super fun to see the both the matchup spreads, but also the name spread of uh, all of these uh, new people coming into the scene. Yep, the regionality spread is pretty impressive as well. We have yeah. people from all over the world. I know America right now isn't doing too well, but it looks like we might have some sneak in the top eight. We have Christopher Alley, we have Mara, Mara Ferris here. Yeah. It's just a fascinating tournament. Also, the regionality as you go from Pro Tour 1 to now has been so dynamic in terms of like, what regions have put more players into top eight in what mm. tournament. I know Pro Tour Baltimore, uh, the most recent one, was a good one for the U.S., but Pro Tour 1 was a huge showing from Europe. That was sort of Europe's first burst onto the scene, and you guys put in, I don't know, was it four, maybe four or more into top eight. It was in incredible. Yeah, 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 and it's uh, super fun to see. And that's what I love about this World's Tournament, that is people from all over the world competing for this uh, big prize pool. And uh, basically the competition ends up with who is the best player in the world right now. And we saw uh, Michael Hamilton win out that last year on Icelander and uh, making an absolute uh, run for it with that uh, Bullander list. And now we're here again in this year looking at uh, basically anyone's game at this point. And Icelander, of course, is still uh, pulling off really good numbers. And we could potentially see her living legend uh, after this tournament. Yeah, I was going to ask what you what you think, seeing pretty much almost the same Bullander list, mm. you know, performing so well at the last World Championship, winning it, and now being somewhat live to win it again. Is I know Icelander is by no means an underrated deck, but maybe it is in that sense. Yeah, I was ready to bet money that uh, Michael Hamilton was going to bring, bring Icelander again for our last hurrah, realizing that it might be the last uh, tournament to play it. And what better name to send her off into LL Land than Michael Hamilton himself, who brought this uh, amazing build into the scene in the first place. So um, I was a bit confused to see him uh, running the Bravo at the end of the day, but I mean, uh, He's a really, really good player, and if his uh, testing proved out that uh, Bravo was a stronger pick, then uh, I absolutely trust in that. Well, I had the pleasure of talking to Michael Hamilton ah. and his team, so 
the, they talked about Bravo and said, so you guys feel, obviously your team feels good about the Dromai matchup. And he said, yes, of course. I was like, did you expect Iceland to be the most played deck? He said, absolutely not. <laughs> so while they felt good into their, their Dromai matchup with Bravo, um, which can be a bit of a polarizing matchup, I think both, both sides of the fence tend to think they're favored. Um, they were not expecting Icelander to be the most played deck. I mean, Bravo into Icelander is almost an objectively bad matchup, mm. um, no matter what way you play because you can't really play defensive. You play it aggressive. It still feels like Icelander gets more value turn to turn uh, than Bravo quite consistently. Yeah, so uh, I believe we saw that yesterday with the Icelander Bravo match that we casted yesterday that uh, it's absolutely possible for uh, Bravo to uh, push things through, but you need to have the stars aligned. You need to draw into those uh, perfect hands where you have enough pitch to come in with your strong attacks. You need to go wide with the Rouses and the Celluses and the E strikes in order to push as much damage as possible through in the shortest amount of period of time before Icelander can uh, cripple back up and you reach the two lower life points. Well, while we're here, let's look at the meta conversion for day two. We see 40 Icelander, 36 Stramai, 31 Bravo. I mean, that's pretty much the tail of the tape for meta representation, right? Definitely. So the conversion was there. So it looked like, looked, looks like players made sort of reasonable picks at that. I'm not sure what the ex exact conversion rate was, but I know Reiner had a very high conversion rate. I believe Azalea did, Icelander did, of course. Hmm. And Bravo's was a little bit lower on that. Mm -hmm. But we do have one Kano into day two. Just got to point that there out. There you Three go. Max Nitro. Um, you know, we have Bolton at 75%. Obviously, Bolton, Azuri, yeah. very small sample sizes. Um, Ryan are relatively high, but Azalea probably our best converting hero when we get rid of the outliers. Exactly. So, uh, considering the amount of numbers going into day one and what actually converted into day two, then Azalea has absolutely pulled out the strongest number here. We also see Reiner here at 59%, and I think Reiner was actually a really strong pick going into this tournament, looking at both the Dromai and the Bravo matchup as very favored into Reiner. How would you feel about playing Reiner in this tournament, sort of post, um, post the meta being published, with there being so many Fies and so many Katsus? Because I know people that brought Reiner mm. to this tournament. And they did not bring Reinar thinking that Europe, apparently, like I said, we didn't get the memo, was going to bring Fai and going right. to bring Katsu. Yep. I mean, they brought Reinar to beat up on Jermai, have a fine matchup into, into Icelander, and then kind of a bad matchup into Bravo, probably. I mean, it's debatable. It's debatable. But <laughs> definitely not a great matchup into Fai and Katsu. No, definitely not. But uh, I think uh, looking at the method that we ended up with, I think seeing both the Dromai and the Bravos and uh, also the Icelanders, I think Reina can have a fair game into Icelander as well. Uh, like forcing Icelander into a situation where she can't really utilize her hand with those Intimidates can be really, really powerful. Um, but yeah, it's really fun to see that uh, Reinar is making a good conversion rate, at least uh, into day two. And you see that one Reinar now uh, into uh, a really good top eight contention as least. Honestly, if I was going to pull a narrative out of this, this meta breakdown and conversion day two, for me, it's Max Nitro. Mm. This is a deck. I'm going to be honest. I've heard about it. I know what it tries to do in concept, but I have no idea how that deck works. And the way one of my friends described to it, described it to me, said he was asking the question. So apparently it's a very, very aggressive deck yep. the opponent needs to react to. I mean, it converted very well at the World Championship. I know a lot of players who were actually planning to play this and sort of chickened out last minute, just went on Jermai. Most of them said they regretted it. Um, but this is a deck that I feel like the Flesh and Blood community as a whole isn't really exposed to. And if it's performing this well on the world stage, you know, we maybe see Icelander LL. It's on, it, it can only be good for this deck. Absolutely, and that means we can see a lot more out of this uh, Bright Lights heroes. We also saw the one Teklovasen yesterday who did a really, really cool match uh, into the boost dash yesterday and having a really solid uh, fatigue uh, game plan. Uh, wasn't able to convert into day two, unfortunately, because we need to remember that you need to be able to pull off both a CC portion and also a limited portion. Uh, so that puts a lot of uh, strength into how much you can prepare into the going into this tournament. So you don't only need a strong CC, deck you also need a strong limited uh, experience uh, going into this so how do you think the format changes if icelander lls tomorrow Great question. I think the uh, Ninjas are going to be super happy. And uh, I believe... Uh, Bravo is probably happy as well. Bravo is probably super happy as well. And it's going to open up a lot of new avenues for all of these aggro decks to uh, come into fruition. And maybe some other uh, contentionless heroes that can punish said uh, aggressive uh, heroes. Like both the Dash IO and the Fire and the Cassius, they don't really like to be penalized uh, with their hands. So whenever you have a deck that is asking the question, okay, how much can you block me before I go absolutely bonkers? 
answers. And yeah, look, I'm looking at Dorinthea and Bolton for uh, those type of uh, question marks there on how much uh, they can be an offensive uh, counter into that meta. Yeah, and we're getting even more warrior, su warrior support here in heavy hitters the right. next set. Um, do you think of Icelander LLs, is Dramai still the deck to beat? Do you think it's the best deck in the format? Because really right now what keeps a lot of Dramai's counters in check um, probably is Icelander to an extent. Icelander is very polarizing on the meta just due to the nature of how that hero works. Yeah. But I feel like once Icelander's out, that's when we really get the reframing of the meta. Mm. You know, Lexi leaving. Lexi was this very premier aggro deck that held down Fi, held down Katsu from being playable because if you're going to be an aggro deck, why not be the best one? Why, exactly. not be the, why not be the fastest one, the one that does the most damage? And Lexi kind of was that. But now Lexi is gone. We see those heroes come back into the meta. You know, Max Nitro's here. But when Icelander leaves, my big question is around Jermai. Because right now, I mean, going to turn, a lot of people thought Jermai was the best deck. Could turn out it was actually Icelander. Hmm. But there's quite a narrative for Jermai. Definitely. Does that change if Icelander leaves and all these, decks, all these other decks get more room to come back into the meta? I think the Dromai versus Icelander discussion is super, super interesting because depending, it doesn't matter which uh, side you ask, both of them are going to say, I am favored. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's a, a very interesting 90 90 matchup. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, so both Icelander and uh, Dromai feels that the matchup is uh, in their favor. So I'm not, uh, I don't think that uh, Icelander is uh, keeping uh, Dromai down by any sense of the purpose. And uh, from what I've seen, it uh, it's tends to be a little bit 50 uh, 50, I think, uh, looking at the uh, overall scores and such. Because um, you have those uh, ice cards that can really punish uh, Dromai, preventing her from uh, bringing out those big dragons or those big white turns, uh, and also punishing with this uh, arcane that uh, they don't typically have the AB for unless they have those uh, Ashwings out. But if Dromai can pull out uh, those early Ashwings and uh, being able to uh, push in a lot of damage that uh, Icelander can't deal with, then Icelander is typically in a lot of trouble. So it often depends on uh, how much board state that the Dromai player can build. But going into the next meta, then if Icelander leaves, then ask the question, who is the strongest or like the fastest deck going into that? And uh, looking at at the max here, we're probably going to see a lot more of that, and we also see a lot more Dash IO now, and that's a deck that has been brewing and evolving quite strongly as of late. I believe Dash IO is sort of being held back by Bravo, actually. See, Bravo yeah. was probably overrepresented in this metagame. We saw it knocked convert super well. That could be due to draft. Um, nevertheless, Bravo as a deck, if, if you think that Bravo is going to be highly represented at the World Championship, that's actually a decent reason to not bring Dash IO. It's just not a great matchup. You know, Bravo, Bravo got the Civic Steps in the recent um, UPF set, which is a lot of block value on the boots previously. Bravo is wearing, yeah. uh, you know, Mage Master boots or something silly, uh, uh, Blade Breaker, just basically nothing. And now they have the Shield as well. I mean, Bravo just has so much block value. Mm. And Dash, Dash IO is really a deck that operates off forcing through damage via those boom grenades. Does do a lot of boosting, is subject to fatigue. Mm. So Bravo's kind of just tailor made to, to bully Dash IO. So is Bravo the best deck then if Icelander disappears? Because uh, being Icelander is the strongest contender against uh, Bravo. So if Icelander disappears, then what is the contention Bravo has to deal with then? So you, you, to, to be in that school of thought, you have to believe that Bravo has a good matchup and is favored into Jermai. And that is definitely not a clear cut right. sort of opinion, right? People yep. are on both sides of the fence. The Jermai players that brought Jermai here to this tournament today didn't bring Jermai being like, oh, well, I hope I don't face Bravo. <laughs> I mean, they knew no. that people were going to They had a Bravo. plan, hopefully. Absolutely. And we see, the, we see the lists represent that. I mean, Aaron Chance, who we were just watching, is playing just Mage Master Boots. It looks like we got an update on our judge call. Looks like it was something to do with the Phoenix Flame that was pitched to play. Uh, I didn't catch it while it was on stream, but we'll go ahead and let the judges resolve that situation. Erica, from what I understand, you're a bit of an Icelander player. so. Yeah. What is your plan if I Icelander LLs? What are you looking at to play, even in the context of heavy hitters and the support that might be coming to those heroes? So I think uh, heavy hitters is going to be super, super interesting because we are basically, it feels like we're going back a bit to the roots. We had that uh, Welcome to Wraith uh, starter where we saw all of those uh, heroes like the Warriors and the Brutes and the Guardians being presented for the first time. And it feels like we're going back a little bit to that. We're going to miss out on the Ninjas, but uh, the Ninjas has uh, been getting uh, super much support as of late, so they're probably not going to miss much. So I'm super excited to see what the uh, decks that are going to be built out of uh, the heavy hitters uh, card addition mm -hmm. that we're going to see in there. So both the Brutes and the Guardians and the Warriors are going to get uh, hopefully some really nice uh, snacks to uh, dig into for uh, next year's uh, championship series. Yeah, Icelander also represents the last hero able to access ice in Flesh and Blood, leaving yep. the class-constructed metagame, um, which is very significant. I mean, 
ice as a ice as a feature completely changed the way in flesh and game uh flesh and blood was played as soon as it came out ultim wasn't actually initially very well adopted no um people sort of were on it took the, some time to brew yeah they were on the chain train michael hamilton our our last world champion won a calling with oldham a uh, calling very dominated by briar or, or briar deck called cheerios briar and michael hamilton won mm. it was on us the thing is is it was on us nationals yeah. weekend and all the eyes were on us nationals I think they may have streamed the final of the calling, but you know, it's still kind of it, it wasn't the talk of the town. And there was this guy named Michael Hamilton that won it with Oldham, this deck that nobody really played. Right. And next thing we knew it was just tournament after tournament after tournament, and Oldham became one of the best decks that in flesh and blood. Mm, yeah. And then, then Oldham went on a reign and uh, together with uh, Winters What am I forgetting the name? Winters Whale? Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, it was Winter's Whale, so they banned Winter's Whale. And then they had to run with the Titan's Fist, and they were very sad. <laughs> but all of yeah. a sudden, they had, uh, they had the shield that they could help uh, with an additional block, and that made them go even more extreme to the defensive side of things. Let's and be real. Went full yeah. fatigue after that. Let's be real. The, uh, the big offender in old him was Crown of Seeds. Like, Crown of Seeds was this, <laughs> wow, this yeah. tailor-made defensive card. Um, that allowed them to sort of efficiently filter their hand, but also pay for things like arcane damage on their opponent's turn. Because yeah. even when you're playing a deck like Bravo, that can be played more as a defensive deck, when you're presented with something like arcane damage, which is why you see them run the, a the AB1, mm. it's still usually inefficient to pitch an entire card on your opponent's turn. Yep. And Crown of Seed sort of flipped that dynamic on its head. Mm. also allowed you to turbo through your deck so you could get to that, uh, that second cycle really quick. We saw that specifically with Starvo, because Starvo, mm. they would stack the Oakenolds with the, the yep. Lightning and the Ice, and they would play second cycle, just fuse Oakenolds. Speaking of which, I guess since we have time, talk to me about... You know, Living Legend form, I believe it's being played. Ooh, yeah, yeah. First time on like the big, big stage. Yep. What do you, what do you, uh, what do you think is the favorite? Uh, Starvo. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Starvo is a, he's a different breed, huh? Every single person that I've talked to who has been stoked about Living Legends ever since they announced that the Battle Harden was going to be this huge Living Legend tournament is like, oh my god, I got to play Starvo again. And then they start playtesting Casino Starvo and they're like, yeah, it's still as miserable as I remember being both on the like receiving end and playing it because it doesn't feel like that much skill involved. You just draw a hand that says, okay, I can use the Starvo activation and they do that and they come with a big attack and they just do that over and over again until uh, your opponent is dead. And it's like, I yeah, mean, that's called Casino Star Wars. Nothing reason, right? has came into the format that really hurts Star Wars. From what I understand, I haven't played Living Legend format, so there could be cards that are escaping right now. Mm. But another big deck in Living Legend uh, that has a uh, okay matchup into Star Wars Chain. Yeah. The Chain also has to deal with Warmongers Recital. Yeah, that's a that real little, card. That little detail. Uh, yeah, that, yep. that's <laughs> way more effective than the Snag ever was. Um, wow. Snag a card that was previously designed to actually kind of deal with the Chain endgame, but ultimately, um, ultimately wasn't enough. Yeah, so uh, we're going to a bit of a long judge call here, so uh, you probably heard enough of us uh, rambling about uh, everything between Sky and <laughs> Sea right now, so uh, if uh, we maybe can cut to a little bit of a short break and we can figure this uh, judge call out. Weird.
Welcome back here to the Flesh and Blood World Championship in Barcelona. We do have an update on our judge call. It was in relation to a Phoenix Flame that was pitched and was then taken out of the pitch back in the hand. It was a mistake um, by the player because the player did have a Phoenix Flame in the graveyard meant to grab that Phoenix Flame. So we are rewinding the game state and that Phoenix Flame that was taken out of the pitch is being put on the bottom of the deck where it should be and we're sort, of, we're sort of rewinding to a game state that is correct. Definitely. So uh, really great catch there by the judges and the table judges that was uh, available to see that happen. Because we definitely did not see that happen. So uh, awesome that we can uh, make a quick uh, fix on that and get back into the game. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, sorry for, the, sorry for the long judge call. Of course, we had a little bit of technical difficulty there as mm. well. But we are back and we are live and hopefully ready to get back into this match. And I'm not sure if they've exactly started quite yet. Um, but if not, looks like we're going to be back in a normal game state, back to the game, and everything will be fine. So it's always good when we have a, we have a positive outcome from these longer judge calls. Yeah, and the, remember that we had the draw my versus Fi, and uh, they were quite on an equal uh, game state. They were both at around uh, 20 life points, so it was a very intense game on both ends where they were able to both present enough damage to uh, keep themselves at a the similar life total. So it's anybody's game at this, uh, at this point, so we're not missing much. Yeah, they were at parity, and we were going into Philip's turn, and Philip, I believe, had a double Art of War, which so I think that the, the game state parity was about to shift in the favor of Philip. But I guess that, you know, we're going to have to see. I'm not sure what's being corrected in terms of how far we're going back. If he still has a double Art of War, if the Art of War is an Arsenal. Oh yeah, he has a double Art of War. He does right now, or he did before, so what game state we correct to, we will see. Because um, my memory does not serve me well enough <laughs> in order to rewind back. I from. am so amazed by players who you talk to, and they're like, they can just, like, walk you through a game like card by card and you're like i can't even remember what the uh, matchup i played last turn i was the uh, last game and I, i'm like super amazed by the players who are able to memorize all of those little details and i think that is a key uh demeanor for the people that can do that to be able to like mentally go back and remember okay i did that i did that i need to remember not to do that again in order to perfect the game yeah it's especially delightful when it's uh during a bad beat story and they give you part one of part 37 in terms <laughs> of like how they got unlucky and how they lost and you right you tune out like halfway into part one and you're just like i have no <laughs> idea what's going on so I, you had what cards again oh, okay yeah, yeah I there's follow. a there's a player that's very famous of doing that and he does it from <laughs> games that are two years old but Ooh, we are back okay. in the game state. It looks like Yender and Caloria on the table. And Philip does have that Art of War in Arsenal. We have 20 si 27 minutes left in the round. Yeah, we probably have some time extension due to that super long uh, judge call. But uh, imagining how this match will go as uh, both of these uh, decks are running very aggressively, I think mm -hmm. yeah, we're going to be good enough on that. does have the second Art of War in hand as well. So it looks like we rewind to the game state in which we left. Ah, uh, okay. So including the time extension, that's the time we have left. Right, plus one, draw two. Classic. <laughs> so Art of War is a good card. How do you feel about two Art of Wars on the same turn? I'm not too happy about it, actually. Uh, whenever I play a double Art of War, it feels like uh, it's not... It's, I never get the most value out of it. One Art of War is uh, typically good enough to get that extra juice out of your cards. Playing the double Art of War still requires that one card being played out to basically get that one off. And you're trading one card from hand to get two cards back, so you're basically up... Uh, or like at card parity, so to say, because you're playing the Art of War, you're giving away one card to get two cards back, basically, and those cards get plus one. Um, so I have come to the fruition that uh, playing the double Art of War is uh, not my favorite, but uh, absolutely, if you have, feel like you have a really strong turn going into it, then absolutely. And just to get a clear update on exactly where we came in, it was basically exactly where we left off. The change is the Phoenix Flame is back in the deck, and the Dramai has gained two life, so up from 25 to 27. All right. So looking at this hand, seeing uh, questionable uh, lack of starters, if we had run into that same problem again. We saw that quite a lot with Philip when we ran the game, so he's forced actually to get that Phoenix Flame in order to get his turn going. Yep, forced to exchange an entire blue for that Phoenix Flame. Yeah, and that remains with three cards in hand. We do see the Command and Conquer though. But since he had to pitch a full blue into this uh, Phoenix Flame, he now has uh, to pitch uh, another red uh, to get this Command and Conquer out. And that is not great, but I mean, a C and C for eight can be quite difficult to deal with. Also could be quite surprising. I'm not sure that C and C is the card that Aaron Chance will be playing around here. Mm, not really. I'm not sure if he has a defense reaction in Arsenal either. That would be quite awkward. 
But yeah, Philip is running into some very awkward hands here. Having to pitch your get your Phoenix playing for full uh, costs is not what you want to do. Now it does take two cards. And we see the CNC again here on uh, Aaron's uh, site. It's a very, 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 very popular CNC card. CNC could be very, very good here because Aaron Chance most likely can only block for three. Okay, so we're going to opt to play the Lava Vein Loyalty. Can no Flame Scale Furnace available. He do have Flame Kiss, but, but it only helps blue in Arsenal's, or uh, blue in the pitch zone, so it doesn't really accomplish that much. He's not online. I was just wondering, because Aaron Chance likely can only block for six, and he has a counter on that Flame Scale Furnace, if CNC would might be the most disruptive card that could be played here. I would but think so too. I think does know better than I. Exactly. So, I mean, if the Flamescape Furnace was on two, then absolutely I would uh, reconsider. But uh, yeah, opting in to play the Lava Vein Loyalty here for uh, five coming in with the double Art of War here. Does have the go again, but uh, Phi has already been activated, so we can't fetch another Phoenix Flame. So uh, knowing that it's Command and Conquer that is left in his hand, then and only one pitch remaining, it's uh, going to be a very, very sad turn here for Philip. Like you said, Phi already activated. And just an... Right. Philip debating whether to keep the card in hand or to arsenal it, keep it as a popper, or arsenal it as a card that must be played. Oh, yeah. Command and Conquer, definitely a hard, cost, a hard card for Aaron to resolve due to the red nature of his deck. Um, he can't get stuck in that arsenal, especially if Aaron is able to put on a lot of pressure. So it looks like no arsenal currently because of the way it's tilted. No, exactly. So this basically sends the signal also to Aaron that, uh, yeah, that's probably a popper that he has left in his hand because there is no way you're going to leave a card left in hand unless you have that critical popper that can stop uh, Aaron's turn. There's exactly what you want to see as you see your opponent hold back a popper, effectively IP penalty themselves, and you cast a Miragai negating the popper's effectiveness on that first dragon. We see Yenderai come in for three. It feels like Aaron just has the perfect answer to every situation. He understands that uh, oh, that Chroma, popper's not going to do so anything. Devastating. And Chroma getting the extra action point as well. This is huge. If Philip does pop Chroma, Aaron will get an extra action point as well. And did he already attack with the Yendera? Yeah, he attacked with the Yendera first. Did he take damage from that? The life totals could just be updating. Yeah. It went by so quickly, I completely missed that. Yeah, there, we go. there you go. So, Aaron not having any cards left in hand. This Chroma is uh, probably going to see end of its life very shortly. But then uh, Aaron probably feels comfortable enough that there's probably not going to be a second popper in that hand. Extremely unlikely, because we already saw the other Command and Conquer, I believe, the one that was banished via Dominia. Mm -hmm. So only one more left in the deck. Yeah. So Aaron is just uh, coming in hot here and uh, pulling off the uh, best answers to uh, whatever Philip is uh, able to represent. And Philip is not having a great round and uh, is really forced to do a lot of very awkward uh, trade-offs uh, in order to get his turns going. Starting out with four going in here. Pitching a spreading flames one, again drawing into a full red hand to uh, try to combat as much as possible. But it looks like it's going face with this one. Definitely kind of feels like it hasn't been Philip's game. You're having to pitch that entire blue to start off the double Art of War turn. Yeah. We haven't seen a lot of Searing Ember Blades because of the situation where uh, the lack of blues in uh, some of the earlier hands has been missing. And on the hand that we had a lot of blues, they have been going out for the After Wars and had been forced to pitch for those Phoenix Flames. So... Quite awkward turns there, but thanks to the Searing uh, Soaring Strike, sorry, the, the Snatch here is actually going to get the go again effect on the on hit from the Soaring Strike. And getting a card there from uh, Snatch's on hit effect, so it's actually able to pull off a little bit of uh, value out of this uh, three card hand. We'll see what Philip opts to do with this last card in hand, whether it goes into Arsenal or will be committed to that combat chain. The most awkward thing you can do, or you can get out of this draw, is a blue. So, yeah. 
what you would probably prefer to see is uh, some kind of uh, finisher or attack or something that you can uh, draw into Arsenal and uh, get your next uh, hand really big. But uh, is it's just going to be brand. Is the most awkward thing in blue or is it another Command and Conquer where he has the IP panel? Oh, maybe yeah. the, the card war, yeah. No, sorry. The Command and Conquer is probably the more awkward uh, solution. But I always feel like I draw blues out of my snatches. So I always feel like I'm in an awkward position where I don't want to play the blue and I definitely don't want to Arsenal it. So Speaking of blues, Ravenous Ravel hits a red off the top. It's going to be coming in for four go again. I mean, Philip's life total getting very low now. Not going to be long before Aaron Chain's going to be forcing the question. Does critically <laughs> find the third command and conquer? Absolutely necessary to shut down Aaron's sort of pivot turn here. So Philip gains a little bit of space to come back into this game. Oh, it's Saul's the sigil. Yep, up to 21. Aaron Chance Arsenal back over to Philip. Three card hand. Can he put enough pressure on to stop Aaron from being able to close out this game? Mirror guy as well drawn for Aaron. Yeah, Watto could have been in an absolutely awkward situation for Aaron, turned into a really good uh, value plan with that uh, Sidja saving the day. But now Philip has a four-card hand to uh, try and push some things through, but he's already at nine life and starting to get really unhealthy. He does have the uh, blocking capabilities, both on the Flamescape Furnace and on the Tiger Stripe Shukus. So all in all, that's a total of five block blocking capabilities. And also, of course, the Mask of Momentum. So that's a six or seven uh, block uh, capabilities total. But the last thing you want to do is block with that crucial Mask of Momentum. So it's only a three-card hand because he did block with that Command and Conquer in order to pop the end oh, yeah. and stop the turn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, interesting to know the mode on this Enlightened Strike. I wonder if he's deciding, I feel like East Strike draw when all of your Command and Conquerors are gone is probably correct, but maybe you're just, maybe Philip determines that that is not his role in the matchup and that he simply needs to push as much damage as possible. Well, does opt for the draw and will be arsenaling after this. Yeah, I think the plus two uh, power on this uh, E-Strike is not the most value game you can get out of it. It's a really good trade-off to send in that E-Strike and get that card back, arsenal it, and uh, try to get a more uh, bang for your buck uh, on your next turn. I feel like if we see Aaron opt to not block this Enlightened Strike, because this is clearly the last, the last attack that will be committed to this combat chain, we're going to see Aaron try to close out this game. Yeah, knows that there's likely zero poppers left in the deck. Definitely, and I think that's exactly what Aaron was looking for, to make sure or double-check that it was actually three Command and Conquest that has been committed at this point in time. So if Aaron thinks that he can uh, push uh, Fi through to lethal, uh, then he is absolutely looking to keep this hand and try to go for it. All right, Aaron Chance, five-card hand. Will we see the second tome of the, of the game played? Does not look to be the case. We lead it's off the mirror guy. with a mirror guy. It's only coming in for two, but uh, it doesn't have Phantasm, but it uh, doesn't really matter at this point because we all know it's, there's no poppers left on Philip's side of things. Aaron really hasn't seen too many Tome of Imperial Flames. Saw the one, it was impactful, mm -hmm. but you know, kind of a critical card for the Jamai deck to really be able to pull out ahead against a deck like Fight. That being said, Aaron is firmly in the driver's seat at this point with all the poppers gone and working with a five-card hand. Yeah, I think uh, Philip is just trying to stay as healthy as possible now Committed to... Uh, oh, Very see that? nice, after the Flamescale Furnace was committed, so... This can be super awkward for Philip, because uh, one of the drawbacks from playing Fi is that what most of your cards block for two. Uh, so, uh, being able to uh, block out six on this Command and Conquer can possibly require a lot of cards from Aaron. Oh, sorry, from Philip. So, if he didn't block with the Flamescale Furnace as well, he could have potentially put one card in front of this with this Tiger Stripe Shuko in the Furnace, because likely doesn't want to commit the Mask of Momentum mm. to this Command and Conquer yet in the game. Does opt to lose the Arsenal, takes six damage, goes down to three. I think we saw a Lava Vein loyalty hard for me to see from my yeah. perspective. But that is huge for Aaron. Surely we're going to see Philip now try to close out the game on his end. Aaron Chance sitting here at 13 life. Versus a three on Philip's side. This is not the happiest position to be in as the five, but with a four card hand, he opted in to uh, ditch the card he had in Arsenal, the meaning that it's more important that he actually utilizes the attack power he has in his hand. Because as I mentioned, uh, all, most of the five cards or draconic cards block for two, and most of the offensive power is uh, basically three or more. So you get much, much, much more value playing out those uh, red attacks than uh, blocking with them any day of the week. Aaron Chance also knows there's no more Art of Wars left. 
but he can go really wide on this turn. We saw a flame call awakening in a stance. We can tutor for a Phoenix Flame from his uh, graveyard, starting off with this red attack that is uh, the activation uh, needed for popping off with a flame call awakening. And also, as a can tutor for a flame, oh, sorry, for a Phoenix Flame from uh, his graveyard as well. So he can go really, really wide on this one. What do you think are the chances that Aaron covers this mounting anger with a card? Oh, with double card, double Tomo ah. Now we know why the Master Boots are being played. It Makes sense. for that card specifically. So not going to get the plus one from the mounting anger. It does take two cards. I mean, that's a good rate. That's a good rate, absolutely. Assuming those are cards that Aaron really couldn't utilize anyway. And we do have the blue in hand as well, so we're also going to be able to pitch for this uh, Searing Ember Blade to uh, get some more extra value out of this turn. It's going to be... I'm trying to count if he's actually going to get to a lethal point, counting in that he also wants to clear out the Mirror Guy, and it looks like he's going to do exactly that. And there's uh, that Phoenix Lane that was put oh on the bottom of the deck. Possibly. Yeah, uh, it, was, uh, <laughs> it was from the... the from the Yudge Call, call yeah, yeah. yeah. But I'm interested to see that he is actually opting in to go for the Mirror Guy here. Mirror Guy is sitting at 4 life. He's actually have to commit 2 cards into this Mirror Guy in order to do so. But at the end of the day, uh, he needed to do that uh, in the first place. Uh, because Searing Ember Blade also comes in for 3. So, um, I mean, his only option was to go for the Mounting Anger into the Mirror Guy. So I'm a little bit curious on this line he opted to go for. So and then my math is wrong. The Flame Call Awakening actually costs one, so he's not going to be able to come in with the Searing Ember Blade unless he uses the Phoenix Flame Phoenix he's going to fetch from, uh, from his graveyard in order to pitch for that. Also the draw trigger off of Mass. Yeah, huge. And once again we see Mass doing work in this, in this matchup specifically. Oh yeah, so that's what he went for. That's actually really smart. So committing uh, two cards into the Yender Eye after letting the Running Renegade go through is actually super, super smart. Because that's actually securing the Mask of Momentum to get that extra card and be able to push even more damage through. So Aaron opts to take the Searing Ember Blade down to six, or sorry, down to seven. Mm hmm and just a pedestrian lava vein loyalty. It's going to get the <laughs> tiger stripe shoot go, but not enough likely to get a response from Aaron. Aaron opts to take the damage. We go to his turn. Philip sitting at three tiger stripe shoot go, master momentum available for block, one left on flame scale furnace, four card hand, three life. We'll see if Aaron, Aaron chance can close it out here. Yeah, it's a really, really tight game, and it's really down oh, to the right. That's how you started tome. out, though. He found the second tome. Super crucial timing on that one. Will not be banishing the hand here. We go up to four ash, two resources. We're doing Mage the Mage Master Boots. We're doing the Tomb of life from Arsenal. Kendall. Huge turn here from Aaron. It's going to draw into three extra cards and gain life for each card in his hand. Does have Pursuit of Knowledge blue in hand as well. I don't think we're going to see it played. It's one of the few blues in the deck. But funny to see that after the... The Dallas calling recently where that card was somewhat popularized. It's become really, really popular, yeah. And starting off with a Chromai here. Attacking for lethal damage. Yeah, and Philip is not looking too good in this position. Droma or Aaron has absolutely pulled uh, all the... Uh, all the odds in his favor, basically, with uh, this... Uh, some of Yandal play from Arsenal, getting that extra life, getting those extra cards, and be able to push through even more damage with these uh, super powerful attacks. And Philip just sitting at three life, he is uh, running down the wire on his last uh, life total here. Pursuit of Knowledge pitched. We're going to evoke Hyloria. And that's especially rough here. He could potentially block with uh, one card here, but uh, he's going to let uh, Dromai get an extra card, and that could potentially that could mean be lethal. Dragon, exactly. Yeah, two resources so floating. I don't think you want to gamble at this point on that, if you're in Philip's shoes. Aaron Chance looking like 
We might be able to secure this one. I mean, blocking with two cards for this Caloria, or possibly sending the Mask of Momentum on this one. I didn't think about that. We could potentially see that Mask of Momentum gets uh, drawn out of equation here to be able to cover up for this uh, Caloria here. I, I was thinking that we would see the Mask go, but maybe again, it, it might just be too early. Because the Mask, it feels like, would almost guarantee a draw on the next turn for Philip. Working with these two dragons. Yep, we are going to see the mass committed with the snatch. Yeah, because the alternative is that you need to commit two cards from hand, and that is basically going to leave you with uh, an E-strike, <laughs> possibly. Now, can Philip present lethal? He possibly can. The question is, does he want to let Aaron keep these dragons on the board? And that what's the consequences if we do? It's like an E-Strike in hand. So this with E-Strike, even as E-Strike draw, will present lethal, but likely not a relevant lethal because the Flame Skill Furnace would just go, just go in front of it. Mm. Wondering if we're going to see an E-Strike 7 here. Yeah, of course, if we don't go Dragon. If we're clearing Dragon, it's a totally different story. But it'd be hard for Philip to live another turn with no equipment and Aaron having a four-card hand. Looks like we hit Kyloria. Yeah, he was contemplating for a while if he was going to go face with that attack or if he's going to go for the dragon hands. I don't think he can uh, live to see these dragons live another turn on the board. But at the same time, he also has to present something to face in order to uh, get some cards out of Aaron's hand. Uh, so he doesn't come back with even more dragons to publish on the board. So with this E-strike left, it's not... Lily looking like he's leaving himself with a lot of options here. He's able to pitch one for the Phoenix Flame, but that's about it. Yeah, and it looks like the Searing Emerald Blade is not going at Chromon. I don't think so. No, he's blocking with Harden, so... And Chroma is sitting at 2 HP. He's not going to be able to kill it with the Phoenix Flame either. So he's opting to uh, let that one stay. And this is the pickle that uh, Philip is in. So he yeah, here's the E-Strike. So it's going to be... Oh yeah, yeah that's yeah, what yeah, you yeah. can do. Absolutely. But I believe you still go face on this one. I mean, Aaron's at 8, so... Presenting E-Strike to face. It's like he did point at face, so we have 7 here. It's not lethal. It's not enough to kill him. But the question is, is Aaron comfortable to go down to 1? With Chromai on board... It's only a two attack, so he needs to do something more in order to threaten to Philip's one. life total. He goes to one, yeah. So, this could be it if Philip doesn't uh, draw something that he oh. is able to uh, block himself uh, to keep himself alive, then uh, this could be quite crucial. Definitely needed that one to be uh, a red on the Ravenous Rabble. But. Of course, the deck is built to hit there. Yeah, I was going to say, the draw my build is basically all red, snow, blue. So uh, I think it's the most comfortable uh, deck to run the Ravenous Rabble in, for sure. We've seen it come in a little bit into the Fies as of late. I've seen uh, a lot of the recent Fies builds running the Ravenous Rabble to get that extra punch in. But since uh, Fies is also heavy, more, a little bit more heavily on the blue count, you're see, looking at around 10, 10, 11. So um, it's a little bit more risk there on the Fies side of things. And that's the go. burn them all and no AB available. That's going to be it. Very impressive. Aaron Shantz putting on a clinic, playing two Fies in the previous rounds. Closes out both of them. Aaron Chance moves to 11 and 2 here at the World Championship. Wow, exactly showing how it's actually possible for drone mice to beat up the Fies and showing us all how it's actually possible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he didn't even see that many tomes, to be honest. We saw the one. The second one was quite middling, to be honest. Yeah. But Aaron Chance just really grinded out Philip there. You know, Philip definitely saw some variance on his end. That double auto turn was uh, pretty unimpressive. We saw him pitch key cards like Spreading Flames. Yeah. Was on a lot of dragon clearing duty. But 
like we talked about, a lot of people brought fire to this tournament specifically for the Dromai matchup, and I think it's a lot closer than some of these five players give it credit for. Yeah, definitely. And Aaron being able to pull out those big dragons, which required uh, a lot of uh, attacks from the fire to go into that instead of face, was super, super crucial because it really went down to the wire. We saw Dromai go down to 3 HP, and uh, like or at a 5, but like going down that low against a 5 can be really, really scary, but presenting a board state at that uh, point of the game was really, really crucial to keep himself alive in order to force Fi into focusing either on Dragons or face. and it's up to you how you want to let that dance go. Let's be real, that game, there was a huge turning point in that game when Aaron Chance resolved Invoke Dominia and was able to grab and banish one of the three Command and Conquerors, one of them which was sitting in Philip's hand. Yeah. Such a critical turn. Anyway, congratulations to Aaron Shant. Moves on to 11-3 and three here at the World Championships. We're going to cut to a short break and then bring you the next round of Classic Constructed. Be right back.
Welcome back to the booth here for the final round of Swiss here at the World Championships. I am Brian Gottlieb. I am joined by Swedish superstar Erica Forslov. Hey, thank Pleasure you so much. Pleasure to finally share a booth with you, and we couldn't do it at a better time with our final round being played right now. Yeah, absolutely exciting. It's the final round of the Swiss, and it's been going on now for two days straight, and it's been a roller coaster of uh, emotions for everyone involved. We've seen everything. It feels like we've seen every hero. Honestly, so many heroes have passed through our feature match area, and it has all come down to this, the final round to decide our top eight. And I think we have some certainty starting to take place. And I want to go to our standings and I'm going to walk you through exactly what we believe to be going on. Now, I always, always, always like to exercise a bit of caution mm. when we're in this mode, Erica. It, mm. is, it is critical that the viewers out there understand weird things can happen. Tiebreakers can get askew. So I, I hate using the word guarantee, but there are some folks at the top of the standings who I now believe to be guaranteed. And we will get those standings up for you, but I'm just going to talk through them because I know these pretty well now. And I, I think folks are desperate for this information. Uh, we have Yuki Lee Bender at the top of the standings on an absolute tear on Icelander Mortal Lock. That is the one I'm going to say. That, that's a lock. Yuki is going to be our first representative in the top eight. And I love to see her on Icelander. It's uh, a super good pickup that she has been running on the back of Lexi, like back to back, basically. And it's been one of our favorite heroes after Lexi now LLing that she has been basically the ambassador for for a very, very long time. Yeah, and I, I remember, the, you know, there was a period before Lexi got really strong uh, where Yuki was absolutely in on Icelander. She believed in this hero for a very long time, got her chaps going, obviously only furthered them in the interim since Lexi left the meta and it was so funny I I you know Yuki obviously it's almost synonymous with Lexi at this point mm. and I've in fact switched their names several times <laughs> when I'm talking about them but understandably she, yeah yeah she put out kind of a, a sad memento for Lexi saying it was it was hard on her losing her favorite hero and yeah, yeah. how she was going to adopt in the aftermath and she's uh, absolutely rocking it she's she is, showing a depart here's the problem though Erica <laughs> If she wins this tournament, she's going to LL Icelander as well. And she may be on the search That's for the, the thing, second right? time in just a few weeks. Exactly. And we saw so many players bring Icelanders into this, uh, into this tournament. And it's an absolute joy to see how uh, Icelander is turning out. But we also see a huge hero spread uh, in the potential top eight. No, I, I think you're exactly right. But there is a second Icelander who I believe has a very, very strong chance of being a lock. It is Xing Sang coming in from Hong Kong. Hong Kong? on an absolute tear in this tournament. I want you to look through this top 24. You see Xing Sang, you see Pudding Tam, uh, we get to Jack Tang, we get to Alex Lowe, and Alan Lau, all five of those players from Hong Kong in the top 24 here at the World Championship. Yeah, really strong showing here. Typically, we see America being one of the strongest uh, nations to combat in these uh, World Nations uh, tournaments uh, previously. So seeing Asia now uh, taking the part is uh, really, really cool to see. And also seeing some representation from Brazil also that has uh, recently joined the scores with the uh, arm race this past year. Uh, and seeing them just rock up to these tournaments and doing a name for themselves is uh, super our, cool to our see. man in green, Pedro. Pedro doing uh, absolute monstrous work on Reinar has a chance to potentially punch that ticket to the top eight. But let's talk more about these locks. And we have a second Canadian now in the mix. It's Aaron Chance. And Flake was singing the praises of Aaron Chance as a Drow My player all weekend long, just over the moon about technical play, matchup knowledge, and looks to be potentially the lone Drow My who has a shot at making this top eight. We do see another Drow My. It is, of course, the Empress mm. herself, Mara Ferris, down there in 18th place. I don't think she's going to be able to do the tiebreaker wizardry to go ahead and leap forward and make it into that top eight. But it's going to be only Aaron Chance representing the hero that was really on everyone's mind heading into this event. Definitely. I believe Dromai was a super, super uh, strong pick into this uh, tournament. And I expected to see her in the top three, and she did. But uh, Icelander taking that uh, first place uh, out of her grasp was uh, a really, really cool thing to see. And not something that we expected at all. And Aaron has absolutely been showing what he's capable of, or what this hero is capable of, rather. And uh, has been showing off that uh, Fi matchup isn't as scary as we thought it would be yeah so aaron chance i believe in the last two rounds defeated Fi, and yeah. it was Fi supposed to be the draw my killer that's why you brought this hero to the event exactly aaron chance saying no problem whatsoever no fourth place matthew w a man of mystery no last name but i have a story about matthew w, w and this uh -huh. is a, a personal anecdote so i find flesh and blood at the tail end of monarch and you know really start dipping my toes in 
realized the game is something really special, something that I want to explore on higher levels. And I start thinking about maybe playing some PTQs. And I'm at an event uh, to actually play another card games tournament. Mm -hmm. I do poorly in that. And there happens to be a flesh and blood PTQ Ooh. as the backup. And I say, well, that's pretty enticing. You know, I'm starting to learn this game. I think I'm ready to give this a shot. And I go and, you know, I have 30 years of card game experience. I bring it to the table and I, I do quite well in my first foray. I make it to the top four of my first ever pro quest. And... I'm feeling good. I'm feeling like I'm out playing people all day. I really understand the game. Yeah. And I run into a guy named Matthew W., who I don't really know anything about. I notice his uh, gem ID quite short. Yeah. Only a few numbers long. And, right. And uh, we sit down at the table. We start talking. Oh, how long have you been playing? You know, not that long, actually. I just picked it up. Uh, how about you? Uh, a while. <laughs> He's like, I'm like, oh, so, you know, you must be pretty practiced. He's like, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm like top five in the world or something like that in <laughs> ranking right now. I go, oh, okay, well, let's see how this goes. And we sit down and play and, you know, I summon all of my intellectual fortitude and really engage myself in the matchup and I lose. And afterwards, I realize I have no idea how deep the rabbit hole goes in this game. And this guy just showed me how deep it goes. Absolutely played circles around me in that top four. Went on to win that PTQ and just really, really impressed upon me how much learning there is to do around this game. And set me on my journey, honestly, because without his inspiration of playing that tight game, I may not have explored the depths of Flesh and Blood to the same level. But that's what I love about these big tournaments, because you get to face uh, other people than the people you, act you typically meet at your local armories. You get to face some of the best people in the world. And if you're uh, lucky to punch a ticket into this world's tournament, then uh, you never know who you're going to face at that uh, turn one, or in that first pod, or in that first match, or in that first game. Could be absolutely anyone that you might recognize from these earlier streams or these earlier tournaments that has been... Uh, pulling up big numbers yep. so it can be a very intimate scene but at the same time it's so fruitful to get into this tournament and you really get to learn a deeper level out of this game playing against uh, stronger opponents at this at this stage 100 percent, and i'm sure matthew w will have that on display does have a calling top eight on his resume uh, it was the calling baltimore so an unstreamed calling obviously was accompanying the pro tour so it'll be exciting to see matthew w do his thing on the big stage also doing his thing on the big stage huge breakthrough performance from Easton Douglas here and Easton again somebody who's been around these top tables these top finishes for a very long time kind of looking for this hallmark moment in his career getting it on dash breaking through playing a very cool build of dash uh, mm. using those Teclo bases to go ahead and suit up some Evo soul steals ah. and fortitude defenses a little bit really cool stuff yeah, because the only thing we seen of Easton Douglas was uh, when we featured the matches yesterday from Yuki, Easton was his, her first opponent in those draft games. So we only saw Easton Douglas playing his uh, Dash IO deck there against uh, Yuki. Uh, so we haven't really seen uh, that uh, Dash on stream yet, I think. Yeah, I, I don't think we have gotten to have Easton. It's been a few times in our backup feature match, but it hasn't quite made it through the, uh, the big stage. But we'll be doing so tomorrow, looking like a top eight competitor, near for sure. Yeah, and remember that tomorrow we are showcasing all of the top 8 matches, so you're not going to miss any action out of the awesome games that we're going to feature for you tomorrow. So definitely make sure to put some time in your schedule tomorrow, because it's going to be an awesome day. Yeah, I can't wait to bring all 7 of those games. They're going to be all high stakes, all the highest level of flesh and blood possible. The best games you're going to watch. Now we sure. get to the sloppy part of this metagame breakdown, uh, these standings. It's the 10-pointers, and look, things are a little uncertain here. We don't know exactly how things are going to break. We don't know who's going to go ahead and make it through, but we got to explore. We got to see who has what it takes. And I believe, I believe our backup feature match is going to be the ninjas going to war. It is going to be Philip Van Donseler taking on Pudding Tam, Katsu versus Fi. And I want to go ahead and look at Katsu and understand exactly what Katsu is trying to do in this matchup because it is uh, quite a strange place uh, how you have to engage when you're playing Fi. It is, of course, Katsu the Wanderer. You see those key harmonized Kadachis, Surging Strike, Mask of Momentum, going to be the cards we're keeping a close eye on. Definitely. And uh, the Surging Strikes here being the key factor here. And uh, I think 
facing off uh, Fai is a very nice comforting uh, pace for Katsu because uh, he's going to present a lot of on hits and he's going to be able to tutor with his uh, Katsu ability for these combo pieces to be able to extra uh, extrapolate a lot of value out of his turns and Fai does not typically have a lot of blocking capabilities so Fai is not super super happy to go into a Katsu to be able to put up with those uh, blocks in order to stop uh, Katsu from doing what Katsu does best. Yeah, I think ex you're exactly right. It is going to be uh, a, a bit of a struggle on the Fi side to stop these on hits. And one of the big reasons to bring Katsu to the table is to take on Fi. And meanwhile, on the Fi side of things, we know what this deck wants to do. It wants to pop off. We're not looking to defend. We're looking to push damage using things like Lava Burst, like Art of War. I do not believe we will see Mask of Momentum in this matchup. I'm expecting this will absolutely be a Mask of the Pouncing Link setup as Fi just tries to get Katsu dead as fast as possible. And we could be in some for some fireworks here in the future match area. Definitely. Since Fi's card doesn't block for a whole lot, then uh, all he can do is basically go all powers red on uh, all of his cards. And I think going offensive on all of his cards is what he's going to try to accomplish here and uh, basically hope that uh, Katsu doesn't uh, draw everything that he needs in order to get those big turns off. Yeah, and on the Fi side, I want to watch very carefully the equipment that is presented. I think it tells such a huge story. You know, there is a school of thought that talks about Flamescale Furnace stopping those critical on hits. For my money, I just don't care about defending. I just want my output to be so impressive that I put these heroes under pressure immediately. And I wonder if maybe this is the chance for Findel Spring Tunic. I do think I branch from the norm as I approach five, but I'm a huge, huge proponent that that one resource is actually the catalyst for all of your best output. Getting the free Art of War, keeping that in Arsenal for a few turns, that's what I want to be doing as Fi, and I wonder if our Fire player is going to agree with the approach in this scenario. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting to see if uh, Thomas is op or they're just going to go look for the Mask of Momentum or the Mask of the Pouncing Links uh, going into this tournament because Mask of Mo Momentum can still present that uh, critical on it for drawing that extra card that might actually have to force uh, Katsu to be giving him some cards for blocking uh, at a later stage. So uh, I would be super curious to see uh, what uh, our five opponents go opt into. A lot of nuance to this matchup for sure. And I, I wonder how much these players have prepared for exactly this because these are somewhat dark horses in this tournament now good representation for both these heroes but when you're sitting down you go i'm going to play the world championships i think three heroes were on everyone's mind i think it was dromai i think it was bravo and i think icelander was still there but showed up a little bit more than maybe some people expected and now you're playing a ninja match for your top eight berth pretty incredible stuff i love to see it the ninjas are having a special place in my heart i've been on both sides of this table in this exact matchup several times and uh, it's always a narrowing experience uh, pulling off uh, seeing which one is gonna come out successful and we actually do see the mask of the pouncing links pulled off here from philip yeah looking to just go ahead and get that explosive damage there is a flame scale furnace so again philip branching from the way i choose to approach this matchup i understand though and philip also playing for a top eight berth here at world so trust him again yeah. enlightened strike going to be the follow-up to this brand with cinder claw cinder claw just going ahead and getting those chain links going getting nice and wide putting time with lord of wind just an old school katsu ready to do his thing and also putting tam with Putting Tam sleeves, I believe, there, and I, I think they're custom made to represent Katsu. It feels like this is just a Katsu main through and through. Yeah, I love to see it. And uh, I also love that uh, most of the Asian players are playing a various amount of range of uh, heroes and are really representing a lot of wide range of hero pools. And uh, we also see that uh, Katsu has, or Pudding, has decided to bring in his Heart and Cross Wrap to be able to get that free Surging Strike uh, right off to uh, not having to pitch extra cards into that to be able to come in with those Kadashis again and uh, just present so much damage That's on a wide turn. a beautiful catch and uh, it's interesting. I, we kind of set up five as the absolute aggressor in this matchup but the more i look at this list from putting tam mm. the more i wonder if he actually wants to take the aggressive role here now certainly maybe floats a little bit more to the middle does have access to things uh like good defensive uh reactions like flick flack but this setup really points me in a direction that putting tam is looking to push damage pretty quickly and we might be in for a barn burner here yeah, Some blocking coming from Fi here. Warmonger's Diplomacy committed to defense of the Be Like Water. I get it. That's a very, very threatening attack. And a yellow descending gust wave is the follow-up here. 
Yeah, so blocking with uh, one mongoose diplomacy here could be uh, really good, especially if you have those extra blues in hand. So it doesn't really do much in this uh, matchup because uh, one mongoose diplomacy, even if you choose uh, war, you can just keep on going with your game plan because there is no non attacks uh, that you basically want to play in this uh, matchup. But uh, Fai and Katsu, both alike, are happy to run this war among its diplomacy because it has that crucial zero cost which is going to activate those uh, Kodashis. So it's basically uh, free in to combat the um, Asalias in the in the rounds. Yeah, very, very versatile blue block three included in many decks. Felt like the metagame cooled on Warmonger's Diplomacy a little bit. I think it's coming back around this weekend. Very, very good against those mech heroes for sure. Uh, that oh, I yeah. know a lot of players had on their mind coming into the weekend. Absolutely. We're going to see the first Katsu Tutor coming in here. We're going to fetch a little Fluster Fist out of this uh, Descendant Gustway on him. Yeah, love it. Just a little damage maximization. Oh, it looks like maybe a, a different approach for putting Tam. Had a second a thought. A second thought, yeah. Yeah, going for a Bonds instead. Has the Fluster Fist in the bin already. Maybe just looking to get maximum value out of that. Looks like we're getting a little bit of a judge check to see if it's uh, okay to change his mind in the middle of shuffle here. Yeah, and it looks like it's going to get the nod, and it is going to be Bonds of Ancestry coming out. Going to go ahead and banish that blue Fluster Fist. Now go find red Fluster Fist. Looks good to me. Yeah, so this looks like a much better line yeah, than the one he opted for to begin for with. Sure. So uh, probably some nerves coming into this game, and I can absolutely imagine this is the win and in for some of these players going into this last crucial round, and it could mean a crucial top eight uh, playoff tomorrow, or you're going to be sitting on the bench and probably play some uh, Living Legends in the Battle Harden or not tomorrow. So uh, it's a huge, important game, this last uh, Swiss game that we have today. So... Uh, yeah, and the players has been going on for a really, really long day as well. So uh, we uh, expect the players to uh, play their best, of course. But uh, of course, you can make mistakes when you're fatigued and uh, you have a lot of nerves and you have a lot of things uh, going on at the same time. Yeah, this is a tough, tough spot. You've been playing all day long. It is time now for the Harmonized Kadachis. Coming in one and one is the expectation. Close this chain off with a Fluster Fist. There's going to be one more point. Taken. Harmonized Kadachi again. And critically, still going to be offering that mask of momentum on the last Fluster Fist here. So, really putting Philip to the test. Does he want to defend in this spot? Yeah, Fluster Fist being a really nice addition here. So, a 0 for 4 with the. Uh not specifically on it, but uh, being able to finish things off with that uh, on hit of the Mask of Momentum instead uh, can be absolutely crucial. And uh, Philip opting in to use his Flame Scale Furnace yeah, on the Kadashis. Yeah, like the decision there. Yeah, to make sure that he doesn't get the extra benefit of the Mask of Momentum here. You do not want to give putting an Arsenal going into the next turn. So a wise block from Philip, cutting off that Mask of Momentum trigger at the pass. Going to start things off pitching a blue. Looks like Mounting Anger is the play to start the turn. Yeah, we saw Philip last game playing against the Jomai, and things weren't really going his way. He was drawing into a lot of full red hands, and whenever he played an Art of War, he drew into some clunky hands without these crucial, crucial starters in order to get his uh, Draconic uh, Chainlinks going, in order to get off his Searing Ember Flame, in order to get off his Fire ability. It was really, really crippling to see uh, some of his hands where he has to be forced to pitch for a Phoenix Flame in order to get them going. It's like putting lining up blocks here. Going to move that Breaking Scales forward, get that... Battle-worn value while you can, because you may want to use that on a future turn. Ancestral Empowerment also committed to the defense here for Pudding. Yeah, not giving the extra value from the Mounting Anger plus one on hit, so uh, absolutely respecting uh, that extra damage there. Searing Ember Blade, now the next thing on the chain link. Yeah, and since we're running Mask of the Pouncing Links, uh, we have Pudding don't need to worry about any potential uh, on-hits uh, from the third or much more chain links uh, from any potential uh, upcoming uh, hits. And uh, we're going to see a Phoenix Flame being tutored here. Yeah, here is the Phoenix Flame. Unfortunately, he had to pitch the Salty Wound in order to get that crucial Phoenix Flame, but... Uh, Opting in to go as, or try to go as wide as possible and present as much damage as possible, of course. It is a crucial aggro mirror, so uh, being able to find uh, those extra spaces of value is absolutely crucial. Getting nice and wide on this chain now, as 5 does like to do. 
we mentioned putting looking to have a little bit more aggressive slant to this katsu deck but here's Ooh. a test for that snatch and it is the breeze rider and there's not even a here. thought on that the yeah. thing is you're slamming down the blocks and I respecting that snatch 100 percent from putting that was an excellent spot to use the boots get them committed yeah, Pudding might not be having the strongest hand, so using uh, the block capability that uh, Katsu has available, because most of his Ninja pure cards has this tree block available to them, so uh, he's going to be able to uh, block off one most of these on hits uh, much more uh, effectively. Yeah, putting a little bit more aggressive, though, you do see things like 100 wins in the list, only two block there, True. just looking to push these chain links. And I, I do like the approach into this matchup. We've seen thus far it has gone very well from put inside, has a life total lead. And also, I think critically, has the option to shift gears on turn. Fi really only plays one way. You do not want to be defending as Fi. You want to be pushing damage turn after turn after turn. Sometimes that strategic flexibility can be extremely, extremely powerful while still offering enough threatening on hits as the game goes on. Looks like yeah. just vanilla damage gonna start off the turn here. Brand with Cinder Claw. And nice I also starter. I also see the command and conquering in Pudding Tam's uh, hand, and I really, really love uh, the command and conquerors in this matchup specifically. Oh, yeah. It might not look like much, but uh, what you often try to do is set up that arsenal and uh, try to go even wider with a five card hand. So Playing that uh, on hit that Command and Conquer offers is really, really awkward, especially for Fire that has uh, little to no block on his uh, two block uh, Ninja Draconic attacks. Uh, so, this uh, Command and Conquer might uh, be doing effective work here. Thus far, Pudding says, Send me the bill. I don't care. <laughs> do your worst. I'm going to do something even nastier in response to you. And I do think I see surging in hand, maybe even descendant. So a natural combo draw, potentially, and I think there's a blue as well in Lord of the Wind. So Pudding seems to have it all on this next turn, and Philip's going to need to offer something very threatening here to try and break up the current laissez-faire stance of Pudding as he just takes hit after hit from this Fi. Yeah, the only awkwardness that he has here is that he doesn't really have a card that he wants to tutor for Katsu. Of course, whenever he tutors for Katsu, he has to give up a zero-cost attack in order to do so. And uh, with that Command and Conquer left over that he could potentially want to be throwing away for such ability, uh, he's just not probably going to be able to do that. But as you mentioned, drawing into that natural surging strike into Descendant Gustray is exactly what you want to see uh, as the Katsu player. I wonder if this is a spot for Heart and Cross Trap, potentially. Yeah. Could be a... Really good chance for putting to get value. And I think Philip senses, all right, shields are down. I need to push as much damage as possible here. Looking like he's moving that salt the wound to the front of the deck. Is going to pull it aside. Good read from Philip. Putting absolutely does not want to defend on this turn. Yeah, capitalizing on a turn where you realize your opponent does not want to block this turn. And that should give you the bells ringing that uh, you can go all heads blazing and capitalize on that uh, Mask of the Punching Lynx, getting the Salt of the Wound. And uh, just bet that uh, they will not block, probably not block on this uh, Brand of the Sinterklaar either. Mm -hmm. And then you will get the extra plus one on each of these attacks uh, going into the Salt of the Wound. Yeah, I like the read, and I think putting, again, is just content to go ahead and take this fairly substantial amount of damage. It is going to be below that 20 life threshold after this Salt of Wound comes through for six. We assume there's no block here, given how the rest of the turn has played out. And yeah, send me the bill. Let's do it. Yeah, Pudding just takes it. He's like, yeah, whatever. I'm just going to come at you. Guns oh, blazing seven, on the return. Definitely. It's a huge turn here for Philip, really capitalizing on the knowledge that his opponent is not looking to block this turn. And so uh, looking for a huge comeback here, potentially on Pudding's side of things, opting to pitch the Lord of the Wind for this first critical surging strike. And since we already have the Descendant Gustway follow-up, the question now becomes if Philip is daring to block the surging strike or not. I think if I was in Philip's shoes, I have all the information that we're, pos we're probably looking into a natural uh, line in the potential hands of Pudding here. You have to smell something here. There's just trouble brewing mm. if you are sitting in Philip's seat. Nobody wants to take that much damage from Phi happily. And this surging strike is a big sign that there's a lot more to come behind this. Yeah, because it's so backbreaking if you want to take a bet on like, yeah, I don't think you have it, and then you block the starting strike, and then they have it, and you're like, oh no. Uh, especially if they come in with a whelming gust wave that also has the on-hit uh, draw card effect, and that is absolutely devastating. Feels like this is the first big crucible of this match for Philip. 
Starting off with a surging strike is never where you want to be when facing down an Akatsu. The world is your oyster as Akatsu with a blue pitch into surging strike. Anything can happen from this point. And Philip knows that, unfortunately, does not defend well. Still five. Still not defensive options on that side. And you see a hand full of two blocks. Mm. Uh, you know, only Tiger Stripe Shuko potentially able to commit the defense. But you want to keep that really out there for as long as possible. Pull as much damage as you can out of the Tiger Stripe Shuko before you have to commit it to defense. So we'll see if this is the moment where Philip wants to seek out a little defense. Philip is staring down an Archer Ward. That is a card that he does not want to use in this way that we are absolutely seeing right now. The popular defensive Archer War is looking to be committed here. You say popular, I say, <laughs> ugh. You do not want it's to be It's the necessary that. evil at times, necessary right? Evil. That, is a, <laughs> that is a description I will sign on with. And I, I think you're exactly right. It was a nice draw here with the Enlightened Strike. So a three block available could use that in conjunction with the Flamescale Furnace to get a clean block on this Surging Strike. So a good hit there. Not many three blocks in the deck was able to find one was Philip, And gets a two card block onto this Surging Strike. But there is a problem. Putting I did not Dan see that Dr. War coming. Ready with his own art of war. That is huge. Dan. And we said there were some cards in this list that pointed towards putting one to be very aggressive. How about three art of war? I feel like I'm back. You know, I just told a story about the days when I started playing Flesh and Blood. I, I feel like I'm in that moment right now where I'm learning the game playing Katsu. My Katsu list has three art of war. That's how you played Katsu back in those <laughs> days. But you don't see it too much these days. Uh, putting, though his own take on Katsu and paying big dividends on this turn. You see the follow-up descending Gust Wave coming in for six now. I love to see this. I have also not been seeing a lot of Art Wars in the Feverish Katsu list, and I've not been running them uh, myself, being they are quite awkward at times uh, running in Katsu compared to like the Fais who has this uh, automatic go against. But seeing now the power of this Art War on this turn specifically, I might be converted. Huge payoff here for putting Tam, and we'll have to see how the rest of the turn is going to play out. Still two cards at the ready. No resources, but there are options like Heart and Cross Strap out there. Could just find a blue, be ready with those harmonized Kadachis. But this gust wave looks like it is going to come through. What is the follow up from putting Tam? An absolutely oh, massive turn. Oh turn. my god. Huge, huge combination of cards for putting. Just the absolute perfect hand here. Now he doesn't have the dishonor, so we don't have to worry about that at least when we're on the Philip side of things. But, um,. Or oh, are we 2 3 for Cat? We did 2 3 for Katsu before, right? So we got the bonds from there, maybe. Yeah, possible. What is the grab here from putting? What are we going to offer at the end of the chain? We are, of course, approaching Mask of Momentum trigger as well. Looks like it is going to be that red fluster fist one more time. Yeah, so the next attack presented is going to have the max trigger on it, unless it's the Kadashis, of course, because you need to have that attack action card uh, on hits in order to get off the payback on the max momentum. It does not affect on the Kadashis, unfortunately. Yeah, it does have the option of doing something like double Kadachi into the yeah. Fluster Fist if the pitch is there. So still a lot of options available for putting a lot of damage being offered on this turn thus far. Still more to come. Potentially max momentum trigger setting up the next turn. How will Philip get out of this sticky situation this very aggressive katsu list has put him in early on in this round 14 showdown yeah and it's a little bit of an awkward position for philip because he already committed his hand for a full defensive value to get the value back from his art of war that he committed super super early into this turn and i think that was actually a really smart choice because his hand doesn't look to be super super nice in order to get a good uh, payback in case this turn was turning out to be really really big which it turned out to be immensely and uh, thanks to this uh, art of war playback on the starting strike from the time presenting so I would not be super happy in Philip's shoes looking down this uh, huge line here that Pudding is presenting. Yeah, it looks like he is really, really torn. Does not want to eat this Bonds. Have to worry about something like Mask. But there's just not good blocks here. And it is going to require the Tiger Stripe Shuko to be committed alongside Lava Burst. Does cover this. But here's this Fluster Fist at the end of the chain. Just five more damage. And is it worth just giving up last card in hand? It's just a soul bead strike. You really don't want that card in Arsenal. 
blue soul bead strike maybe just thinking about a four block here yeah try to cover up some damage and maybe hope that katsu doesn't have a big uh, as big of a turn next turn around so he can maybe push back some damage on his turn after that possibly uh, He's just so gonna yeah. take the okay. five though yeah interesting maybe thinking about an ember blade activation on the next turn let's see how philip wants to play this one out because as you mentioned if it's a blue i don't think he's gonna just capitalize that in arsenal there's no way yeah it can be a really awkward card to leverage uh, you know you need zero cost oh, it was red, oh, it's red okay that makes sense yeah fine play i mean blocking four or presenting four i think uh, i'm opting in for damage <laughs> yeah i i think that's exactly right that's how you have to approach things as phi uh especially when you know the Katsu is going to be facing you down with a five-card hand on the next turn. And let's see what Pudding's able to put together here. I think I see a Magenshi release. Maybe another Fluster Fist in hand. So has some defensive options as well. Good three blocks available to Pudding. Mm. Yeah, this is both guns blazing on both sides of the table. It's, the life totals are absolutely on equal terms. So uh, it's anybody's games at this point still both players being able to present really really strong lines but uh, now we see uh, both equipments are just being turned down and uh, there's not much left in order to uh, use to both block and go aggressively at least on five side of things uh, pudding still has the mask momentum available to him and the heart and cross trap to be able to force in another surging strike line to go with it so from uh, an equipment's perspective uh, pudding is looking really really solid at this point yeah nice equipment options available for pudding and I know old school Katsu fans out there are just absolutely losing their minds right now to see this sort of revisionist take on Katsu, kicking it old school with the full Magenshi release line. Many, many excited folks out there right now to see this return to form for one of the OG aggressive decks in Flesh and Blood, Katsu. Surging strike to start the turn, big start here for Pudding. I'm really curious that he's opting in to push this Magenshi release yellow into this uh, Surging Strike. Not opting to use the Heart and Cross Strap yet again. Uh, but yeah, not finding uh, any better use for that Magenshi as you can't tutor it, right? For the catcher ability. Absolutely. You can always find it the second go around. A lot of flexibility as Katsu. Player but also, now. I haven't seen a lot of Katsu running the Magenshi line as of late, so no, no, I'm super, super fun to see. Out of favor. Completely out of favor. And There's I, so many lines to choose from these days, so you mean, you got to make some great priorities in the Katsu decks these days. Yeah, and I love to see Pudding going back to these. These are powerful cards. These are really, really impactful cards. Definitely. There's, there's no question that certainly new options have been presented to Katsu, but these options are not invalidated. They very much have their own strategic purposes. Yeah, Philip weighing down his options here. He does not have any equipment blocks to go anymore. And he's faced with the same question once again. Does Pudding have the line naturally? Or is he feeling forced to block out this critical starting strike? Yeah, I think natural or not, that Katsu ability just so threatening in this spot, able to complete very well. And this is the kind of situations you get in against katsu and one of the reasons why katsu has maintained a place in this metagame even through the lexi meta uh, heroes that don't want to defend do not want to see katsu it's a real problem on the other side of the table and you're seeing exactly why with this scenario here that's what i love about katsu katsu always asking the question like yeah here i come with my uh, non-special attack they just have go again right but then you have the katsu ability to just uh, help you power through those combo lines and just helping you tutor your perfect turns again and again so uh, yeah, and philip is going to take and it is going to be a katsu activation fluster fists discarded going to find the perfect piece here it is going to be whelming gust wave coming in for four yeah and this is huge because this is now presenting an on hit before the mask of momentum trigger so if put if philip is looking to block a card this one's got to be it has to be yeah I, I think this chain can get absolutely out of control if this whelming gust wave hits yeah, and looking down at only 12 life, if that decides to take this, it's going to go down to 8. And that's going to be not very hard to uh, push over from Puddings from this point out. So having still one card remaining at his disposal as well uh, to push even further. I do want to point out, though, that Breaking Scales still available. Mm. Making it very awkward on Philip's side if you have a handful of two blocks. You need to overblock everything that you don't want to hit at this point. How it's many times have I forgotten about that one? Yeah, uh, we all have. We've all <laughs> been there. And it will absolutely punish you. 
you feel good, you block the four, you feel like you're doing a clean block, and then all of a sudden... Breaking scales. Oh. <laughs> breaking scales, breaking hearts, since the first days of Flesh and Blood. <laughs> since WTR. And it is going to be two cards presented here. Lava Vein Loyalty. So we do have a clean block, and that is just going to go ahead and end the turn for putting. So a wise block, I believe, from Philip. Have to find spots to stop Katsu's momentum. Cannot let him go unchecked, given how these life totals are. But if you're Philip, you got to produce some offense, too. You can't just sit there and take these salvos over and over, because you're going to get caught without any defensive options at some point. It is going to be Enlightened Strike here. Going to prioritize the arsenal, and I like this decision. You need to find a big hand. You kind of need putting to brick at this point, honestly, to get your chances to get back into this game. Yeah, getting that extra card out of the E-Strike is absolutely the best value you can get, because a plus two from the E-Strike at this point doesn't really do much, but being able to get a card from your deck that can present three and possibly four or even more, imagine getting another E-Strike off of the uh, draw card of the E-Strike. This E-Strike uh, can really set you up for a big turn next time if you, uh, if you are required to block with most of your cards next turn. So... Um, I've also been in those situations where you just draw a blue and then you are sad and <laughs> you... But it, you gotta play for your outs, right? So I believe drawing a card there is the absolute right thing to do. Best players in the world don't play not to lose, they play to win. And exactly. I think that is 100% correct. Seeing Philip have a think here, is ultimately gonna go ahead and Arsenal, had those Snapdragon Scalers available should he have wanted to use them, did not. But I think we're gonna see a pretty big turn here from putting, I believe... It may be a double hundred wins turn, and if so, we're going to have some really problematic breakpoints offered across this turn. There is a Dishonor as well, so blue available to get those Kodachis going, as well as that Arsenal that was saved from the last turn. And I, I am concerned for Philip right now, I'll be frank. I think there is a very real danger that Pudding could just go ahead and close the door at any point now. Philip going to have to navigate with the utmost care on these turns. Yeah, and Katsu also having the Kodachis available, so when you get down to that, those last little life points then those kodachis are absolutely devastating to look down upon and all of a sudden you're presented with uh, must block on this kodachis at a certain point in time so uh, being in that kodachi lock situation is never what you want to be so this hundred wins looks to have hit here three damage presented to fill up looks like we're double ahead. checking the life totals yeah, here just go ahead and get this sorted Looks like players are now in agreement. With 100 wins hitting, it is time for a Katsu activation. We'll see what the discard is. Dishonor being put aside. It is another 100 wins in hand. It is. So do we go get a third 100 wins here? Is that He already played 100 wins, right? So he can't get that from his uh, deck, right? But uh, I'm uh, thinking um, Wins of Eternity, maybe? Okay. I could buy it. With the double hundred wins, it's uh, wins of eternity is uh, four attack at this point. But I mean, I'm curious to see what Pudding uh, decides to opt for. But first, he needs to decide what to uh, put into his graveyard in order to tutor for that uh, Katsu trigger. Yeah, thinking very carefully through this turn. I mean, I, I get it. This is a huge turn, a huge decision here. Looks like the Dishonor is going to be discarded. Let's see what the find is here from Pudding. Yeah, and putting that Dishonored in uh, discard pile also helps him uh, tutor for that with the bonds in at a later stage where he can then put that into Banish and go fetch for another Dishonored to complete the line in a future state of the game. It is just going to be Whelming Gust Wave here. And let's see what we want to do with that. Is that just our best zero left in the deck? Have used a lot of Fluster Fist thus far. Without the Surging Strike, it doesn't really have the combo, so... Uh Interesting to see. Uh, we we'll see the Breeze, breeze Race Breeze Rider first. Boots activation. Do not see this one often and you see Philip having a reach. Gonna go ahead and give that a read. Yeah, those combo cards are gonna have go again, and that makes a lot of sense in conjunction. Yeah, because Wellman Gustway without this critical partner surging strike is not gonna have go again. So absolutely a, a beautiful place to uh, push in those uh, value on the Breeze Rider Boots. Eh? Here is that second hundred wins. Gonna get buffed up to four. Critical break point here. This is what I love about the 100 wins. It's just like the more you have, the more you do, right? And with the Wins of Eternity being able to close things out, you're also going to be able to push a lot of damage with those. I, I think Pudding is in a great spot here. Going to have go again throughout the turn. Has the Whelming Gust Wave ready. And critically has Breaking Scales at the ready. I think that is a huge, huge component of this turn. 
that Philip has to account for, and it's going to be very difficult in his seat to do so. Maybe a Phoenix Flame in hand for Philip. Oh, that would be devastating. Looking at his last life uh, points here, and Pudding sitting at reasonably comfortable at uh, 12. There's still some ways to go here for Philip to, uh, to be able to push back. Here's this whelming gust wave. It is just vanilla damage at this point, but it's offering that mask trigger, and it's backed up by breaking scales. That's a really big deal. Demands two cards from Philip if he wants to go ahead and stop this offensive onslaught. Yeah, because we cannot forget the breaking scales that uh, he's able to utilize to push this one over. So even if Philip decides to use block with one card, he can absolutely be blown out of the water here. So really needs to respect that uh, breaking scales is uh, available here. So much to consider for Philip. So much risk every single step of this combat chain. Puzzling over what Katsu has left. What other threats are still in the deck? It's hard, man. You've seen some weird cards out of pudding that you just yeah. don't expect anymore from Katsus. And Philip, I think, has no certainty exactly what is left in the deck. It could be anything at this point. Yeah, he's seen the yellow whelming, so he, he at least knows he does one. Yeah. So he's got a Phoenix Flame for it sure. It is right. Are we looking at another defensive art war? We are! Oh, oh. War as well. Okay, well, look, this is going to get the Phoenix Flame out of hand, and I, I think that is a very, very important yes. first step. Looking for two defensive cards here. Really needs to find some three blocks if he's going to make it out of this turn. Okay, you really want to put four in front of this at only one card cost. I see a Soul Bead Strike. Awesome. Awesome pickup there. And a Lava Burst. So he has several four blocks now available true, to him with this other war. Philip. Fantastic. Covers that up for four. Yeah, Follow but... up on this Gust Wave... It's into the bonds. Ancestry, a perfect draw from Pudding. Offering four go again once more. So this, Mask is off the table, but damage is not. Yeah, and the scariest thing about the bonds, it doesn't really have an on-hit effect. You just play it, and you get this uh, automatic on-hit, not on-hit effect, but on the added effect of uh, being able to push a card from your graveyard into your banished, and being able to put that exact same card uh, with your choice of uh, which pitch you want to use yeah, it for. we're going to get this honor here. So just a tremendous threat every step of the way coming out from putting Tam. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of damage, but the Dishonor on-hit effect, I believe you need a starting strike in order to complete that. So the on-hit effect is relevant at this point because we're looking down at on-hit, you are dead. dead. So yeah, that's the best on-hit. <laughs> that's the best on -hit. Absolute best on-hit. Defend yeah. for three on the bonds. Leak one damage, falls to four. Yeah, Pudding is firmly in the driver's seat at this point in time. He has more clean block, though. all the tempo going. And oh, if we see the commander conquer, and Marshall, and that place is open! Wow! He moves on to presumably, we don't, we don't make guarantees here, but seems to have done absolutely everything he can to try and find his way into our top eight on one of the wildest builds of Katsu we've seen since WTR, just going full old school, kicking it McGenshi style and going ahead and just a dominating performance here in the feature match area. Absolutely love to see it. And we see Akatsu in potential top eight, but most likely at this point in time. And it's an it's absolute good. joy to see. When did we see Akatsu in top eight last time? I don't even remember. It has been a long time. Wow. It's been a long time. Uh, you know, Katsu has been floating around these top eights, has been a real threat uh, at some of the, the smaller events, certainly like falling top eights very much on the table, but I don't know if anyone really had a Lord of Wind McGenshi release Katsu as one of their potential top eight contenders. And again, just temper your expectations, Katsu fans. We can't get ahead of ourselves, but things look very, very good for putting right now. And also the utilization there of the Heart and Cross Trap, not utilizing that earlier on and so having that patience. available to him on that Command and Conquer. Absolutely amazing play there by putting them. Yeah, you could tell just uh, someone who has absolutely rehearsed all the lines seemed exceedingly comfortable every single step of the way knew exactly what he wanted to achieve what he wanted to do and w what a fitting end to this two days of competition erica i i think this metagame has sort of rejuvenated wtr in a lot of ways we spent a lot of time with heroes like katsu like reinar like dorinthia prominently featured down in our future match area. And look, the numbers for these heroes mm. weren't massive. 
No. 10-7-2 representation yeah. on day two. But these players absolutely made these heroes like look like legitimate threats going forward. And I wonder if some of those numbers are more about people not really believing in what these heroes could do yet. And then you go to our conversion rates and, and you see those monster conversion rates from someone like Reinar with a 59% conversion rate. You know, things a little stickier for Katsu and Dory, but still the players who can get a lot out of these WTR heroes they make them shine every step of the way. Yeah, and we love to see it. Like, these players coming to this stage, absolutely mastering their heroes and probably bringing like their pet deck, so to speak, into these tournaments that they have perfectioned over a very, very long period of time and just showing excellence here, capitalizing on a very, very wide meta. And you can never discount all of these old school heroes uh, out of the contention uh, into, into this meta. I think that's the best thing about the state of the flesh and blood meta as I see it right now. It feels like it rewards Good play and good deck building. Definitely. And not a hero. I, I, I just think it's kind of hero agnostic at this point. If you know your plans, if you know your hero inside and out, there's so many of these heroes being represented just within striking distance of that top eight. You know, there is a Max Nitro played by Chris Ayali. Mm. It's going to end up somewhere in those top tables. Probably not going to punch the top eight. But just strange, strange hero choices really shining throughout the weekend. And it's a bold new step forward for Flesh and Blood, kind of casting off some of the shackles of the Tales of Aria meta, and only one Ice Hero left in the game, maybe leaving when we finish our top eight at the end of the Yeah, hour. not for long, right? Yeah, I mean, if I stand there, to pull off, then uh, she's on the 990 cups of uh, the Living Legend points era, so she is uh, looking at the exit door and uh, feeling the end of, her, end of her line here. Yeah, I think that's what's so exciting about where we're at. Not only have we just seen a massive, massive seismic shift in the metagame, we might be on the cusp of another one. We yeah. might be on the cusp of another exciting moment in Flesh and Blood where heroes like, say, Bolton, who is historically kept down by Icelander, where these ninjas, yeah. who actually have looked extremely impressive over the course of this two days of competition, maybe get their shackles taken off a little bit more. If I'm in putting Tam's spot, I'm so happy if I don't have to deal with an Icelander in the next tournament I play. Absolutely. I mean, the tight lines that you have in Katsu with that uh, pitch perfect strategy and the Kadashi is costing one for one, it's uh, absolutely crucial not to get that frostbite into your face. Yeah. Uh, so it can actually be devastating to face off that Icelander. So I would be super happy if I was a Katsu main to see Icelander hit the horizon there. Um, and we'll see. Uh, I'm super, super excited to see how the top eight is gonna is gonna develop. But we need those crucial last games in order to uh, see how that develops. You're you're exactly right, Erica. And here's what I want to do. I, I want to take a brief break. We're gonna get our stuff together. We're gonna get these standings sorted out. We're gonna get our final results in. And after we have done so, we will come back live and we will let you know who you will be seeing in our top eight tomorrow where we will bring you all seven of those matches bear with us for just a moment we'll be back in just a few to tell you who your top eight competitors are here at the world championships Stay put. Yeah, so like my idea was just like us brainstorming as part of the bit and then like trying to do something silly with whatever we record and then put Isaac's head on it too. That's a great idea. What are we called again? The Attack Action Podcast. Sup, 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 Attack Action Podcast, sup. Which is a bit of a misnomer because we're also a YouTube this is what you can expect. We do deck tags. 
<laughs> we do podcast. YouTube videos. What is the reaction step? It's a video podcast, which doesn't make sense. It's like a talk show. It's a talk show. Yeah. Because we just go on there and say whatever the hell we want. You're full of shit, Taylor. F- Max is number one. <laughs> Nice. So I'm kind of new, but I got a pendulum trap. I got a spike pit trap. I got a melting point trap. I got a what a boulder trap. And now I have a laundry list of things that we need to go through and see if they apply. We're more like a podcast action with Go again. Mm. And we're free. Zero cost, baby. We love Zero that. cost <laughs> podcast action with Go again. Depends for four. And it also pitches for three resources yeah it was a podcast attack action with go again (laughs) that can also be played as a defense reaction (laughs) from arsenal from Um, from your sideboard what do you think isaac i'm just so grateful for necria (laughs) (laughs) classic isaac goof right there dude loves joe my it's crazy who do we think is bringing it home I mean, honestly, brass tacks, we just, we want Arachne to win Worlds. If he doesn't, I will quit this game. (laughs) That's drastic. All right, fine. (laughs) You got me back in. All right. Yeah, I hope everybody's enjoying watching the World Championship Flesh and Blood. I mean, will Michael Hamilton win again? No, (laughs) he's not playing Arachne, so he can't win. (laughs) Uh, I'm just hoping that somebody from a, a European country wins because we're going to be in Europe. Let's go. Europe, rise up. Yo, F in the chat. Lurkers, rise up. Lubers, rise up. What do you think, Isaac? I really love uh, Drum I the Hero. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Do you like us? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. It's your friendly neighborhood Howling Minds here. You might recognize me from short films such as articles on Channel Fireball about flesh and blood, some deck tech videos that are longer than most Hollywood films, or possibly even some card game content on other games such as Marvel Snap or Disney Lorcana. The lovely guys at Tabletop24 have asked me just to shoot this short video to say congratulations to everybody who is playing in the World Championships today and wishing you all the very best of luck. And thank you to everyone who's tuning in and checking out the coverage as well and supporting everything that Flesh and Blood is in the four years that we've had the game so far. Who do I think is going to win this event? Well, if I'm not allowed to bet on myself, I've got to go with one of my testing teammates here in the UK, uh, Liam Holden. He's a fantastic human being, has put in a lot of work for this event, and I, I truly don't know anyone it would mean more to, to take home the title of world champion. So if I've got to put my money on one person out there, it's going to be Liam. Uh, what deck would I like to see take down the event? Well, that one doesn't have to be his deck, so I'm going to say any of the heroes from Bright Lights. Mainly Dash IO, but I would love to see anyone crack that chestnut on any of these particular mechanologists and show the world what they can do uh, when they haven't been performing so far. Uh, If you want to hang out with me more in the future, by all means come and say hello on X or any other social media channel, Discord, YouTube, whatever you like, at Howling Minds. It would be cool to see you for more content in the future. Enjoy the rest of the broadcast. Take care. I'll see you soon. What's up, guys? This is Ethan and Oliver from OKNY Podcast. We are Sans Kenny today. That's usually how it works out. Uh, we are a small-time YouTube channel that focuses on random flesh and blood content. Uh, what kind of content would you say we do, Oliver? Uh, we explore some limited format stuff, like Cube, or uh, we also do some drafting as well on our YouTube channel. And then we have some gameplay occasionally. Yeah, occasionally. Yeah, yeah limited amounts of gameplay, limited yes. amounts of content. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just want to give a shout out to all of our friends and locals at home who are not in Spain. 
Um, we'll be chilling in Spain while this airs, so hopefully you guys are enjoying the broadcast. Um, what hero or player or country do you think is taking home the World Championship this year? Uh, I'm going to be a little bit biased. I'll say Yuki Lee Bender because uh, she's one of our close friends. Uh, Lexi is going to be LLing, so we'll find she'll find a hero that suits her the best. Yeah, hopefully. Oh, I assume we'll, 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 already, have, we'll already have seen it um, by the time this airs. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'll say Pablo. Um, it's probably going to be super a super common answer. I think he has the home field advantage. I think he's a great guy. He's going to take it on Bravo, hopefully. That's his usual hero, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and Kenny believes, or Kenny really, really wants Azalea to win. Because yes. Because he's a Ranger main, so. Yes, get Azalea 300 more LL points to get her halfway to LL. And they call the Azalea mains cry that they <laughs> haven't won an event yet. Yeah. All righty. See you guys there. Hope you guys are enjoying the broadcast. Hey guys, Ed Knight here, also known as Nighttime Fab. Hate that I can't be at Worlds with you guys, but I know you're going to put on a great show for all of us. Give us some great games to watch. We're going to be watching every minute of the weekend. I'm going to have to give it to my card guys. I'm rooting for them, hoping they're going to get there. Pull it home. USA. Everybody knows that I'm a Guardian main. I love my Guardians, love my Pulverizes and whatnot. I'm hoping to see some Bravos Day 2. Good representation, maybe a 40% conversion rate. That'd be great. Either way, everybody good luck. Hope you have fun. Hola a todos. Eh, me llamo Adrián Ruiz, más conocido como Adri Fencing. Que este es mi deporte, ¿vale? Es, es grima en castellano. Y bueno, en él conseguí llegar al equipo nacional y actualmente es mi, mi trabajo, que soy entrenador de esgrima. Más o menos a la vez empezó mi pasión por las cartas y hace unos años pues se cruzó en mi camino Fresh and Blood que es un juego apasionante, que me encanta, y eso me llevó a empezar con los streamings. Porque me gustaba tanto que quería que creciera la comunidad española y que cada vez hubiera más jugadores y que la gente tuviera un sitio donde pudiera ir a aprender o a entretenerse o, o bueno, a aprender nuevas técnicas que aplican en sus torneos. Eh, es verdad que hace un tiempo tuve que aparcar un poco esta pasión porque... Empecé otros nuevos proyectos, entre los cuales está eh, la tienda Dracaris Juegos, que es eh, especialista en Flesh and Blood. Es algo que ha llevado mucho tiempo para mí y que me ha, esto me ha, me ha impedido poder realizar los streamings, pero que es algo que retomaré en el futuro y de hecho ya estoy planificando cómo hacerlo. Y el proyecto más importante que ha llegado este año ha sido bueno, pues un futuro integrante de nuestro equipo, Gin Antunic, que es mi hijo Kenzo, que tiene eh, dos meses en el Mundial y creo que va a ser el, la persona más joven en, en estar en, en este gran evento que tenemos en Barcelona y que el, a las dos semanas de su nacimiento pues eh, me pude presentar a un PTI Event y con la fortuna de ganarlo para poder disputar este gran Mundial, el cual espero con, con muchas ganas y creo que va a ser muy, 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 muy divertido, muy entretenido. Vamos a conocer a un montón de personas. Y allí estará mi chica y, y mi hijo para disfrutar de este grandísimo evento en una grandísima ciudad como es Barcelona. Still opening packs. What did you say? No, 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 you gotta check those numbers. Those can't be right. Two, one. one. My name is Gabe, and I perform Market Monday as well as product reviews. Today we're going over promos that you never knew existed. We're from 2272 up to 49.95. Oh my god! 
There's a huge discrepancy. It's a holiday gifts for people into flesh and blood in this season. How's it going? Gabe. And I'm Eric, and I go over all sorts of advice from new player oriented to the more experienced players. And we're gonna do that for only $50. I am taking Icelander as my hero. Grindy is a little harder to play. Finally won an armory with none other than herself, Levia. We're gonna go over what's in the deck and how to play with the cards. Like she is one of the hardest heroes to, to learn, but one of the most rewarding. Oh, and a ton of limited advice. Is here to help improve your draft and how to draft her. First thing to know is that Monarch is considered an H style draft. What heroes we want to be playing in order to maximize our efficiency with our cards. I got my hot pick for who's gonna win the world tournament and become the next world champion. Sasa Markovic on Kato. I'm hopeful, we'll see what happens. My pick for world is gonna be my favorite hero, Icelander. And who better to pilot Icelander than Michael Hamilton himself? Lexi's not here anymore. You're off that deck. Get back on Icelander. Make us Icelander mains proud. Let's get it. Olá, pessoal. Meu nome é Iron, sou aqui do canal Fábio Tutor. E eu tô aqui orgulhosamente representando o Brasil. E no meu canal você poderá encontrar vídeos sobre regras, formatos de jogo, lore e unboxings de diversos produtos de Flash and Blood. É uma honra estar apresentando meu canal aqui neste Mundial, graças ao convite da Tabletop 24 e da LSS. O cenário de Flash and Blood está crescendo muito no Brasil nos últimos anos, tá? contando com uma comunidade apaixonada e engajada. Além disso, temos diversos produtores de conteúdo espalhado pelo YouTube, Instagram e TikTok, que estão contribuindo bastante para o crescimento do jogo também. Então eu estou muito animado aqui de compartilhar mais sobre o nosso trabalho aqui nesse Mundial. Então eu convido todo mundo a conhecer os canais dos produtores de, de conteúdo do Brasil. E é isso aí pessoal, agradeço pela oportunidade. Valeu! Olá a todos, meu nome é Luís, e eu sou de Portugal, e eu faço Flash and Blood Content. Para os starters, eu quero dizer obrigado por esta oportunidade, e desejo boa sorte a todos aqui nesses mundos. Eu não posso estar presente, mas eu vou estar assistindo. I want to find out what this new meta will be and if the last set of bright lights will give it something new. To finish, I will wish for all the Dromai players to come forward and to pick the throne. I wish everyone the best luck and see you guys later. Goodbye! Hey, where push the point? Hello, my name is Dan Trapp. I'm Sean. Hey, I'm Hamish. I'm Simon. We make flesh and blood content from right here in the UK. We produce an awesome podcast 
We interview community members and vlog our experience from international fab events. We also live stream and commentate from UK events. If you see um, Hamish or Simon or Sean walking around the hall, please do come say hi to us. We may have some fun push the point dice to give to you. I hope you're really enjoying Worlds. My prediction is that uh, Alex Chitty, current UK national champion, is going to take it home for the United Kingdom. I'll be rooting for Icelander to win. If we can get that ice era out, that'll be really cool. Anyway, thank you so much to everyone uh, who's watching. Thank you to the casters who are casting the event. I don't know how you're having a wonderful time watching at home. Um, but stay cool and play some great games of Flesh and Blood. And we'll see you soon. Hey everyone, it's Sloop Dupe from the YouTube channel of the same name. I hope everyone's having a blast in Barcelona, although I am a little bit bummed that I wasn't able to make it out to Worlds this year. Instead, I'm just going to be at home watching this very stream with all of you, and so I hope you're all enjoying it, and I really, really hope that Islander takes it down for a second year in a row. Not because I actually like Islander and want her to win again, I, ju I just wanna be free from frostbites, okay? So anyways, I hope you're all having a great day. Bye-bye. Hello everyone, my name is Juan Monzon, I am the host of Cartas y Charlas. Cartas y Charlas, it's about interview players, judges, and artists around this game. We want to know who is behind the player, the artists, and the judges. They have amazing lives, and with our podcast, you can know it we start with people from Spain, we, we are growing very fast and we are going to interview everyone who is interested in this game. Uh, Alan Forn, Tableto24, asked me to predict who is going to win walls and with, with Hero. Um, you know, we are from Spain. It's going to be easy to know who is going to be our favorite, right? We have Pablo Pintor here in Spain. I don't know what hero he's going to use, but it's going to be amazing for sure. But uh, you also need to take care about three other players. Ambaro, Daniel Correas, and Adrian Reed. I hope you don't fight against them because they are very good. I don't know if he's going to use Dromai, Usuri, Das, I don't know. But they are very good. Be careful. <laughs> See you in Cartas y Charlas. Bye bye.
Welcome back to our World Championship Wrap-Up. I am Brian Gottlieb. I'm joined by my friend Brendan Patrick for the first time this weekend. And we've got goods. We have that top eight breakdown. We are ready to let you know the matches you will be seeing tomorrow. Let's not waste any time. Let's get it up on screen. And there you see, in our first seed, Yuki Lee Bender. On an absolutely dominant tear thus far through the tournament. Going to be taking on someone we didn't get a chance to see in our future match area yet. But it's Alexandros Agreyu from Greece, uh, a region which very much has not yet stamped its name on the flesh and blood scene. But here we go, Alexandros with his chance in this top eight. Absolutely. And I feel like Yuki's got to be feeling good about this round one pairing, gets paired into the Fi. I feel like the thesis for bringing Fi to the tournament like the World Championship was to prey on Jermai. Obviously, he has good matchups outside of that. But probably one of the downsides of bringing one of these ninjas was specifically Icelander. That being said, I'm sure Alexandros came with a game plan ready to try and beat Icelander. Yeah, let's see how that matchup goes tomorrow. We move down to the next stop on our bracket. It is another Canadian superstar. It's Aaron Chance on Dromai, the lone Dromai to make top eight here this weekend. Going to be taking on Matthew W on dash i know this depends so much on deck construction but what are your thoughts overall on how this matchup plays out I mean, aaron shan's deck looks pretty standard to be honest he does have the dust of the chromi in the deck i mean that's a bit of a deviation not that i'm not sure how important it will be against matthew w so the thing is is that the construction of the deck matters on both sides because yeah. both these heroes can be built in wildly different ways both can be defensive both can be somewhat aggressive I would say the Droma is a bit more stock standard. Matthew W, I have no idea what his lo his list looks like specifically, but I do believe I heard about him fatiguing some decks in the early rounds. That being said, Aaron Shantz had a pretty tough run up to top eight, beat multiple fives in yeah. the last rounds of the tournament. Yeah, yeah. You know, you get to the point in the tournament where you start to smell that top eight, and you're just sitting there saying, just give me one of my good matchups. Give me something I'm totally comfortable with. For Aaron Shantz, it didn't break that way. It was about five down the stretch. Found W's back to back against Fi to go ahead and punch a ticket to this top eight. Could be good because there's two Fi's in this top eight. And we move on to our next matchup. It is going to be Easton Douglas from the US of A taking on Daniele Fredarelli from Italy on Fi. We saw Daniele play a bit in the feature match area uh, over the last few rounds, but Easton hasn't really gotten in here yet. I got the chance to watch some of Easton's game, looking like a very hybrid build of Dash, relying on the Evo Steel, Steel Souls to go ahead and patch up some defensive spots and using the uh, the Teclo bases as an equipment suite. And I think that's a really unique take on Dash. I started to see it circulate a bit over the last few weeks, and I'm really curious to see if that gives Easton the defensive edge he needs to take down Daniele's Fi deck. Yeah, absolutely. We saw some of that on stream when Dash was displayed, but very interesting to see two Dash into the top eight of the World Championships. I think everybody knows that Dash is a threat, but it still seems to be this underrated, underrepresented deck that has been taking down tournaments for the past two years almost. I mean, it won the Calling Baltimore, which was the biggest calling to date at that time, and was not even represented at the Pro Tour. I mean, Dash is just a fundamentally powerful hero that people seem to just never have in the conversation. And now we see two into top eight matching Icelander as, you know, the top res represented deck here. Yeah, look, Bright Lights brought a lot to the table for three new mechs. It also gave Dash some real tools. We talked about things like the Evo Steel Souls. There's things like Backup Protocol Red really have fundamentally changed what Dash is capable of. And I'm not shocked to see two copies of Dash make this top eight. Then we move to our final matchup. And unfortunately, we have a bit of a team kill here. It is Team Blue Pitch from Hong Kong. But look, whoever comes out of this matchup, Shing Tseng or Pudding Tam, they have put Hong Kong squarely on the map as one of the top regions in all of flesh and blood. A dominant performance from the Hong Kong folks today. And it's going to be either Shing Sang's Icelander build or putting Tam's unique take on Katsu, Brendan. Going old school, kicking it with McGenshi release and Lord of Wind down yeah, in the future match area. I saw a bit of that match from the sidelines here, and it looks like an incredible deck. I'm excited to see it, and I can't wait to see how it holds up against, against Icelander. Like you said, a bit of a team kill to start off the day, but, I mean, Hong Kong really has been on the map. I mean, it's one of the hardest re working regions in Flesh and Blood. I know the armory scene there is absolutely insane. Absolutely. We have some of our... We play every night of the week. Every single night of the week, and it's been like that for years. And these Hong Kong players have been known, actually, for wizard decks. I mean, they were one of the first sort of regions to innovate on Kano. It looks like that they've adapted that to Icelander. So just, I mean, just an incredible show of force from that region specifically. Yeah, and it's so funny. You, you walk around the venue and you talk to folks about, you know, how the tournament's going, uh, you know, how things are breaking. Are they surprised by the meta? One thing I heard from just a huge, huge amount of people 
was oh shing's doing good not surprised that guy's an absolute killer extremely well respected amongst his peers and maybe this is the time where shing Seng becomes the world champion of flesh and blood yeah absolutely brian just looking at this top eight who do you think has drawn up the best sort of matchup spread here I have to go with Yuki Lee Bender. I just think her level of play has been on another level this entire weekend. Absolutely dominant in draft. Did take some losses in construction, but you got to take them somewhere if you're Yuki Lee, and there were very few losses to be taken. Is our first seed coming in? Has that favorable pairing as we start against five. Mm -hmm. But once you get to the rest of the gauntlet, I, I really think anything can happen. Yeah. It's so hard to pick exactly what is going to come out out of each of these matchups. Absolutely. But immediately to either Aaron Chance or Matthew W, Dash or Jomai, both hard matches for Yuki Lee. On the other side, we have Easton Douglas versus Danielle. I'm sure Shing Sing, uh, Shing Sang is hoping that that is, is the five that progresses in that situation. But again, we could see a Katsu, a Katsu five rematch in the quarterfinals here. Yeah, and Pudding looked very well set up to capitalize on that Phi matchup with his aggressive stance, just really ran over his Phi opponent in that final round. And this top eight is being announced in the hall right now with so many people. You hear that uproarious applause maybe in the background. Uh, because they're playing for a lot, a lot of money, a lot of pride, a lot of stakes. And why don't we just remind you one more time exactly what will be at stake as we head into Sunday. It is going to be to the top 100 thousand dollars that is not a typo that is six figures one hundred thousand dollars and a gold foil legendary as well as that champion's prize card the coveted champion's prize card heading to whoever takes down this event not gonna lie if you're getting a champion's prize card i think you want to get the icelander one at this point because it's about to last maybe chance. get a living legend last, last chance. chance maybe you're right we could have a living legend pro tour in the future we'll see but a hundred thousand dollars to first place obviously just life-changing money for pretty much any player here and i know that I know that first place is nice. The money is nice, but already making it to top eight of this of this tournament Huge. is such an achievement. Like this is the grand stage of flesh and blood, and it's just been incredible to see the meta, how it percolated to the top eight, and all the regions that showed up as well. Because I think I don't, I definitely did not have this top eight, the hero breakdown on my bingo card for this weekend. No, I think everyone is taken a bit by surprise, and you know what comes next from here. We'll have to see how the top eight plays out. It could be the end of the road for Icelander and either Shing Tsung's hand or Yuki Lee Bender's hand, or it could be the dawn of a new metagame where Katsu rises to the top and that's the deck everyone's concerned about, or do we give Dash the respect it's been fighting for all these years, finally? Uh, I, I think there's so many outcomes and all of them are exciting. And what that means is that you are going to want to be here tomorrow morning. You do not want to miss all seven rounds will be on display. We will play every single round on camera. You will not miss anything. So I implore all of you, come back, join myself, join Brendan Patrick, join the rest of our casting crew here from Barcelona when we come back tomorrow morning to play some more Flesh and Blood.